Welcome to episode five of the Curious on Earth podcast. I'm your host, Henry Soinuma, and this is my conversation with Geronimo M.M., who works as Social Innovation Director at the ICRS Foundation, a non-profit organization that seeks to transform society's relationship with psychoactive plants. I first met Geronimo back in 2019 at the Breaking Convention Psychedelic Conference in London, and I was instantly impressed by his visionary, multi-layered, and yet simultaneously very practical approach to the handling of all kinds of challenging questions related to the encounter between psychedelics and Western societies. And he's since become one of my favorite thinkers uh, in the psychedelic scene. Some of the topics that we cover during our long conversation include what comes after the current psychedelic renaissance, the unintended consequences that are sure to follow from the mainstreaming of psychedelics, because even the best of plans do bring with them unintended consequences, some of which are inevitably uh, black swans that are impossible to anticipate, but but many of which also are something that you can prepare for, anticipate for, and therefore it's very important to have uh, serious conversations about them beforehand. We talk about how societies can facilitate a responsible relationship with psychedelics and the difficulties of categorizing uh, both psychedelics in general and ayahuasca in particular, why it's not just a drug or just a sacrament or just an intoxicant, why um, none of our pre-existing categories are a good uh, good fit for, for ayahuasca or, or psychedelics in general. Uh, we talk about ayahuasca tourism and its impacts on indigenous cultures, and we also talk about the dark side of glamorizing indigenous traditions. We talk about the idea of ayahuasca as an, as an adaptogen and uh, ayahuasca churches, uh, uh, such as Santa Daime and Unión de Vegetal, what they are and what uh, we can learn from them. Um, and yeah, uh, if you want to support the podcast, your likes, subscriptions, comments, uh, reviews are very useful. And also, if you want to support this podcast, you can also consider becoming a Patreon. You can find the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Curious on Earth. And uh, yeah, my conversation with Geronimo starts here. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, welcome to the Curious on Earth podcast, Geronimo. Uh, maybe we can start by you telling a bit uh, about yourself and the work you're doing. Uh, hi, Henry. Thanks for having me. It's always good to talk to you. Um, uh, my name is Geronimo, and um, I have uh, I work for the ICS Foundation, uh, which is a Barcelona-based uh, nonprofit organization that um, uh, aims to uh, transform the relationship of um, our societies. You could call them Global North societies. Western societies is probably not fully accurate. Um, their relationship with a series of plants that have a history of traditional use and their psychoactive plants, you know, traditional uh, 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 natural plant medicines, we've called them um, um, ethnobotanicals, but that's also a broader term. So, you know, this includes plants like ayahuasca and iboga, and you know uh, also psychedelic mushrooms cannabis but it would also include tobacco and uh, coca leaf and you know kratom um, etc in practice most of our work revolves around ayahuasca uh, iboga cannabis and the coca leaf um, and um, yeah we aim to transform the relationship that our societies have with these plants we uh, take a lot of inspiration from the indigenous cultures that have been using these plants traditionally. And we can see that in their cultures, these plants are far from being a problem. They're actually, you know, a very important, very valued uh, part of their society and very much appreciated. And, um, and we would like to uh, imagine a future in which, you know, these, these, these plants and the practices that come with them can be practiced, you know, legally and safely in our societies and that we also get a similar uh, benefits uh, as, as we can see that the, the people in the, in the communities of origin get while remaining, you know, in right relationship with the knowledge holders, with indigenous knowledge holders and the, and, and, and the original groups, you know, that, have, that, have, uh, that, 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 that are the keepers of this knowledge. So this is, this is, this is, what, this is, this is what I work 
in uh, in terms of my work, um, I am I am a director of social innovation at ICERS. Um, social means uh, uh, groups of people, and innovation means new things. So social innovation means you know it's the work around how one gets groups of people to do new things. Uh, of course, there's nothing, uh, there's no innovation in these plants because, they, like I said, you know they have a very long history of traditional use, but they are new for us. Uh, and our relationship with them is quite short, actually. It's just a few decades or, you know, in some cases longer. Um, so this is where the innovation part comes. Uh, uh, part of my work uh, involves uh, thinking very hard about what the future integration of these plants would look like. So, you know, thinking 15, 20, uh, 50 years into the future to try to imagine, you know, how we would like this to be. Uh, and then to think about what steps would need to be taken in order to get to this place, and this is the um, and this is the social innovation part. Yeah, maybe a good avenue to go on from here, uh, in a sense, to to get a grasp on what are the main challenges related to that work. Maybe we can start with because uh, ayahuasca is one of your main main interests. Mm. Can you talk a bit about? what ayahuasca is and the problems related to that question like what ayahuasca is why it, why is it difficult to pinpoint what it is or put it uh, fit it inside a particular category that that exists for our culture previously or yeah there's a, um, a spanish uh, anthropologist uh, uh, Fericla, who says that it's uh, it's mistaken to use the word ayahuasca that it would be more appropriate to say ayahuascas in plural because in reality, you know, ayahuasca, well, first of all, is a preparation. Uh, the main ingredient is a vine, Banisteriopsis capi, which is also known as ayahuasca. And then there's a, a, a certain number of admixture plants that are added. They're brewed together with, with the vine. Uh, the most common one is, uh, is, the, is the leaves of a bush from the coffee family called uh, Chacruna or Psychotria viridis. Um, but there's also the leaves of uh, another uh, vine, the Diplopteris cabreana, which is known as Chakropanga, that are also used, and there's actually many, many formulas. So in a way, to talk about ayahuasca, is saying ayahuasca is sort of like saying wine. You know, wine is, you know, of course, comes from grapes, but with that said, there's an enormous variety of wines. There's white wines and red wines and rosés and sparkling wines and fortified wines. And, you know, so, the, so you know, when one, say, when one says wine, one is actually referring, referring to sort of a, a, a complex uh, of, of, uh, of, um, of preparations uh, in which the grape is an, is a, is an important, a very important or main ingredient. Uh, similarly with ayahuasca, you have absolutely everything from preparations that have only the vine to preparation that has the vine and one more plant to preparations that have the, the vine and many other plants. And all of these things are ayahuascas. Um, the, um, the in, ter in terms of um, the traditional, so so you know this this is one of the first things that one of the first sort of exceptions that comes you know compared to other you know uh, traditional uh, uh, plants such as you know coca or tobacco or you know or peyote or or, or San Pedro or iboga in which you know is just the plant. Ayahuasca is very much a preparation, uh, so there is a formula, and because. And because there's a formula, we can sort of imagine that there was a sort of a, a, a day zero. There was a moment, there was one person, or maybe there were different people, you know, uh, in different places. But somebody had to first think about this, think about putting these two plants together and cooking them together. So there's a sort of uh, a moment zero. And then from this, from this moment when this person or a group of people or maybe several people in different places certainly it happened in the amazon jungle uh, uh hundreds if not thousands of years ago there's the the archaeology doesn't give clear indications and maybe it will never be but we know for sure it's hundreds of years old in terms of our scientific knowledge it's probably much older than that that's just the proof that we have and Today is used by, you know, more than 70 indigenous groups in the jungle. So this is the other thing. It has expanded. Wherever it started, it jumped from that group to another group and then to the another neighboring group and then to another neighboring group and then to another neighboring group. And then this process of 
expansion, which seems to be a characteristic of ayahuasca, actually continues all the way to our, to our days because it didn't stop in the indigenous groups, but from there it went to sort of urban centers in the jungle as the jungle got colonized. And then from the jungle cities, it went to the cities in the, in the, in the, in, in these nations, South American nations. And then from there, it started to travel outside and, you know, all the way to Europe, Asia, Africa, you know, the, and the United States, all the way to us having this conversation. Now we are now talking about something because something happened, you know, a, a, a very long time ago, somebody in the Amazon, you know, put, put these two plants together. So it's, it's a characteristic of ayahuasca to expand. Uh, and I believe, and the reason I'm telling this is because I, I don't think, I don't think I could do my work if I didn't believe that this is unstoppable and unavoidable. And this comes from observing the phenomenon, uh, and, and, and its history. So what I see when I look at the history of this particular compound is that, um, this particular preparation, I should say, when um, when you take everything into account, when you look at, at all the different uses, so from the most traditional surviving uses, which is sort of cold brewed vine only, uh, and they and they are and it is used in the context of a number of ritual dances uh, that have to do with you know a very particular sort of uh, calendar of of uh, of um, um, mythological. And uh, and um, an ecological uh, movements um, all the way, you know, and then how from there it moves to sort of urban centers, and then it becomes very fixated in sort of uh, healing and personal healing of certain things, sort of folk folk healing, and then from there it it, it uh, different groups begin to use it as a sort of sacrament in 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 uh, in, in in religious, you know, Christianity and Afro Afro Brazilian based uh, uh, religious ceremonies and then from there to the current sort of interest uh, by uh, by psychologists and psychiatrists and modern science in it as a psychotherapeutic tool it, it seems to be very it, it seems that all of these uses are sort of very um, that they're not you cannot easily find um, um, the, a, a constant so you know you have some groups that used it for things that had to be that we could describe as you know, bad luck hunting, you know, and uh, had to do with sort of reestablishing relationships with certain forces and spirit forces and animals in the jungle that would allow people to have, you know, better or worse hunt and survive, you know. And then from there, it, it is used for, for sort of healing uh, people that have, uh, you know, you know, personal problems and also to finding things that are lost. Um, and then from there, you have this sort of a spiritual religious use where it's sort of a sacrament and it's a tool for connection with, for, for communion with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the divinity, with the spiritual forces. And then from there to sort of like, now this could be a tool for, you know, against depression and even maybe against Alzheimer's. And um, so when one look at all of these things, it, there's, there seems to be no common thread you know, uh, in this expansion or not common uses or no common, no commonalities. It seems to be very, very diverse. Um, it's only when one zooms out that one understands that ayahuasca tends to always play the same role, albeit in very different societies and in very different cultures. And that role, you know, we use the word adaptogen. Adaptogens are, you know, things, preparations, uh, practices that basically help human beings adapt to their environment, to their necessities, to their difficulties, to the struggles of daily life. And of course, as you change from culture to culture, this change. So, you know, in sort of, you know, hunting, uh, uh, hunting and, you know, agricultural societies, this relationship to, to the, to the environment is very, very important because you can't survive. You can't, you, you live off, you know, you live from the land. So you, you need to have a very, very good, um, and that's where ayahuasca plays a role. And then when you get to sort of, uh, the urbanized environment, you find that a whole new series of sort of trauma, colonial trauma, and sort of like, you know, inequalities and all of that, a new, a new set of challenges arise in, in, in people's lives when they're living in urban or semi-urban environments. And ayahuasca then is used for that. And then 
you know, and then comes the same thing when it, when it comes to, you know, um, sort of religious use, you know, that the, in many cases in the, in the source communities where ayahuasca began to be, get used as the ayahuasca religions, even though there were people that were immigrants that had, you know, usually uh, of African origin that had uh, immigrated from the coast, they were Christianized, but they didn't have access to, uh, to Christian priests. They would only come three or every three or every six months, you know, and out of this necessity of the people to have uh, a, a spiritual practice in you know, ayahuasca uh, uh, steps in, and then now in our society, which we you know we are not concerned with, uh, we're not concerned with um, with hunting anymore, you know, or 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 with the relationship to nature really, and we're not so concerned either with the uh, with the um, you know with with any of these other things that I listed, but we have a number of you know uh, of diseases and, and and illnesses that we don't have you know good solutions for. Then suddenly it's there. So what there is is it's the is is the capacity of this uh, preparation, this brew, to sort of um, um, serve uh, or, or 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 collaborate or became a tool, become a tool for human societies. You know, a helpful tool to for human societies to adapt to their circumstances and their environment, and this is sort of the second constant. So the first constant is a constant of expansion because it keeps expanding, and the second constant is a constant of adaptation, and they are tied together. The reason why it expands, the reason why we're still talking about something that happened in the jungle, you know, many thousand years ago, is because all throughout, you know, if I go to the person who gave me ayahuasca for the first time and who the person that gave them ayahuasca for the first time and who the person that gave them ayahuasca for the first time. If I run back the family tree of people that gave each other ayahuasca all the way to the person that gave me ayahuasca, that reaches back all the way to the first person that put this together. There's no other way. Um, what we find is that this expanded because people kept finding it useful. You know, this is the other part that I think it's very important to keep in this. You know, this is this is this is this is uh, um, the reason why this survives and the reason why it expands is because people indeed find it from useful to very useful. At least some people, and that's why they keep and that's why they keep doing it, and that's why it keeps growing. So. When I when I say that you know part of my work is to think about the future of this um, and try to imagine this, I couldn't I couldn't uh, I couldn't do my work um, if I didn't believe that I'm really uh, just one more piece in a process that will go on regardless of my contribution that is much bigger than me that will continue long after I'm gone and that started long before I joined. And that is by itself actually unstoppable because it's the very nature of this process. You cannot stop something that people find useful or very useful. Yeah, that uh, opened many very interesting avenues to to pursue. One thing that I'm thinking about is like looking at the expansion expansion uh, phenomena from the point of view of memetics. In the sense, if you uh, include like in memetics cultural practices that people have and how they spread and how they mutate around the world and uh, it's not just like ayahuasca that does that but it's in general practices that people find values in around the world mm -hmm. and and it's the the frictions that come between come from having uh, like multi-generational practices cultural practices um expanding and finding their, their way into other cultures and the conversation regarding um, how important is it to preserve them in a certain certain like particular form and uh, how much you can change or adapt uh, they are very interesting yeah that's 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 the big part of it um and that's where the that's where the um, the the innovation part is necessary while remaining in right relationship. So you know, if if you imagine something completely new, um, now it's artificial intelligence. But let's imagine that some aliens give us, uh, you know, anti gravity devices, um, or anything like this, uh, something very useful and very new. Uh, there's usually a learning curve. And this is for us is very easy to see with technologies. The car, the, you know, the beginning, the beginning of the car, the automobile was full of 
terrible accidents. You know, before before cars uh, existed, the streets were very much public places. They were full of children. They were full of people walking by, passersby, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then these very fast vehicles begin to move in, and all sorts of accidents happen. So there is a there's there is a there is a learning curve before societies adapt to new things. Uh, and usually this learning curve is full of accidents. There is no other way, you know, when we discover x-rays, we were doing x-rays like crazy and they were doing x-rays to pregnant women and to small children and they were doing dozens of x-rays just for fun until people realize actually there's sort of a, there's a, there's a, you know, you have to be careful with this. There's only so many and, you know, and then, you know, again, you know, we adapt, we adapt and, and, you know, humans, uh, ability to adapt to, you know, dangerous or toxic, uh, you know, I will go back to plants, you know, the, the staple of the, um, of the, uh, you know, the staple food of, uh, of most Amazonian groups, especially traditional ones, is what is called bitter manioc. You know, so bitter manioc is like, I don't know, it would be like rice is in Asia or, you know, or corn is in, in Mesoamerica. It's, it's sort of like the basic, it's, 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 it's the basic of, the, of, the, of, of what's being served. And yet bitter manioc is one of the most poisonous uh, uh, plants in the world. It's full of cyanide, which, you know, it's really, really poisonous. So, you know, uh, indigenous people have developed a very, very sophisticated and elaborate way to sort of grind and then strain and then, and then dry the, the, the manioc so that all of the cyanide evaporates and you can actually eat, not only eat, but make a staple uh, uh, food out of this plant that would otherwise be completely, you know, uh, you know, deadly. So, you know, this is, this is, this is an ability that humans have given enough time. They adapt, like we have adapted to cars and we have found ways around cars and next rays and all of these things. The, this, this happens by itself. Uh, again, you know, in cultures, people learn from one another, uh, mimetic, like you say, the part where it gets delicate or dangerous is precisely at the beginning, you know, when the dangers are not very well known socially, so people cannot, and then, and then the accident happens. Now, in an ideal world, if you were to start something from scratch, say I wanted to surf, you know, I thought that I could catch some waves, you know, I could start from scratch. I could, you know, make myself a bad board and then a better board and then a better board and then a better board and eventually through trial and error i might get quite far but i would be much much faster if i just look at people that are already surfing and they already knew and then from there one builds on top so you know surfing as you know comes from uh, hawaii you know the pacific islands it was kind of the same there was a there was a long board you know made of wood and people cut the waves but they, they stood facing forward like this not sideways and, uh, you know, that the waves that they could catch were, you know, much smaller and, you know, but very quickly this became popular and then, you know, people began to learn from one another. And nowadays you look at the things that, you know, surfers do and are absolutely unbelievable. Now they're surfing absolutely gigantic waves that were, you know, unconceivable just a few years ago. So, and this is happens because everybody learns from one another. Um, in our society, we have a, we have a history of, uh, adopting plants that have that are useful or powerful or you know or sacred is the, the, the right word for indigenous people you know tobacco is an example you know but also uh, I, I, I will start with tobacco you know the tobacco is you know it's the um, um, king of you know an uh, pan-american shamanic uh, 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 sacred plants this is used from North to South America, almost everywhere is deeply important, very revered. Tobacco is smoked, is drunk, it's inhaled, it's snuffed. Uh, and, and, you know, if you look, for example, in the Amazon, it is, it is an absolutely key part in certain social aspects having to do with uh, how people talk and how community consensus is reached. So in rituals in which uh, uh, community, uh, uh, the community is being rebuilt, uh, both through ritual, song and dance, but also in, in, in conversation. Uh, tobacco plays a very important role because it, it helps people focus. So, um, you know, one can say that, you know, generally speaking, you know, without making swim, not, 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 not always, but, you know, very, very often for, you know, American uh, indigenous groups, tobacco is a deeply valuable 
uh, 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 important and respected plan, and it's not a problem. Yet, for us, it is the number one cause of preventable death worldwide. So, you know, we have one society where tobacco is actually useful, and then we have our society where tobacco is actually poisonous. So this sort of polarity between sort of blessing and curse, or between medicine and poison, uh, this polarity, or where, and, and where one stands in the polarity, is not a characteristic of the substance it's a characteristic of the use that it's given. And this we understand, you know, the word pharmacon in Greek means medicine and poison. It doesn't mean medicine or poison. It was the same word pharmacon meant a medicine or a poison because it was understood that the only difference between a medicine and a poison is the dosage. And this is a fact. So all medicines are poisons if you reach the, if you hide the dose enough, so you know you can easily kill somebody with aspirin, for example. It, it, it takes, you know, I think, you know, a, a, a box and a half to give people, you know, a pretty serious uh, um, ulcer, bleeding ulcer in the stomach. And, um, and we can also uh, heal with poisons. And that's, of course, radio and chemotherapy, you know, are examples of how we can bring the dosage of something that is very, very toxic and you bring it low enough to where you can use it medicinally. Now, similarly, these plants stand like that, you know, tobacco being an example. It can be a medicine or it can be a poison. What we find is that in the, in the cultures that have a very long relationship with it, it is a medicine. And in the cultures that have a very short relationship with it and doesn't seem to want to learn, I don't know how to else to put it, it turns into a poison. So for us, it's, it's turned into a poison. Um, so the... Um, when one gets a new useful tool, you know, let's let's call it that. It's a lot more, but let's say that, like like it's ayahuasca. We could, you know, start from scratch. It's sort of it's usually the way our scientists work, and say, well, we just take this like it dropped from the sky, and we're just going to see what we can do with it, you know. But of course, this means that you set yourself in a path of making all of the mistakes uh, as you learn. Like it would be like anything, like if you give, you know, somebody young a car who's never driven, you know, they're going to drive it back into a wall and drive it into a ditch. And, you know, eventually maybe they might, they might figure out how to, you know, work a car, but there's going to be a number of accidents before that. Or you can try to learn from people that already know how to drive. So what we find is that, you know, again, you know, ayahuasca in the cultures that have a long relationship with it, it is an extremely useful tool, you know, just to call it... I don't, know, I don't know if tool is the right word, but it's certainly they would say a medicine or a sacred medicine. It is an extremely important in their culture and it's very valued because it's very, uh, um, because it's very helpful <laughs> to, just to say something. And this is not because these properties are in the ayahuasca itself, but in the relationship that they have developed to it. So as we, um, as our societies, begin to uh, begin to come in contact with this you know usually what we do is we start from scratch and we tend to develop you know relationships that are not you know that are that can be much more problematic at least more problematic than the ones that we find in the in the communities of origin so you know I will give you another example is the coca leaf you know the coca leaf is the most you know probably one of the world's most extraordinary superfoods, you know, among other things, you know, it's, 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 uh, it has more calcium than milk, more vitamin D. It has a, it has a, a, a compound that helps you digest uh, tubers and, and uh, carbohydrates. I mean, the, the, the list, the list of, you know, uh, sort of nutritional aspects around coca leaves are just stunning. And then not only that, in the cultures of origin, it is deeply valued because not only is not only it's a food, but it also gives energy, it gives concentration, and it gives people the ability to 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 speak and listen. And this is where coca becomes coca leaf becomes very very important again in communal rituals of building consensus and making decisions. Now, when so without a doubt, coca is being. A, it's been and remains a blessing for the cultures that have long relationships with it. For us, coca has been an absolute curse 
and it's been has been like this because it was split in two. So on the one side, it, it got turned into cocaine. And, you know, the cocaine, you know, well, I mean, the, the, the negative effects of cocaine, not just on people's health, but, the, you know, the cocaine trade, the corruption, the, uh, the, the narco traffic, you know, the criminality associated around it, uh, you know, all, all the way, all the way, uh, it's, it's, it's at the, the ecological destruction. I mean, it's terrible, the effect, you know, there's, there's, there's very, you know, there's very, very, very few of any good things that can be said about the cocaine, you know, the, the effects of the cocaine trade have had on, 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 on societies and on people. But even if you take, you know, sort of the, the most, the most glamorous aspect of it, let's imagine, you know, a very glamorous party of elite, you know, rich people doing cocaine, you know, um, it's a group of people where everybody's talking and nobody's listening, you know, and which is the opposite of what happens in the indigenous cultures. So, you know, very, very destructive all, all around. And then that's just only half of it, you know, the half of it that is the, the, the extracted cocaine, but the other half of the coca leaf, you know, which is, you know, still the, the main ingredient, one of the main ingredients in the secret formula of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has decoconized coca leaf extract. You know, this is the reason why Coca-Cola doesn't really taste so artificial and also why it sort of settles your stomach when you, and it's good for hangovers and all of these things. You know, Coca is actually, Coca-Cola, there's a lot more plant left in Coca-Cola than people believe, and that's why it's part of its success. But, you know, so it's split in two, you know, th this plant, coca, has taken over the world. You can find coca products, you know, either as Coca-Cola or as cocaine in just about anywhere in the world nowadays. But yet, instead of being, you know, a tool for, you know, social cohesion, you know, or, or, or consensus building, it's a tool that is it's a sort of, it's a social solvent. You know, it, it takes a huge soul, a, a huge toll on our societies, you know, and instead of being a superfood, it's actually junk food uh, that, you know, rots the teeth and, you know, creates all of the problems that, you know, that comes with Coca-Cola. No? So th this is, this is, um, this is, this is another example of that. Now, I can give many more, you know, just about if I only focusing on sort of South American sacred plants, this story is repeated again and again, you know, even, you know, even cocoa, you know, which was a bitter drink, you know, we turned into like a, a, a sweet bar of, 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 of fatty uh, uh, chocolate, you know, so, you know, just about every sacred plant of the Americas that has arrived to the, to us, arrive without any of its original traditional context of use and with without all of this sort of you know uh, 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 very evolved ways to relate to this in a way where you know where it's a blessing instead of a curse this has been the case every time in the past until ayahuasca ayahuasca is a sort of historical exception is a singularity it's a it's a rarity it's 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 uh, something, something is happening with ayahuasca that never happened before with, in terms of sort of sacred plants that came from the Americas. And that is that if you look at an ayahuasca uh, ceremony, an ayahuasca ritual in, you know, any European city where it takes place, what you see in its skeleton, in its sort of essence, resembles what you see in the ayahuasca traditions. And this has never happened before. So when, when people, the way people in the West drink ayahuasca is that they gather in a group. There's usually a person that serves everybody. This person has more experience, knows how to handle the night and takes care of all the participants, you know, and also sort of creates some sort of you know, ceremonial ritual uh, uh, environment, usually through music that sort of carries and modulates the experience of others. You know, if we went to indigenous groups or the ayahuasca traditions, we would see that that structure is still there in place. This is never happened before. Uh, that we, you know, people from the global north, westerners, you know, people, non-Amazonians, you know, took a, a, a sacred plant of uh, uh, that had a you know, a very powerful sort of role in indigenous societies and begin to use it in a way that resembles, you know, powerfully resembles the original. So I, I think there is, this is the reason um, why I am 
focused in my work on precisely this phenomenon, on the ceremonial use of ayahuasca outside of the countries of origin and what that means. Because I believe maybe, I hope, maybe this time we can get it right. And it will not be like tobacco and it will not be like coca. But the, we, will, we would be able uh, sometime in the future to, uh, to make a space uh, for this uh, um, incredibly interesting uh, practice, to, to be, to call it, you know, to say the least, uh, give it a space to be practiced in our society so that hopefully one day we can benefit from it as much as I have personally seen and it's, you know, well documented, as much as the, you know, as the, as the cultures of origin do benefit from it as well. That's totally fascinating. One extra angle that I'd like to like you to talk about a bit uh, that I think um, can help us understand the picture even more is is the topic of yoga and yoga's like uh, and the Western culture's encounter with yoga or meditation and their integration and also maybe the the trying to push uh, a round peg into a square hole metaphor that you've been using. So. Uh, if you can also speak a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've spoken about the positive aspects, you know, uh, of this point of, you know, of, of uh, you know, what, what I would, what I would hope uh, would happen. Um, there's also, there's also negative uh, aspects to this that we're already seeing. Um, uh, you know, one, one, one part of it has to do with, um how how much or how little we actually understand what is it that we are imitating and another one has to do with how that impacts the cultures of origin um and this 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 these two things are tied so you know that the the first example you know the first you know yoga yoga is a good example of this you know um there is a danger when we adopt uh, or we try to adopt, you know, sort of cultural practices that come from other cultures. And it has to do with not, uh, not, not, not only with misunderstanding, which, you know, we almost always do because, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to understand, uh, uh, um, you know, cultural, <laughs> cultural imports, especially, you know, when they're, when they're complex ones, you know, such, such as these. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, as you know, yoga, you know, it's a, it's a, it comes, it comes from India. It's a, it's a spiritual practice around movement and around, you know, a certain discipline of the body, but not, uh, not in terms of, you know, health, uh, but in terms of, in, in terms of sort of, uh, yoga, you know, comes from yoke. It comes from how one gets to the body to be to the place where one can access certain spiritual realms. It, it has to do with with uh, with a practice towards uh, a spiritual enlightenment, not towards a beautiful body or a, or a flexible body or 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 or, or a good looking body or or even a long life. Um, but basically, you know, it can be you can understand what could what one could say that 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 in a sense yoga. In India, it's a certain, it's a form of prayer that is done through movement. Now, in our societies, when we became very interested in yoga, we didn't have a place in our society, we didn't have a space in our society for a place for, for, for praying in movement. You know, we actually pray while not moving. You know, we all our, our churches, you know, they have chairs, you know, and, and benches, and, you know, we tend to stand still. Um, and we have a place for movement, but that place is not for playing. That, that that for praying. That place is for having a beautiful body. It's called the gym. So, because that's the place we had, not perhaps the place where yoga belonged to, that's the place where it went. So, you know, most people nowadays, not all, but most people nowadays in our societies practice yoga in gyms, which are which are places that are oriented towards health and towards, you know, uh, towards, you know, good health and good looking bodies. So then this practice that was, you know, very much 
uh, oriented towards a certain spiritual attainment as it came into our culture because the place that we had for it was the gym and because we couldn't sort of, because this concept is, you know, hard for us to understand because it's very new. And yoga was sort of pushed into this and for us became, you know, less of our spiritual practice and largely uh, uh, a practice for uh, having a beautiful body and a healthy, beautiful body. Similarly, you know, meditation, which in the which which in the in, in Asia, you know, where it comes from, and in the Buddhist world, and you know, in, in India, etc., was practiced as as a means to attain uh, a spiritual progress and enlightenment. Um, was in our society stripped of all of these and is mostly presented as mindfulness uh, and understood to be a tool against stress. Uh, and not much uh, so that the spiritual aspects got removed and that's 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 that's, what, that's that was our need and that's what we had you know that's the spaces that we had for it um so this is a, this is a danger that is always present uh, when we import uh, cultural practices from other cultures you know especially practices that are complex because they're very valued you know it's one thing you know to you know to learn to cook a certain dish and it's quite another when you are sort of entering the the sort of the the, the you know the, the 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 spiritual traditions of other cultures, which is you know what yoga, both yoga, meditation, and ayahuasca are. Um, of course, there's going to be um, much simplification and many misunderstandings uh, that happens. Um, I, I, I would say on a, on a positive note that I've heard that now that yoga has expanded, you know, uh, worldwide and it's very easy to find, you know, places or gyms, you know, where one can practice yoga, that there's a sort of a, a movement from within uh, uh, yoga to go back uh, to the sort of spiritual aspects of it. And people are interested again in learning um, um, Sanskrit and they're more interested in the sort of the spiritual roots of the practice. I think that it might be that things go like that, you know. Um, um, uh, Claudio Naranjo said that there's only mov movements of, of of concentration and dissolution and, and dilution. So for things to expand, they dilute. So you can see when you drop water, like, it dilutes and it expands. And then once it expands, then it can concentrate again. Uh, and then and then that this movement is sort of like a flow uh, of, 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 of cultures in relationship to things. I hope so. There's certainly been uh, um, in these ayahuasca ceremonies uh, that are practices that are practiced in the West. Although the container, like I said, you know, and many of the aspects, you know, resemble the indigenous uh, and traditional practices. Certainly, you know, there is a whole set of, you know. Um, a, a, a cultural understanding and relationship that is missing. You know, most of most of uh, most of people that approach ayahuasca um, in our societies do it out of a sort of, um, I would say, existential issues. They're they're very they're very um, they're very Western issues. They have to do with meaning. They have to do with certain sort of life crisis. They have to do with being confused or not knowing what to do. They have to do with self-knowledge, understanding ourselves better. You know, um, the aspect that is definitely missing there because it's missing in our culture, period. It's, a co it's, it's the collective and communal aspect in the terms of can we also work on group problems and communal problems. This aspect is absolutely key in the traditions, uh, but, it's, but it's lost, uh, largely lost for us because, our, because, because, because this concept of community, you know, is very lost. You know, some, somebody said that, um, that uh, you know, white people only understand two groups of people, you know, you know three groups, you know, me, then there's like, my friends, my family, and the people that I care for. And then there's humanity. And there's nothing in between. There's no such thing as, you know, my village or my neighborhood, you know, or, you know, what, what you know, what indigenous groups would be my tribe, my community. 
uh, with, with this, 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 this sense is very, uh, is very diluted for us. So we only understand it as something very near and very close or as something very, very wide. That means, you know, the whole world, but not, but not, but not as something actually local and rooted in a certain people, in a certain territory, in a certain place. Um, so this aspect is, you know, you, it's not, it's not, it's not so present in ayahuasca. I would also say being positive that it, it, it has been my experience that people, uh, that engage, you know, as they drink ayahuasca and time passes, as they, they engage in the practice of drinking ayahuasca, because it is a practice, it's not something, you know, it's, it will be like, you know, I don't know, like, like, like reading poetry and watching films. It's not something that you can say, well, I'm just going to watch two films and, oh, I tried films already. I watched twice. No, it's like the more films you watch, you know, the, the, the more you enjoy it, the more you understand what filmmaking is, the more you can appreciate good films and separate from bad ones. And, and the more they give you similarly with poetry or opera or anything else. Now that doesn't mean that you have to watch a film every day or every, you know, every other, there's also such thing as an excess, but generally it's, it's relational, you know, uh, ayahuasca is something that you build a relationship with and that you, it, it, one of you learn you know, Benny Shannon used to say the main thing that one learns from ayahuasca is the art of drinking ayahuasca because it is something that you have to learn. But my experience is that people that engage in this, and it also happened to me, there is a point after they, they usually begin dealing with a lot of personal stuff, but there is a point in the process, you know, um, so I would say, you know, for those that don't know, usually the sort of arc of this practice looks something like this. People usually approach ayahuasca in some sort of crisis, you know, they have some sort of problem, they have something they're, they're, they're working through. And then as they work through it, uh, usually at the beginning, there is a period that is more intense where people are going more frequently. They're going, I don't know, every month or a couple of times a month, you know, no, nobody can drink ayahuasca every day, no, nor would anybody want to. Uh, um, but there's more frequency at the beginning. And then, and then as people sort of get through that stuff, get, get sort of process that initial thing, then it turns to, it turns into something that looks more like maintenance. I can also, you know, speak for myself after 20 years drinking ayahuasca. I drank a lot more when I started more and more often. And I, and I had the need for it also more often when I started. And then as with time, you know, it became some, something that now I drink, you know, just a few times a year and it's not something that you know that, that that is a necessity but also some but, but actually something that i that i that i choose to do but as people go from this first phase of sort of processing the stuff and they get through usually the initial stuff that is very personal there is a point where people become interested in this they become interested in you know who is my family or who are my people? I mean, and even who are my, what are my traditions and what are the traditions that I come from? I found that, uh, you know, um, it's my experience that people that come from, you know, contexts where, where religious was present, religion was present, even if they sort of rejected them, uh, um, as they engage in drinking ayahuasca, they become interested in this. That doesn't mean that they necessarily become religious themselves again but they they reach a new relationship with that not and i'm not talking here about religious religion as a as a sort of uh, abstract thing that 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 that, it, that that is something that you believe or not or choose i'm talking about religion in terms of a cultural force that is very much being part of you know if not your life certainly the life or uh, or the life of your parents certainly the the life of your grandparents of your great grandparents and of your great great grandparents so as as one goes back one finds that this is more and more powerful and this and this are uh, so i've seen you know everything you know jewish people become reinterested in it and and uh, and muslim people become reinterested in it and you know it also you know redrew my own relationship with christianity now that doesn't mean that i became a devout christian but it certainly means that i i i, I had to i had to look and reconsider and regodge what it meant and what the role it and the role that it has had not just not just in my life you know but in what you would call in the life of my people um, and this is part of the, this is also something that happens. Um, uh, it doesn't, it won't happen to everybody, 
but it happens. You know, somebody told me that um, that uh, that ayahuasca is a plant of reconciliation, and that's a good metaphor to think about it. So that it reconciles people first with themselves, and then with the people around them, and then with the and and then this goes in wider and wider groups. You know, so then it goes from yourself to the people around you, to your culture, and then to the traditions of your culture, and then to your place, and then to sort of to sort of this sort of understanding of where you stand and where you come from. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to accept, you know, uh, unacceptable things that happened in the past or, or or that your ancestors did, but that you have to, you know, uh, acknowledge, acknowledge that you too are part, you know, and 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 descend from from certain cultures and traditions and cultural forces and that um and that there is a place for reconciliation uh if not if not with the if not with the letter of the law at least with the spirit of it did that make sense am i, am I making sense <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely uh, uh it once again opened up many many branches that i'd like to follow but i'll first follow with uh regarding how ayahuasca and maybe psychedelics in general uh, direct at least some some of the people who uh, get in contact with them towards asking questions about where they come from and what's their relationship to a broader whole. And I think the longing to be connected uh, to a history is something that's very profoundly human and something that we need. and in our time where it's really difficult for many people to get a grasp of where they're coming where they're coming from uh, which is like partly coming from the fact that we're just living in societies with millions of people and uh, uh, societies that have organized themselves in a way completely different from most of the societies that came before it's really understandable that people have a longing for this and also i started thinking about the sort of pathological ways that that sort of longing can take form in our society so for example like extreme ethno-nationalism which like uh, uh i don't know if cause is the correct word but i try going with that that they co that causes people to to raise uh them and whatever part of humans they consider to be a part of their people uh, onto a pedestal that's like better than everyone else and i don't know maybe tribal societies also did that but but tribal societies were, were also engaged in games that were entirely different from us because we now have like uh, weapons of mass destruction and that sort of like political narratives or myths that put one ethnic group on the pedestal can have uh, effects that are just so so different from anything that tribal societies were ever able to to have and it's just very understandable that people have that longing and if they don't have rituals or practices that connect them um, into a past into a history into a, a narrative a story that makes sense and mm, cultivates feeling of belonging in this world it's no no surprise that people uh, build up pathological uh, for example political uh, political uh, forces out of that and in a sense it's so easy to understand where that's coming from and in a way it's also difficult to just blame in individuals for for doing that in a toxic way because it's not easy in our culture to find practices that would uh, help build maybe a flourishing relationship with your, for example, ancestry, or, or even the feeling of, of lineage that I'm coming from somewhere. Yes, I mean, I, I can speak a little bit about this from my own uh, personal experience, which was, like I said, you know, I think, um, you know, both both ayahuasca and my own um, my own work and being close to indigenous communities, and indigenous cultures through, you know, numbers of documentaries and just a sort of long-standing personal interest in this sort of triggered triggered this sort of you know search for me and then i participated in a number of you know uh, workshops and stuff you know in a more organized way in what is called ancestral recovery 
Um, this, 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 this was done in, uh, in the context of sort of anti-racist work. So, you know, it's not, and, um, two things, two things happened, you know, first of all, is that, you know, when you go back, uh, generations, usually what you find is not nice. You know, a lot of the people that I was working with were people living in the United States or in Canada. So, you know, they, they basically came as they look into their ancestry, they came to the fact that, you know, their ancestry were colonizers that took over the land of indigenous people, you know. And then, you know, so that this is one aspect that what you find is usually not nice or one part of it is certainly not nice. And then, and then, um, and then the other part, of course, is that, you know, the last time that sort of, you know, white Europeans engaged in any sort of, you know, going back to the roots type of thing, um, it was, you know, absolutely disastrous for the whole world. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it, it, it had, it had, it had catastrophic effects. Both things, both things are very true. Um, and yet, um, this is the, 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 the fact the fact that you know that there's a lot of discomfort in this it's precisely the reason uh, why one should engage with it because it's not something that you can put away and this sort of this sort of solution as saying well i'm looking i'm not looking towards the past and i'm just sort of talking about humanity as a universal whole as opposed to you know and and sort of skipping the the middle place between you know your your close group your family and friends and and humanity as if it doesn't exist uh, that's that's not a, that's not also a solution. It's sort of it's sort of a, 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 a fact is escape. There's 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 a there's a gap there. There's a gap there, and in in my own experience, it actually um, makes a conversation and relationship with indigenous people more difficult because because you're not you're not you're not talking uh, each from their own side of the. Of the river, as it was, you know. There's a there's a um, quote from the Dalai Lama that says, you know, I, I think it's great that uh, all of these, you know, Westerners are now interested in Tibetan Buddhism and and they want to learn more about meditation and about our practices and our our spirituality, you know. But if we can't sit in a table, you know, and you know, we talk about our spirituality and they talk about their spirituality, you know, if they just come to us and they're just sort of taking in well this is not really much of a conversation and it's not much of a relationship either in a way in a way it turns into another version of, of extractivism so that's that's you know how one sort of manages this you know this this very complex and uncomfortable place uh how one can sort of make peace uh with the past while still recognizing you know, and honoring, you know, uh, uh, the place of our ancestors, you know, the ones that got us here uh, in, a, in, a, in a similar way as, you know, you know, practically every other culture in the world does, right? You know, sort of, you know, uh, ancestor, ancestor worship is considered the first form of spirituality, you know, when, when one looks at the earliest forms, you know, of, of, you know, sort of ritual works and practices, you know, a lot of it had to do with ancestors, you know, and this is still very much the case uh, um, all over the world, and even in in a sort of our modern uh, many expressions of modern sort of psychotherapy, like uh, family constellations, you know, they have to do with this fact, you know, this sort of this sort of you know summarizing in a very sort of yeah, making a huge sort of simplification, you know, it 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 it, it would say something that like you know the ancestors must be happy uh, for people to be happy. Um, how how this is how this is done? You know how how one you know uh, 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 honors and maintains that sort of relationship. You know without uh, uh, repeating you know the terrible mistakes. You know you know so you know you know there's you know Jonathan and I used to talk about the wisdom of the ancients and the folly of the ancients. You know and both both things are true. You know so how how can we how can we uh, do this? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's perhaps not the topic for, the, for, for this interview, but I would say that, you know, my, my experience is that often the work with ayahuasca leads people back to this place and also their relationship with, uh, the, you know, their relationship with other peoples and with indigenous cultures. In the place where it touches with ayahuasca has, has to do with this, the, the dark side um, of... Um, 
of, of, of this idea that, hey, we don't know how to do this right and we can learn from the people that have been doing this the longest. This is, this is, a, this is, this is, this is, a, this is a beautiful thing, I believe, and, 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 and it's a wonderful historical opportunity, but it's also full of dangers. You know, the, 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 first, the first danger is banalization. It's, 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 it's mistaking the surface for the teachings. It's, 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 mis it's mistaking the rules for the lessons and for the learnings. And it's a sort of, and, and, and that descends in a sort of imitation of the outside shapes. You know, like I'm going to wear the same clothes or wear the same feathers or put the same colors or sing the same songs, you know. And this is usually, uh, not always, but usually done in a very, very superficial way. So it's like, you know, if you want to imagine, you know, let's imagine a country in the world where there's no Jewish people, you know, and then somebody from this country, let's call this country X, is very far away. Uh, becomes fascinated by Orthodox Judaism, just everything, because, I mean, it's a very rich culture with incredible, and there's Kabbalah, and there's, you know, the Torah, and there's, you know, these practices, and it's been going on for thousands of years. And this person who's from a remote country suddenly becomes fascinated with this, and they read everything they can about it, and uh, and they learn a lot, and then they even take a trip to Israel, and then and they meet some, you know, some, you know, um, Orthodox and Jewish people, which they visit, and they ask all of these questions, and they want to learn, they, they spend some time there. You know, and then they go back to their country where nobody has ever seen an Orthodox Jew, and uh, or yeah, in this country nobody has seen it, and they decide to put on a kippah, you know, and open a synagogue. Well, obviously, you know, the people in Israel would probably consider this, you know, uh, a farce. They would say this is not this is not this is obviously not a real rabbi and this is not a real synagogue and this is not real Judaism this is just like a, a bad copy this person doesn't understand anything. Um, however, in country X where nobody knows any better, you know maybe his neighbors totally believe it, you know, uh, and they just sort of go on and believe that this person is in fact uh, uh, that this is in fact a, a synagogue and this is in fact a rabbi. And this is, in fact, what's going on. So, you know, this is sort of a caricature, you know, I'm just sort of painting a very exaggerated portrait. But, you know, the, the main sort of lesson of it is like, you know, nobody wants to be that person. I don't think anybody should want to be that person, you know. Uh, it, 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 can, it, it can be done out of innocence or out of ignorance or out of a way of just sort of, and, and you know, always with the best intentions. But that's not enough. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, you're, you, you know, we're talking about something that is indeed a very ancient culture that, you know, you cannot easily join, you know. It, it doesn't mean that people that are not Jewish could not one day become this. Uh, I think they could, probably, if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the Orthodox Jews would want to let them in. But obviously this would take a long, long time and, uh, and a lot of learning. And there will always be these sort of gaps. So that's the... That's that. That's 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 the that's the first danger, you know. The 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 the, the second danger stands on the opposite direction, and this is sort of I believe you know maybe you know one sort of criticism I have for the uh, for the psychedelic renaissance, which otherwise I believe is you know a very positive thing, is that it doesn't it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't look, it does a little bit like what we did with yoga. They said, okay, this is a medicine. If it's a medicine, it belongs in hospital and with doctors. And the doctors, our doctors who prescribe medicines for, you know, mental problems are psychiatrists. So this will be prescribed by psychiatrists. And our people who, you know, handle the situations are psychologists. So this will be handled by psychologists. So, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists and people like this, medical professionals, will prescribe and handle these medicines and they will be present during the session, during the effects of the ceremony. Not ceremony, because it's not a ceremony. Now it's just sort of a, a therapy, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and they will handle the experience. And nobody seems to uh, realize <laughs> or point out or, or look at the fact that even though our psychiatrists know a lot and so do our psychologists, in fact, you know, having two PhDs from Harvard uh, uh, from psychiatry 
actually doesn't prepare you in the least to sit down with someone who's undergoing a strong psychedelic experience and be able to give that person support. Your training might be very good for doing previous screening, for thinking about, you know, pharmaceutical interactions, you know, and even your training, if you're a psychologist, might really help you to talk to the person after the experience is over and help the person understand what's going on. But in terms of what happens during, during the experience, actually, in fact, in our medical tradition, there's nothing to prepare us for this. You know, I would say perhaps the people who are best prepared in our medical tradition for this are perhaps something close to psychiatric nurses. So there are people that are used to giving care to persons that are going very, that can be very strong experiences. But, you know, most psychiatrists are very uncomfortable with this stuff with a good reason. That's not their job. Um, and also, you know, most of our psychologists are sort of uncomfortable. You know, their training has to do with talking to people after something happens and helping them deal with it, but not to be there <laughs> while it's happening uh, and helping them deal with that. That's, that's what the nurses do in our society is nurses that actually do active care. And the psychedelic experience might, not always, but in some cases require quite active care. Now, it might be that you have a person that actually has no medical degrees, uh, uh, never studied medicine, has none of this training, but and they might even be born in the jungle and you know had very, very little formal education. And yet they are much, much better prepared to handle what happens during the night uh, and how you take care of persons undergoing these very strong experiences. Right? So I wouldn't, you know, I have I do things you know I, I drink ayahuasca myself i also have you know i also have you know a, a, a psychoanalyst you know i also do I, I i also do therapy you know i would not want the person who gives me ayahuasca to do psychoanalysis for me they probably wouldn't be very good at it but also i wouldn't want my psychoanalyst to give me ayahuasca i mean during the night because you know there's just you know there's someone to talk to about things but they're not you know if i have a difficult time you know, and I've had this, this experience, people that, you know, come from the traditions, they have an incredible set of tools to deal with this. Not only that, they actually create an, a container, an environment, a ritual container that makes the experience so much richer, you know, so much richer, I'm saying, that laying down in a cot, you know, putting some, some face mask and some headphones and listening to some pre-recorded playlist. You know, that is, that is really, you know, that that compared to like a good ayahuasca ceremony in the jungle with the music and the songs and the and the shakapa and the tobacco blowing and all of that. I mean, that's like, you know, I don't know, that's the difference between eating like really fresh, delicious food and like astronaut food, you know, this like food that the astronauts have that, are, that is like dried. And, you know, of course, you know, there's some nourishment there, you're not going to die, but it's so far from a fresh, or from a fresh orange, right? And it can never be that. So, this is the other side of the problem. So one one problem one part of the problem is that we 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 look we look into it uh, with interest, but but with ignorance, and we we banalize it or worse, you know, and often you know causing harms to the to the communities of origin. And then the other extreme is that we don't look at it at all uh, because we think that we can do it ourselves uh, and we can figure out a way to do it better without paying any attention. To the to the to the knowledge and to the wisdom of people that have been doing this for hundreds of years, so again it would be like you know if I decided to I, I lived in a place where there's no wine and I decided to make wine, but not to look at people that have been making wine for the longest, but just I'm just going to figure out myself. I'm just going to figure out with science. I'm going to measure the grapes and the temperature and the this and the that and blah 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 and the cook and I'm just going to figure out myself what's the best way to do wine. And it might be that this scientific wine eventually will be very good, but you know people have been making the delicious wine already for a long time without any need for this, just with sort of observation and relationship to the grapes, to the weather, to the, to the temperature and, and to the flavors and to these other things. So th th this, 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 these two things stand sort of in the polar opposites. And then the, 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 the type of solutions that I'm interested in or, or that I find most inspiring have to do with actually having the um, the the uh, the ability to to uh, 
to pick up the teachings that stand uh, behind the indigenous practices without taking the practices themselves. So, you know, the, the, the in, in indigenous, indigenous and traditional uses of ayahuasca are local cultural answers to universal human problems. What we have in common is the universal problems. What we don't need to do, which is, you know, what we do with experience or with someone that, but that is getting upset, the mistake is to think, well, I will take their solution and I will do the same. Um, so how you learn from the lessons, and this is, you know, one of, I think, you know, culturally and just sort of as, sort of as, as a per personal adventure is one of the most sort of fascinating, valuable things that you can, that you can do. You know, what, what, when, when you engage with other people, with other cultures, other relationships, whether it's other people or other cultures, they become always, by necessity, an, a, a, an invaluable lesson about who you are. It's questionable whether you're actually, you're actually ever able to understand the other. But it's a fact that in trying to, you will learn so many things about yourself. So this is, you know, what the gift that anthropology brings to anthropology and to other people is that not only they learn about how other people live, but this makes them realize just how they live. So I will give an example because otherwise this gets too theoretical. Um, I take, I take, uh, there's, there's a group of people, it's a small, that have already run into a lot of these situations and problems. They have some, I believe, 20 years uh, uh, advantage from, from, let's focus on ayahuasca. And these are and these are people. Uh, so they're small groups, so very very interesting. That do initiation rituals for young people in in a, in the Western country context. This is, there's a series of groups. There are not many again. They're small but very very interesting. That started some of them forty years ago in the sixties and fifties. And at first it was the thing that was sort of it was it was tied to certain sort of outdoors religious groups um, uh, in in the United States, sort of a Boy Scout thing but with an angle of this. And then, and then the first people that started doing this at first, you know, they were looking at initiation rituals in, uh, in, uh, in indigenous cultures. And they, you know, initiation rituals, basically, uh, what they do is they mark the passage from youth into adulthood. And this passage is sort of marked, is, is symbolized by a ritual in which usually young people are, are taken out of the village. They're usually taken, you know, somewhere into nature, into the woods, and they're put, they've been, they, put, they've, they are put through us, you know, kind of difficult experience. It takes many shapes. Sometimes they don't eat, sometimes whatever, sometimes they get beaten or stung by these terrible ants. It takes many, many shapes. But the young people are made to go through an ordeal. And in this ordeal, they have to find their own resources and their own strength to survive and to make it through. And then when they make it through, then they're considered an adult. So it's not just a ritual, it's also a test. And it's important that it's a test because really what the culture is saying is, can we count on you if the shit hits the fan? So there's something, there's real stakes here. It's about also the survival of the group. So at first, these people, they took inspiration from this and they began to copy. They took this song that they like and they took this part of the ritual that they like and, you know, there's many things. And they were just sort of copying things and integrating them into this context. But they, they, they realized, you know, much faster than Ayahuasca people are realizing perhaps, that this was not only wrong because it didn't belong to you, uh, it just didn't work and it, and it wasn't the point and that you had to look deeper. So what they realized is that, okay, they could take young people to the woods, you know, and do something that was, you know, more, you know, more, not, not, not so, perhaps not so difficult as it is for us. You know, kids are just made to spend 24 hours by themselves. There's people nearby, but there's still the, the, the main core of it. You can make young people go through something that will make them tap on their own resources and find their own strength, which is what you want for this step from, from youth to adulthood. But then what happened was that it didn't seem to be as effective as it was in the indigenous groups. 
in the traditional groups. And the reason they realized is because in the indigenous groups, it wasn't just the fact that young people were going through this very difficult experience and then finding their own resources and their own strength. It was that they went through it and then when they came back, the entire community recognized this change in them. So it's not just about a personal transformation that happens, but it's about how this, is, how this transformation is witnessed by the others. That really gives it its transformative strength, right? In our society, for young men back in the day, this was the military service. You know, the military service played this role. And then, you know, young men from villages, you know, that were just, you know, that they went to the military service and they came back transformed. You know, they went through, they, they went through their own ordeal. But okay, we're not in that situation. These people were in a different situation. And so the question was, how do we do it? So, you know, the, when you could look at other societies and say, well, in this society, they changed the name of the children. You know, and then they start being, you know, addressed by a different name. But, you know, we can't do this because we don't change the name of children from one weekend to the next. You know, so how, how does how does this and how does one take them the lesson without without taking the 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 culture, without taking the cultural object, without taking something that is not yours. And what they realize is that, you know, it, 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 they, they develop their own thing. And what they, what they did is they asked the parents, when the parents come to pick up the kids after this you know, two-week retreat, and they, they greet them, they have to greet the children like it's the first time they, met, they meet them. They have to say, hello, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so happy to meet you. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. You know? And this is this is a story just telling it. I get emotional. People that listen and get emotional. This this touches something very deep, like a very deep human need that young people have as they grow up, not just to prove themselves, but to be recognized by their adults as being, you know, worthwhile member now of the other thing, right? So there is an incredible treasure there that indigenous people have or they put in front of us and we can indeed get you know great inspiration and learning from it if only we're not so stupid <laughs> as to one think there's nothing there or two think that we have to take whatever is there and just copy it you know like uh, like uh, or, or imitated it so this is this is this is where the um, this is where the magic happens for us culturally, you know, in this encounter, and this is the part that I'm more most interested in, in, in the, and that's why I think ayahuasca is so special and so interesting because because so much because there's already a few elements of these there, you know, there's 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 work, right? I will I will, I will give you I will give you another example. There's been uh, recently uh, a, a, a series of uh, scandals around. Uh, um, sort of abuse of power and sexual abuse in the context of of uh, of, um, of psychedelic ceremonies, going all the way from sort of traditional all the way to you know uh, to clinical research. You know, and and this has sort of like raised the topic about you know what what uh, you know what what the ethical boundaries are and also you know at the which is necessary and important and also at the more practical level sort of a debate about what type of physical touch is allowed or or should be allowed in the context of this and you know what you see is the development of things like well you shouldn't hold people's hands but you should hold them like this you know things like you know it it, it has it has to do with the fact that sometimes during uh, during uh, psychedelic experiences, people need physical comfort. And yet, depending on the person, some forms of physical comfort, as we know, holding hands, putting your hand on someone's shoulder, putting your arm around someone's shoulder, even giving somebody a hug, you know, depending on the person and where the person are and what their problems are, this could be something really uh, 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 useful. And if the person will feel supported, or it could be really triggering and, you know, send the person off into a really bad place because of bad associations with it. So the solutions that are being presented is, are around like either not touching people, period, or if they're touching, asking for permission or just sort of complex, different ways of touching. 
in the in the Amazon. Um, let's just take let's I, I will just take sort of like urban you know uh, a fall killing uh, ayahuasca you know which is called vegetalismo is this sort of like the urban version of ayahuasca works which is you know what people what most foreigners are familiar with is what you you largely find around cities like Iquitos, Pucallpa, etc. In there, they have this practice, which is very similar to one that you find in indigenous communities, which is called soplada. Soplada is the blowing of tobacco over people. So, you know, it's either tobacco or perfumes are blown over people's crown and the head and in the hands and in different parts of the body. I'm, I'm sure you have seen it or even experienced a few times. Um, the soplada is a, it's a, it, it's a key aspect of the intervention of, of the, of the, uh, of the curandero. And it's where all of his personal power resides and it's how he sort of projects this over the person. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, however, I'm not going to go in the sort of the very important energetic, uh, spiritual, uh, ritual aspects of it. Uh, which are the most important, but instead I'm just going to focus on the most on the on the on the on the, on the most bottom layer, um, you know, the most practical and pragmatic one. When you look at a soplada, what you're looking at actually is a language of care, because there's no doubt in your mind that you're being cared for when you're receiving a soplada. Somebody's doing something for you to feel better and you do feel much better it is a language of care but it does not use the same elements of the language of care of everyday life which will be hugging people putting your arm around their shoulders or or, or holding their hands right so the 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 teaching there if we if we care to look you know beyond the sort of energetic you know, uh, and other aspects of the soplada, which are incredible, but that's the part that we can't learn, <laughs> not so well or not without a lot of work. The lesson there below is that the psychedelic experience, because it is outside of this world, because it is so different from everyday life, requires a physical language of care that is also outside of everyday life. And that cannot be mistaken for anything intimate or sexual or, or romantic. It is clearly care. You're clearly being cared for. And yet, you're not being touched. You know, curanderos touch you with their breath. They touch you with a leaf fan. They touch you with a feather. But they don't touch you, no, or not always, directly. So this is, this is where the... This is where the lesson lies for us. I think, should we care to listen? you know, at the lowest level. So that sort of these arguments about like, should we hold the hand like this or like that? It's like actually what is being asked of us or what the experience asks, asks of us is something slightly different. Is how can we make people feel that they're being taken care of without using the language of everyday life, the physical language of everyday life, so that there's no confusion. So that people will not feel, you know, uh, uh, um, invaded or intruded and it's like this no this is this is this is uh this is you know i painted one extreme of you know you know the sort of the appropriation uh, and i painted the other extreme which is the sort of the 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 the, 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 the complete sort of taking nothing you know so the, the appropriation would be taking too much and the and the sort of medicalization would be taking nothing from, from indigenous wisdom. And what I believe is sort of like the, 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 the sweet spot, the, the stuff where the magic happens, which is that we are really able to not learn by being inspired um, by the wisdom of people that have been doing these things much longer than us. But, you know, without falling in either extreme of either taking what is not ours, appropriating what are not ours, or going to the other extreme and just basically having to learn from zero and making all the mistakes ourselves. Hmm. Yeah, this is um, connecting also to, you were talking about surfing before and people learning from from each other in there. And I'm, th I'm thinking about the role of mentorship in our society and the question of how much in a situation like this where we cannot just copy uh, the practices of of another society into our own 
And uh, looking at the bigger picture that's being formed uh, in relation to our relationship with psychedelics, true uh, part of the people um, learning directly, pr part of the people learning more theoretically that they read about the ways uh, other societies have uh, handled psychedelics and then they draw from there what's, what seems uh, workable. And, and then all, of course also we have uh, part of the people who just dive in head first, they improvise and they don't even want to know what's been done before them. And I think all of those can bring an important part of the picture if you, if you think about the bigger picture as our societies, Western societies, or perhaps even even the all of the societies on this planet, because also the indigenous uh, traditions are changing and evolving all the time. So I think like all of this bring an important part of the puzzle, but uh, but I, I think our society. I be when I if I take an example from my own life, I've been starting to realize where relationships uh, that have some sort of mentorship uh, have started feeling valuable and where my eyes have opened towards that has been uh, from my practice of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because I've, I've, I've always had a bit of problem with authorities like uh, already back from school days. It was really difficult for me to accept like someone older than me or in general anyone telling me that this is the way we're going to do this and we're just following the advice or the instructions and not uh, bringing in my own point of view of how it should be done but Brazilian jiu-jitsu is nice in the sense that you quite quickly become very aware that you know nothing that you really know nothing you don't understand anything about how things are supposed to be done and through that practice is now my fourth year uh, of, of practicing that I've started to realize that I actually really enjoy there being at least some part in my life where I just don't think too much about what's my own way of doing this but I'm just thinking about how do I pay attention in the sense that I can really follow the instructions that I'm being given and uh, I know that in time when you listen to instructions and pay attention to instructions and try do your best to to follow them in time your own personality also starts finding ways of of uh, mm, of, of happening in the practice that you do but but through that uh, practice of martial arts I've started to realize more areas in my life where I actually uh, really appreciate the possibility of of being instructed by someone more knowledgeable than me and I recently started guitar lessons I've been playing the guitar most of my life but uh, I've only had some lessons and I just decided that at this point uh, for my improvement and my my learning of of the craft of guitar playing is is really useful to to have a mentorship role or or some or re mentorship relationship or something like that and and I think also like Curving back to our discussion regarding people feeling the longing for connection uh, with ancestors and and in general just the desire to belong, I think it's one of the most important sources of of mental health problems and in general all of the problems that we have on this planet. And it's challenging because you were talking a bit about, a bit ago about the way we maybe glamorize uh, indigenous cultures or, or tribal people or whatever, uh, we definitely do that. Uh, you, you use the word banalize, and I think it's both like banalizing and, and glamorizing. And also I think we can have a tendency to to glamorize our ancestors. ancestors and uh, it's also like uh, one point of view that I just encountered a while ago is that if you look back, the fact is that all of your ancestors will have shitloads of offspring. You're just like one of the amazing amount of offspring <laughs> that that they they and their offspring had, and uh, to th to think uh, that you are very important and special to your particular ancestors might be. I don't know if it's always that way, but might be a bit of a 
of an ego thing, like putting too much importance in yourself as an individual, but at the same time, just like having a relationship even to the abstract idea of ancestorship can be very healing and, and strengthen a feeling of belonging, feeling of being a part of a continuation. In the same sense uh, as you in the beginning of this conversation talked about how you view, view your work in relation to ayahuasca as just being a part of a bigger emerging thing that you are just like serving yeah. to the best of your ability. Mm. Th this was sort of a uh, a bit chaotic, but but I hope you can connect to to the things mm. that you've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, of course, and and this 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 all ties to uh, things that you know for me were triggered by ayahuasca, but I actually learned from these people that were not, they were not working with ayahuasca at all, they did not work with plants, they were, but they were working with ritual and they were looking towards indigenous sources. They said that, you know, the, 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 the ancestors care for us like any, like you care for your plants, you know, you might have many plants, you know, and of course you don't, but you're, you're invested in all of them. I mean, it's not the fact that you have many that doesn't, you know, and you want to see them grow and you feel good when they do. Um, they said the, 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 the message from the ancestors to us is very simple. It's just, don't you dare die just yet. Right. That's, it's as simple, it's as simple as that, because that's what they want to see. Uh, they want to see you living, but because that's also what you want of your own children, you know. So it's just sort of, it's a replication of that. Um, and then the, and then ab about mentorship, which this, this, uh, these people also uh, work with and spoke a lot about. Um, you know, one one thing that stayed with me was it was two things. One was that they said that. Uh, that this is that this is actually a biological imperative in mammals. That when you watch mammals, it's sort of most mammals will sort of small when they're small and they're growing up, they will pick up on a on a on an older uh, 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 member of of the of the species of the group, and they will observe and copy this one. So that this is this is actually for mammals. It's a biological imperative to look to look at people older than yourself and to try to learn from them because a lot of the behavior of mammals is actually learned, it's not programmed. So we're not like, you know, animals that are not, that don't live in groups like seashells <laughs> and, you know, and starfish, etc. who just sort of, they, 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 they rely on instincts, you know, uh, culture, you know, it's so important for mammals, especially sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, what are we call uh, primates you know, that you cannot even get the most basic things. So, for example, you know, uh, uh, chimpanzees learn to have sex by watching other chimpanzees have sex. If you take, if you take, a, if you take a, a male chimpanzee out of the group and you raise him by, by himself and then you bring him back to the group when he's fully developed, he will have the sexual drive or the sexual instinct, but he will have no idea how to mate with a female. It's not, it's culturally learned. It's not... Uh, is not uh, instinctually programmed like it is for animals that live by themselves. So this is like a, it's a biological imperative of mammals to look at the others. And in this place, they said the role of mentorship, the, 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 most, the most important part about the role of mentorship, which is the one where we most often make the mistake, is that it is the student that has to pick the mentor. It will not. It will not work any other way. Not fully work any other way. So you cannot say, "Grab these children that want to learn." I'm going to be the teacher because I decide that I'm the best teacher for these children. Blah 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 blah. There is a process that happens there that is previous to all of that, that involves for the growth of the student of the young person, that the young person themselves pick this up because then then they're following their instinct and the whole cycle is sort of 
completed, you know, which is so, so then the way they go about it is that as they go into these, you know, workshops themselves with young people and there's a number of different um, uh, guides is that they make sure that all the kids get to spend a little bit of time with all the guides, which have, you know, pretty different personalities. So when the time comes to choose a mentor, the, the, the kids have had an experience of all that and they choose themselves instead of the other way around. Um, it's, it's this sort of, I, I don't know what to call this, this sort of reconnection with things that are like both cultural and biological and programmed us and that are part of just, you know, the way we are as human beings, as animals in this planet, as social beings, stuff, you know, that we have, you know, lost so much of, but they're still there in so many cultures that have been, you know, that, have, that, 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 that haven't experienced the cultural sort of dislocations and breakups that we have, you know, because of technology uh, and just, you know, just modern history being what it is and urbanization and, you know, all of this. Uh, um, it's, it's, again, you know, I, I think it's, 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 there's, there's a certain sort of, um, a, a, a very uh, deep uh, a magic for us, you know, when 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 we and 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 it's very strong, you know, it's very strong emotionally. We feel it, we feel it's right, we feel it's working, we feel it like it clicks very very quickly because it simply sort of reinstates something that we sort of know, um, even though you know you can't, you couldn't, you couldn't express it yourself until you, it's put in front of you. Um, so I'm trying to tie this back up to ayahuasca. Um, so, um, and to, and then, you know, one more thing that I wanted to say, because I, I, I painted these two polar extremes, but you know, about, you know, the, the, the you know, the sort of the, 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 the false rabbi and, 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 and the scientist, there's also lots of people that are not indigenous that have gone through very, very long process of apprenticeship in the, in the Amazon jungle and that they've had very long relationships with indigenous traditions and that they have, uh, you know, very much learned and, 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 and obtained permission to do what they're doing. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, um, uh, leave anybody out of, out of this. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's impossible for people from outside the Amazon to learn to work with ayahuasca in very traditional ways because I've seen it many, many times it happens. I just know that it's difficult, very difficult. And also that it's full of, uh, that there's always these two dangers, these two siren songs sort of singing from in the direction and, call, and calling and calling people in one direction or the other, right? So, you know, it's, it's all, all, all of this, all of this is in this spectrum of practices. Mm. I'm also thinking about what you've said, because much of what we know about traditional uses of ayahuasca has been born and shaped in little little villages, small small villages with not that don't have a uh, millions of people, and in our current time, there's a lot of talk about sort of like tribalism that's been uh, also uh, what's the word that's been spiced up by our social media. Uh, applications and and the algorithms but the way we talked about talk about tribes in that context context is that we talked about tribes as collections of people who are getting together because they find some sort of ideological resonance that they share some mm. political uh, stance or something and this brings them together but traditionally both the word tribe and the word community has referred to people who haven't chosen each other, but who are together as a, um, like a, due to a demand of the circumstances. And this is very different. You don't choose those people because if you, it's like either you are with those people and try to find ways to, to get along together or you die. So uh, please talk about this. 
Yeah, this is this is a this is a very common misconception from people in in the West that look back towards traditional cultures and that you know that lived in tribes or in groups, <coughs> and then they try to replicate this and build modern tribes. You know, from the hippies to you know this 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 idea has been there all the time. It's even a big part of um, a lot of our marketing. You know, young join the tribe or join the movement or you know it's it's used even to sell us crap. But a lot of it stems from a misconception, you know, which is that a tribe is an affinity group. You know, an, an affinity group is, is people, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of people that you have an affinity with. So people who like the same sports team as you, or people who like Burning Man, or, or, or people who like Ayahuasca, or people who like the same political parties, or people who have the same ideas as you. These are affinity groups. And then when these affinity groups get created in our societies, which happens all the time, and that's what we look for. That's, you know, the punk scene and the skating scene and the surfing scene. And, and, and you know, it just, it, just, it, just, it just goes on and on. Then people sometimes use that, that, those, those, those ideas, you know, the, those, those, even those concepts of tribe or, 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 or community. Um, and this is a very big misunderstanding of what goes on in indigenous societies because, you know, for them... You know, the, the tribe and the community is the opposite of, you know, a group of people, uh, you know, who, uh, who you choose. They are the group of people that you were born with and you didn't choose and that you have to live with. So they're a lot closer to our family. You know, you choose your friends, but you don't choose your family, you know. And then the lesson, and this is why, again, you know, a lot of the rituals that involve ayahuasca or even coca uh, leaf, again, I'm going to... I'm going to go sort of below the spiritual, mythological, cultural, and religious aspects of it, which are the most important and the most fascinating. Uh, and I'm just doing that because I find there's plenty of people that have already spoken about this. And my own, uh, my own personal sort of engagement with this, as I'm trying to explain, is I'm trying to look at a much lower level um, to just sort of find, you know, what what this what this what a lot of these rituals have to do with you know has to do with cultural cohesion with collective cohesion right because when you're living with the same group of people all your life there's not really a lot of room for you know having fights and going to the other end and never talking to this person again moving to another city you know moving to another neighborhood blocking the person in whatsapp and you know the type of things that we do in our society when we have a disagreement you know, indigenous people, indigenous communities, so they can't afford to disagree too much. So then the, 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 the way that the plants, the coca, the ayahuasca, you know, the way they are used, you know, the way they are used, again, removing, you know, without going into the, the, the really beautiful stuff, which is the spiritual and, 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 and cultural uses, it's as it's a tools of social cohesion. You know, these rituals, these dances, where everybody's going on step, dancing at the same time. It's how people reconcile themselves with each other, with their territory, with the environment, and of course with the spirits. It all happens, it all happens at the same time. So it is, you know, fascinating to watch how different, you know, debates are among indigenous people. You know, when, you know, the few times that I've been able to sit on the roundhouses, you know, and, 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 and listen in. First of all, they're much, much longer than our debates. And second of all, they're not debates. Nobody is interrupted. Everybody's allowed to speak as long as they can, as long as they want. They're not, and they are never exactly directly contradicted in the way that we will have a political debate. You know, you, you will, you, you will, you will, you will hear things like, such and such has said such and such, you know, to sort of summarize what the other person said. And then something like, my thinking goes in a different direction. That's, and then what happens is that things get sort of chewed up, you know, they get talked around in circles and circles and circles. And for us, from us as external outsiders, and I know this from people that have worked, you know, very close in sort of NGOs with indigenous uh, people, it can be, it can feel really, really long and kind of tiresome and exhausting. And we have a tendency to, okay, can we just come to some agreement? No, it's going to go around, around and around and around until the agreement just makes itself there's a point at which, as it's, and it might take a long time, 
but it's a real consensus. It's not, it's not sort of like a negotiation. You know, I give you this, well, I give you two, if you give me three, the way our, politi the way our politicians work, oh, I take this part, but if you change this, I'm okay with this, but not if you change this other thing, and then you just come to this sort of like minimum, minimum common denominator. No, it's not, it's not that. It's a much, it's a much sort of subtler process by which people arrive to a certain place and everybody does. And then when they have arrived there, then it's done, then it's consensus. Um, there is in our society uh, something really interesting that Quakers do, uh, um, which they, you know, you can, you can sort of Google it, but it's something like they have a similar sort of process in which is sort of, they're waiting for the spirit to speak and everybody's speaking in the meeting and it might take really, really long, but there's a point when everybody knows that is done. Um, this is this is this is for them both beautiful and necessary. You know, for us because it's not necessary, you know, then we sort of you know go in the other direction, and that, that's also why we lose the group and the connection to all of these things. So it's like how how do we, you know, you know, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, uh, uh, as we sort of, you know, uh, become in the free individuals, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, in the Western sense, and that also brings many opportunities and possibilities and things that also, you know, indigenous societies don't have, you know, they don't, they don't get these choices that do I want to do this and that, or as, as we sort of, you know, enjoy this, you know, how do we keep track of what is it that we're losing? Uh, and how do we make sure that, you know, we keep at least the basic of the important things that, you know, that have to do with belonging, that have to do with territory, that have to do with your culture, ancestors, where you come from. You know, it, this, this, again, requires of us a new solution that is not exactly the indigenous solution. It can't be. Yeah, it's a big challenge that we cannot just scale scale up the ways that uh, people in small tribes yeah. are doing things that we really need to innovate we need to improvise we are also facing problems that even though they have maybe parts of the solutions are similar to what people living in small societies have but but also like if you think about problems such as like uh, biodiversity loss or cr climate change or the pollution of the oceans or uh, game theoretic problems related to uh, nuclear weapons and uh, mutually assured destruction and also the the in a way very rational reasons why many nations want to have nuclear weapons until we figure out a way to uh, de-arm everyone at uh, at the same time and trust that everyone has actually de-armed they are problems that no one has solved before in a, in a way and uh yeah and and also i'm thinking about like how to avoid glamorizing uh, in the in the indigenous ways of solving problems or or just being in relationship with the world because uh it's obvious that as as you said let me actually pick up the the direct quote um uh, it was a different different to topic that we, that you were talking about but you you said in some interviews that it's not a matter of evil gringos and innocent uh you were stopped in the middle of that sentence mm -hmm. but the point being that in the same sense, when you talk about, for example, the uh, effects of ayahuasca tourism or, or co colonization or, or stuff like that, the tendency very easily can be that as we start seeing that there's actually value in co cultures that we have overlooked, uh, maybe we go too far in one direction and throw away everything that we used to believe in in our society, in the Western culture, yeah. uh, even though the, the fact is that there's a lot of beautiful and wise uh aspects of, of of the western cultures as well so yeah how, how to how to balance out is a very difficult question there is um you know uh, someone that i that i respect a lot that has worked um all his life with uh with indigenous uh people in colombia through ayahuasca and this 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 person took a very sort of strong ethical stance that no, not not only were they never going to, you know, put on feathers and, you know, any of these things, but that they were never going to actually serve ayahuasca to other people. 
even though you know their their, their sort of lifetime uh, sort of in relationship and study with indigenous ayahuasca cultures would you know other people have done it before and 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 the way well, most people have done this way and the way he he expressed it he said um for us to have a conversation we need to be in two sides of the river they're on their side of the river on their shore and i'm on my shore and from there we can talk back and forth to each other if i go and i try to stand on their shore then we're not in conversation we're in some sort of competition we're standing you know the 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 um the things that we can learn without romanticizing uh, and without taking what is not ours are much simpler and, 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 and very, very important. It's like, how come, you know, we make four-year plans, but we don't think 100 or 200 years into the future? How come we don't think where this water that we are, this aquifer that we're now tapping is going to be 50 years from now if we keep going at this speed? You know, how come this doesn't inform policies, right? So how come we're so short term, right? And this is, of course, because it goes both ways. If you're not looking at the ancestors, you're also not looking at the people ahead of you. Not very much, you know, not beyond your children. You know, this is not, this is, this is not in our thinking, you know, also because our worlds change so fast. You know, so as we, you know, how do we begin to integrate this way of thinking, you know, and this is, of course, in the, in the stuff that we, you know, f fabricate and, you know, this, you know, this, this mobile phone will be, you know, used for four years, six years, you know, and then it will be trash for a thousand years. You know, this plastic, this glass, this metal is not going anywhere. It will end up in a landfill somewhere and it will take, I don't know how many thousands of years. So it's actual life is a thousand years, but it's actual use is six, right? How come we're building stuff like this? And this is not part of the, of the, or of, 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 of even the conversation or the, or, 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 or the way of thinking, right? So, <clears throat> I believe this is I believe this is where it lies. And then also, obviously, this should be mutual, ideally. Because it's not just that we have deep problems that we can get some inspiration from from indigenous people. Indigenous people have their own set of problems. You know, many of us, many of them created by us. Yeah. And by our uh, and by our interaction, I was recently reading this book by Reichel Dolmatov. And uh and, uh, and he said something like, it was about indigenous people of, of Colombia, said indigenous people of Colombia have gotten, have gotten from us all the problems of modernity and none of the benefits. So, you know, we, 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 we share our problems, but not, but not our, but not our, uh, not, not, not our benefits. And, uh, and we are interested in their benefits, you know, so. So it's how do we begin to create these relationships that are more uh, um, equanimous, you know. And this is, you know, I have, you know, spoken to many people um, that have, you know, much deeper engagement than myself, lifetime engagement with, with indigenous communities. And this is still an issue for them. This is not like, you know, a, a, something that is a quick solution. This is not like... This is not a problem you solve. This is this is sort of like a paradox that you manage. This also connects to one challenge related to the encounter of, of tribal societies and, and the Western societies that uh, when you said that, uh, quoted this person referring to them receiving no benefits, but it's also a fact that there is many things in the modern world that many people living in tribal societies want and appreciate. And this is also connected mm -hmm. to, for example, tourism becoming a, 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 an important source of income for such communities. And then people coming from the Western countries and expecting a part particular kind of indigenous society that they want to find there. And this, mm -hmm. This brings up challenging questions regarding, like, if you live, in a sense, like, live from what you can offer as a sort of tourist attraction, how much does this also enforce you to remain the same? Because all cultures have a nat natural tendency to change, however slowly, over time. But but when you make a lot of your income uh by 
providing something particular that people want, then it might become much more difficult to actually stay connected to what's the organic way that your society would develop throughout throughout time. Yeah. Yeah, I know they've been, they've been, you know, I mean, right now they don't even speak about uncontacted tribes anymore. They speak about tribes in voluntary isolation. So even the idea that there are some tribes that are not in contact with us is not, it's questionable. It might be they've been in contact and they've decided to withdraw, but they have machetes, you know, bananas, which also come from Africa, uh, you know, you know, the, 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 the encounter has already take place. Um, and, 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 and in this, there's also, you know, in, in what you said, there's also good examples and, and, and bad examples, you know, so it's, you know, the, the, the bad example, of course, is this sort of like, you know, uh, 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 riverside communities that uh, wait, that they live their life, normal t-shirts, you know, flip-flops, uh, you know, which would you find all over the Amazon. And then, you know, and then the tourist boat comes from Iquitos and they quickly put on feathers and they put this, you know, this fake, uh, um, um, this fake leaf uh, skirts and they pursue and they produce to do this dance for the benefit of the tourists, right? That's, that's, that's just, that's literally uh, a simulacrum, right? It's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the opposite of a traditional culture. It's the traditional culture as a performance, Right, which is you know, it's at the heart. It's at the heart of tourism. You know, tourism uh, um, uh, by its very nature destroys what it looks for. You know, so tourism looks for you know uh, unspoiled beaches. You know, pristine nature. You know, uh, 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 local bars and restaurants where there are no other tourists. You know, and then when it finds these things, it destroys them, and then it moves on to look for the next thing. Um, so that's that's. Uh, that's 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 one that's that's one extreme. Um, the other the other um, and then and then I will give a, what I believe is a good or, or or for me the sort of an inspired example. This comes I can't believe I can't remember. Um, it's in Brazil. I can't remember if it was the Yawana or the Kashinawa. It's one of these you know Hunikuin group tribes that they have now developed quite a relationship with uh, people from the UK, a group of people in the UK, they come and then they go and they visit and there were sort of this sort of interchange that has been happening now for quite some years. So basically what the, what the, we know what the Westerners, what the Europeans were getting, they were getting, you know, they were drinking ayahuasca and the ayahuasca was helping them in their own personal problems, in their own personal crisis. Right. And then there was these terrible floods uh, in the jungle and this, they, 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 and this, they, they destroyed a, a number of these villages. So now it was indigenous people that were in crisis. And then the uh, people who had been visited, they quickly organized, they pulled some money and they sent all, they sent all sorts of resources. So this thing where it's like, it's not just the Europeans that get help on their crisis, from the indigenous people, but it's also the indigenous people that get help on their crisis from the Europeans. And this doesn't take the form of personal payment to the person who gave you the ayahuasca, but it's a collective payment to the whole community uh, and for the well-being of the whole community. These are, so that's, that's sort of <clears throat> the examples that I would like to see, you know, more of those examples and less of these other ones, you know, of, of, of this sort of performatic. But yes, you know, it's, you know, so, so, somebody, somebody um, was talking about um, um, Canadian Inuit culture, which they had visited, and they said, you know, once these people um, stop hunting whales, you know, they can still do the dance of the whale hunt, but it becomes an empty shell. What is the point, right? You know, is it is it is it is it the same? Because the, the the dance was not it was not it was not a folkloric expression. It was it was it came out of a deep need that was directly tied to an act in the world that was around the hunt of the whales. You know, so you know, without that act taking part, then what is left is like, you know, it's just sort of the previous. Uh, so. And at the same time, it would be terrible if it's lost. There's, there's, so the, all, all, all of, all of, all of these things, all of, all of these things happen at the same time. You know, I, I would say that the, 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 the challenge or, or the work 
or the um, revolves around whether we can help one another heal both both individually and, and culturally and that and that and that this relationship goes both ways now there's also limits to this because there's limits of sustainability there's a lot more uh, 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 Europeans than there's indigenous people in the Amazon so you know and there's a lot more people worldwide who uh, might be interested in drinking ayahuasca than there's uh, indigenous people that could serve them unless that's all they did and that's also not where we want to go so you know an another another part of this of the necessity for us to develop um, uh, to find ways that are you know both uh, inspired and respectful to the source but they're not extractive nor you know sustainable sustainably questionable you know has to do with also recognizing this that this is also this is not just unequal in terms of you know in terms of wealth or or power but it's also unequal in terms of numbers and that and that and that this also has to be respected somehow so i would say in my own personal process i was i was very very lucky because i was working in a number of documentaries to actually visit a number of you know very remote communities that i couldn't have visited otherwise if i wasn't making a documentary i would have never gotten a permit uh, to go to visit those places and i was very very lucky to to meet and to engage with some absolutely incredible indigenous indigenous people and these these experiences changed my life when i was young if i heard through a contact that there was such and such group or there was such and such person for example serving ayahuasca you know i would you know i would try to make it there as fast as i could uh, because at this 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 was such an incredible opportunity and i totally wanted to see this as I've grown and lately, if I hear that in such and such community there's a very uh, old man that is doing very traditional ayahuasca work, I will not go. I'm happy, I'm so happy that this exists. I'm so happy that this still exists. I will find, I will try to find ways to support if I can, but I will not impose myself on them just to serve, you know, what ultimately is just my curiosity or my desire for more exciting stories that make me more interesting to tell to other, you know, people back home or whatever is it that it is, right? All, all, all of these things are mixed up. So, you know, this is also something that has changed for me, um, which is that you will not, you will not find me uh, in a hurry to go back to visit those communities, quite the opposite, precisely because I know how fragile they are and how much of a, a also an imposition my visit is like you know when i was making a document even making the documentary you know sometimes i think like you know who who was benefiting there you know i mean obviously i was benefiting from making a documentary about them you know i made i learned a lot it made me you know i went to whatever festivals and you know go to now i'm talking to you you know I, <laughs> Etc. But you know what? How did they benefit? You know the people that opened. You know their their communities and their homes to me. You know other than that, they got to be characters in these films and 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 they got generously paid, right? So this, you know this this is this is this is also um, this is also part of this sort of learning. Uh, you know, I think for me and 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 for everybody. You touched upon the. When you mentioned the UK group supporting uh, supporting tribes in need, and you've also referred before to how poverty is a very challenging thing, but especially I think in tribal societies, inequality uh, can be a lot worse than just pover poverty on its own. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite difficult because we live in such an individualistic society that we generally want to reward individuals who who mm -hmm. uh, do something that we find valuable and we very easily tend to forget uh, what they stand on, that they're standing on, uh, mm -hmm. resources that were not created by themselves, both like intellectual or, or cultural or mat material resources. But maybe you can talk a bit, bit more about that also. 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is again, you know, a, a, a deep a deep topic. I'm just going to sort of generalize, but this is, you know, humans. We live in groups and we compare ourselves to the others, and you know, part of our happiness or our unhappiness uh, comes out of this comparison. How are we doing uh, compared to them? You know, this is not something that can be. This is just the nature of of social groups and you know and and hierarchical monkeys, you know, which is sort of what we what we descend from. Um, now, uh, for this reason, precisely for this reason, you know, the, on my last film, I, I work with Bruce Parry. You know, Bruce can talk ab ab about this with much more eloquence than me. But basically, there's a theory that the reason why you know nomadic hunter gatherers, which is how humans live for 180,000 years, you know, before agriculture, which is sort of the largest or most you know sort of what what physically shaped us the most lived in equalitarian societies was not uh was not a um, a matter of you know um was was not a matter of just circumstances uh, that you know they were you know nomadic hunter gatherers and they were all pretty much at the same level but it was actually a cultural development and an evolutionary process within human cultures that ensured that the survival could happen so that we went from being hierarchical monkeys where an alpha male just basically was a bastard, you know, uh, 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 that just everybody hated, you know, and that sort of bullied uh, all the other members, you know, which is something that we find, you know, very much in our closest relatives, you know, gorillas and chimpanzees and, and, and orangutans, to this sort of, you know, what we imagine as tribal nomadic hunter-gatherers, which are actually very, very qualitarian societies. There's not even usually a leader, not someone that can be described as a leader. And even sort of the, the ones that are better equipped, for example, the ones that, do, that are the best hunters, they tend, to be, they, they, they tend to have very, very elaborate processes around how the hunt is broken up into equal pieces for everybody. This we were lucky enough to see in Borneo when we were filming with some of the last you know, nomadic hunters, uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers left, which were the Penan, you know, which were, they were in the process of settling. But we saw this, there was, there was, there was one person there that was a natural leader and he was an incredible hunter. And more often than not, he was bringing not all, but most of the food. However, you know, it was incredible to see him break, you know, this wild boar into 17 piles of meat that were exactly the same size so that everybody got the same piece. This is not instinctual. This is cultural. This is, this is, something, this is something that we developed. And it is, as, in a sense, a high civilization, just as ours is a high civilization. Except it's not a high technological civilization, but it's a high relational civilization. Um, now I'm going to, uh, when, um, <clears throat> so I lost it. <laughs> what was, where, 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 where did I, where did I start? From, from the, from the poverty line? and, uh, inequality question. Right. So this, uh, what, what this, what this, what this avoids, thank you. The, the, the 17 equal parts of meat avoids. It's exactly this problem. It's the problem of comparison and the sort of the sort of uh, 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 social frictions that emerge from it. Which again, in a group that that lives close by and completely depends each on each other for life, you cannot afford. You cannot afford those things. So that, that's that's why you that's why you don't go there. And that's the cultural development ar around that. You know how to, how to how to make that possible without again going to some sort of like alpha male, you know, sort of dominance game. Um, so when, when, um, in, in, um, the Bruce, Bruce, Bruce told me, you know, Bruce, Bruce Perry, he, he worked, he worked, uh, he was a host of a show on the BBC called Tribes for many years. And he lived with many indigenous, different indigenous groups. So he shot with many of them. I mean, with so many of them. And when, when a film crew arrives to an indigenous community, you know, there's all sorts of things that are needed. You need people to bring wood and food and you need porters and you need people to help you cook and all of these things, you know, because there's a team filming that cannot. And these indigenous people who give these services, you know, get paid for their services. 
And then there's also because of the nature of filmmaking, usually, you know, you don't film with the entire community because you cannot, you cannot film 50 or 60 people. You end up focusing on one family or maybe two and they become sort of the main characters of the, of the, of the film because that's just how film works. It's character, character based. It's hard to make a film about 60 people. Obviously these people, they give a lot more of their time than the others. And they spend a lot more time with you, and you know, you, you it's quite an imposition on your part to to ask these people to you know be the, living with the cameras and take you hunting and take you all of these things, right? So from our society, it would make sense that these people that are the main characters should get paid extra, like the porters and the this and the that, and I, they should even be paid a lot. In our films, the main characters get paid a lot of money. Right, it's the director, and then the main the main actors. They get the bulk of the money, much more than the extras. They found in the BBC, through I'm sure through trial and error, that when you did that and you left, you actually left the community in a in a worse state than it was, because you had created this inequality. So the rule was that there was always a payment for this, but this payment was for the community, and it was chosen by the community. So you don't pay the person who helped you the most. You pay everybody. So everybody benefits from the person who helped you the most. And you do this and some, sometimes this took the shape of, you know, they would want like an engine, outboard engine or a sort of a medical help or, you know, what, you know, there were different, you know, some solar panels. There were different things that were asked, but these things were for the whole group. And that's how you made sure that you didn't leave things worse than they were when you arrived, that you didn't create more inequality. Uh, even though you were with the best intentions trying to make a film to show the world how important the lifestyle of these people was. So it's these types of lessons. Again, you know, you see that I'm always sort of looking for very sort of practical. Uh, there is a whole theoretical, political angle to this, you know, like there is also a whole sort of like a spiritual energetic aspect to ayahuasca. I, because of the way I am, I tend to focus on these other things instead. I, I find them, I, I like... I like I like uh, uh, practical wisdom. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, my brain is sort of like trying to make what I'm hearing and and thinking about how small tribal societies organize their resources and what that says to our larger societies because of course then it leads to a political discussion of for example uh what are the practical problems that we've witnessed when people have tried in large societies to build something like communism and like everyone like due to political decisions being forced to to get an equal equal amount of course people being what they are also in those sorts of societies end up building hierarchies where the people in the top get the most anyway but i'm like trying to to think about how to think about what did this can teach us uh, uh, considering that our our societies just the, the scaling problem uh, makes it difficult to, to to like to utilize that knowledge directly in our our kinds of societies. Yeah, but I think it should it should just be it should just stand stand at the very least as a warning. We know in our societies too that great inequality gaps create uh, social friction and eventually create social revolt. I mean, this was the French Revolution. This was the very communist regimes that you described. And, you know, it's happened again and again. So, you know, I, I don't know in terms of solution, but the, I think the warning is very, very clear. Now, I don't think uh, that for us it's advisable or healthy to try to force some sort of, you know, equalitarian societies. I, I think, I think, I think we're, we're beyond that. But certainly that we should know that unequal or greatly unequal societies are dangerous for everybody, for, for the people on the bottom and, and eventually also for the people on top. And this is, you know, I think this historically has been proven again and again and again and again. And there's, you know, the history of, of Europe at the very least is full of revolts against, against precisely the elites living on top. Uh, uh, precisely because it come to a point where this 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 comparison uh, uh, this comparison was too 
you know, it, it, it was too bleeding, you know, it was too, 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 too difficult to take. Yeah, I think that was a, a good answer to a not very well uh, formulated question. But uh, yeah, I, I think that would lead into a discussion that's too big for this context here. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah I was thinking about, uh, you used the metaphor before about standing on two sides of the river and the, how this relates to how much we can uh, bring back to Western cultures from what we learn from tribal cultures. And I think one challenge, because we were talking about the, the problem of belonging before and people desiring uh, some sort of connection to ancestors and connection to nature and stuff like that. And uh, I think one problem that's, I think, a valid criticism for New Age movements is that in their sort of like universal outlook, they tend to overlook particularity, that there are actually real differences between human societies. And I think uh, the big challenge, the sort of non-naive approach to those problems is, is like, how do we, how do we integrate? Because there are also very good parts in universality, like in a universalist perspective towards the world, seeing, seeing like which senses, uh, in which sens senses are we in the same boat all together, in what senses maybe all kinds of different um, religious or spiritual traditions might have something in common. For example, ju I just read somewhere someone saying that uh, transformation uh, of the individual in relation to others or the world is, is one thing that's in common in many, many traditions. But, but like, yeah, how, how to have that outlook and at the same time appreciate particularity of of different societies and cultures that stand in particular points of time in particular points in space and and also i think uh, the criticism towards that sort of like new new age universality that tends to overlook the particularities is it's also in a sense that universe universalism is um has something in common with certain tendencies of the globalizing world that uh, has a tendency to replace uh, particular expressions of, for example, like restaurants, replacing them with the generalized McDonald's. And of course, there are many good aspects to the generalized McDonald's. You, you know, if you travel, uh, for example, we drove, uh, uh, drove to Lapland a couple of years ago with my wife and, uh, it was really difficult to find like good vegan food uh, on the road. But then when you have that one particular Finnish hamburger restaurant, you can trust that they have the one thing that you've uh, observed to be good enough and you can settle for that. But of course, we all know what the problems are related to when like multinational uh, chains just replace everything that's particular. So, so yeah, in, in a sense, it's weird that that's the material aspect of like uh, uni universalization, and then there's the sort of spiritual aspect of univer uh, universalization or cultural mm -hmm. aspect. And these are like very strong, strong tendencies in our society as different cultures encounter each other and mix also like looking at the memetic point of view that just some memes might be very dominant regardless of whether they for example are in service of human flourishing so how to how to like uh make those encounters fruitful in the sense that uh uh, supports the preservation of cultural forms that people who are involved in those cultural forms uh, want to be preserved, and at the same time also leaving sp like letting letting people uh, be affected by their encounters of other cultures, be it like us Westerners uh, drawing inspiration for, from tribal cultures or people living in tribal cultures drawing inspiration. Uh, from Western societies. Yeah, that that bring, brings to mind to to uh, <clears throat> two examples. Um, the first one was a person that I met uh, some time ago, and I was in conversation 
And this person told me, you know, I, I travel a lot in the 50s and 60s, but I don't like to travel anymore because now the world is all the same. When I was traveling in the 50s and 60s, you change countries and you really change countries. But now it all seems exactly the same no matter where you go. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel like you're traveling, really. The nature changes, but the rest is you find the same things. And then the other, that's one extreme, no? And then the other example is from a, a, a research I had about a long time ago. There was a point, I guess, in the 80s where Dallas was the most watched television series in the whole world. Uh, so they never had a TV show, had the eyes of more people. That, of course, has probably gotten, you know, several times uh, uh, surpassed. But at some point, it was Dallas. And at this point, as you know, you know, French, particularly the French uh, political system, has always been very protectionist of French culture. And they were very sort of concerned with what they call cultural imperialism of, you know, of American media. So the, the, the French launched a cultural study about Dallas and they went worldwide. You know, they went to Asia and they went to the Middle East and they spoke to all of these people who were watching, who were watching Dallas just to see, you know, what they thought about it and what they were getting out of it. And what they found was that even though everybody was watching the same TV series, the actual interpretations of what was going on there and who was good and who was bad and what was happening between J.R. and Sue Ellen and, you know, and all of these were actually very, very different from country to country. So that uh, in spite of uh, any attempt to sort of, um, 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 sort of standardize something by making everybody watch the same, uh, even if people are watching the same thing, you know, their culture is stronger because they're still reading uh, through the lens of their culture and they're interpreting something else altogether so that, so that in a way, this what looks like a sort of standardization is kind of superficial. Uh, and that e even, though, even though you can find the same restaurants, people remain uh, themselves and very, very different. You know, cultures have a way to stick in, sticking through. Uh, and that, yeah, I mean, you can definitely see that in, in, in uh, you know, I, I, I can give many examples of that. So thankfully, but, but yes, I mean, this, this, the, 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 the universality, you know, how to, how to celebrate what's common while, you know, respecting differences, you know, and how to, you know, give, you know, especially considering that, you know, the biggest frictions happen not with people who are very different from you, but from people that are just slightly different from you, right? So, so the, 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 the biggest fight is between Real Madrid and Atleti de Madrid, you know, and they're the two, two football teams from the same city. You know, they hate each other more than they, than they hate, right? I mean, this, this is, you know, this is also, you know, this also happens at this level, right? There's this uh, Berber, this is from the north of Africa, this Berber saying, that says something like, you know, it's terrible. It says, it says, me, me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my, my brother and our cousin against the neighbor, all of us against the foreigner. Right. So this is sort of how these, uh, uh, <clears throat> both things are also present in human nature, rivalry, you know, competition and cooperation, and uh, you know, and, uh, and and these things are, you know, that it's 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 a it's a it's it's a it's a it's a dance of life, um, and then and then within this, you have cultural answers to sort of manage, you know, and sort of the, play the music <laughs> that, that 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 people will dance to. You know, uh, given 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 that the given that the impulse is there, you know, I I don't think, um, you know, you can end endlessly go on this. Is the world a better place? Are we better off than we've ever been? Is this the beginning of the end? You know, I um I am um, probably all things are true at the same time. Um, you know, we've we've been we've been thinking uh, that this is going to be that, that that very soon the end of the world is coming. And that this doesn't hold this level of you know corruption and 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 uh, and um, and yeah you know but I mean you can read if you read the prophets uh, you know in the Bible they're already saying exactly this like this 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 culture is is full of deceit 
and full of um, and full of corruption, you know, and the and the leaders cannot be trusted, and the people are not uh, obeying, and you know, and in a place like this, you know, surely, you know, the society won't hold, and things are going to collapse, and you know, there's been one 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 sort of or another of apocalypse around the corner since the beginning of times. Um, I hope. It will continue like it will continue like this for quite some time, and it's the threat of the apocalypse that actually keeps us on our toes and makes us, you know, change direction at the last time. Um, yeah, I think this is one of the reasons why populism can be so dangerous in the sense that uh, the populist is stating truths that are always correct, but they are always in the particular political context. So. Uh, ambiguous or the the answers that they are uh, pushing are are much too simple to the complex problems that uh, it leads to disasters but but I think this is one of the main reasons why the populist talk always resonates with people and I can't help but think that mm -hmm. also uh, you refer to like uh, economical protectionism or, or trade protectionism in trade uh, that and the nationalist movement I think uh, even though those both have like uh, many, to they bring many toxic fruit, but I think a part of the inspiration behind them is also recognizing the, the problem with uh, the certain tendencies in our culture to just universalize everything. Yeah, you know, mo mo not, not so much foreign trade as multinationals and sort of the core, the, 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 the great sort of centralization of things. You know, I think, I think, I think that's where the, um, that's, that's where, you know, everything that we're told as sort of, you know, the, 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 the that's, that's, that's where capitalism shoots itself in the foot and it starts, it stops being dynamic. Uh, and and becomes you know when when things approach monopoly, uh, that's when that's when the the whole idea of the free market collapses in itself. And yet there is a tendency of the free market and that to move towards monopoly. So I mean that's another sort of tension that is always there. You know it's it's a, it's a, um, I, I think I think uh, it's not so much the 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 foreign trade, but against the inequality, again the inequality and how it you know the the, the fact that you know much bigger players and with whom people cannot compete uh, uh, come in and sort of stamp out things. You know, it's it's a, it's it's easy for somebody with deep pockets to you know buy all the restaurants or buy a number of small family-owned restaurants, and it's not easy for someone with a family-owned restaurant to compete with with a big chain. Uh, and 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 this is this is where things get a little bit uh, unfair. Okay, let's uh, head back to a broad topic. Uh, that's the unintended consequences that we can expect from uh, the psychedelic renaissance. As a forward uh, forward for uh, diving into this topic, I was thinking about before when you talked about. Uh, the the effect that cars had on our society uh, if you think about in the long term how they transformed our society in ways that were really diff difficult to foresee uh, for example in the way they uh, started affecting our city design urban design of course also how it made easier for people to get around and uh, ayahuasca and psychedelics and drugs in general uh, have a tendency in themselves already to change our societies in ways ways that are difficult uh, to anticipate. Also, one example that I thought about when you talked about cars was oil, because oil has had an enormous impact in our society, and no one could foresee any part, I think, uh, of it uh, in the time we... Uh, of course, we knew about oil for for I think millennia already. But but the at the start of the industrial revolution, when we really understood how fossil fuel fuels can be used for different kinds of purposes, the effect that it's had on our society has been Im enormous in in so many asp aspects, and it's difficult for us even to imagine like all all the things that that fossil fuels and oil, I think in particular, has had on our society. 
the the difference between uh, the invention of automobiles or the discovery of the many uses of oil is that we had no precedent nothing prepared us to any part of of those technological uh, or, or cultural uh, steps and uh, when it comes to psychedelics especially like plant based or or mushroom based psychedelics we have some uh something to draw from but still we are in a, in a many ways unforeseenly uh, globalized society where information moves very quickly we are in a world where the internet has connected us in in good and bad in ways that we couldn't anticipate and at this particular moment we cannot anticipate where it's taking us and so it's like also the uh the intense encounter with psychedelics that our society seems to be having right now combined with all the technological changes make it very diff difficult to see all all the changes that are going to happen and uh so it's obvious that we should uh tune our ears to learning from societies that have integrated psychedelics in their cultures and and being open to learning from them but it's also obvious that we cannot anticipate everything and this is uh, my lead up to a topic that you've covered a lot in your work and that's uh, one of the, your main focuses so the un unintended consequences that's that are going to come maybe after the psychedelic renaissance after the current hype cycle of of us being really uh exhilarated by the prospect of of everything that psychedelics seem to have to offer to us and you've said that the main challenges when it comes to mainstream in psychedelics are not political or cultural or or scientific uh, not politic political or or scientific but more like cultural so yeah i mean do talk talk about that yeah yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned the internet. I was, you know, I, I studied uh, computer science and, and, uh, and English literature. And then for many years, I worked as a network engineer, basically building networks. And this was in the early 90s. So I was a very sort of early citizen of the internet. And like most early citizens of the internet, we were incredibly excited about what this meant and what this could mean. Uh, because, you know, you one has to remember, you know, what it was like growing up in the 80s and 90s, where it was like, you know, you couldn't access certain books or certain films or certain music, and you had to go search far, and sometimes you had to go to another city just to be able to listen to this one song that you wanted to listen or even to see this one film that was impossible to see, you know, so the, the idea that people could, you know, talk to each other and share and have access to all of these wonderful things that were so hard to access. You know, this was this was it, it. It seemed miraculous, and only good things could come from it. As a matter of fact, you know, for many years, I, I uh, part of my work was sort of expanding the network through, you know, just sort of laying down infrastructure, fiber optic cables, and other cables. And and back then, I saw myself as a sort of uh, uh, um, um, sort of worker and a great sort of. Uh, uh, building something that was big and important, and uh, and that it needed to exist, and you know. So I've, I've been incredibly disappointed by what the internet has become, um, which was the last thing that we wanted or we expected. And sometimes this sort of taints uh, or, 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 you know, brings, paints nightmares when I think about what could go wrong with psychedelics if it goes as wrong as the internet went in many ways. Um, you know, we thought it was going to be a tool for, you know, to flatten structures and, 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 and liberate information. And instead it's becoming a tool for, you know, the, the biggest spy network ever built. And, uh, and, um, but so, um, I have a personal sort of fascination with this, this sort of this, the, 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 the theory of unintended consequences. Um, many of you know my favorite documentary filmmaker Adam Curtis, you know from the BBC, is basically obsessed with this. All of his documentaries are about great plans that went completely wrong, and and <laughs> he derives great pleasure. And the the plans of the left and the plans of the right. I mean, it's not you know every everybody's everybody's plans, but uh, 
but 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 in but in terms of you know just sort of for the audience to get you know for, as, as an example of the law of unintended consequences you know one story that often gets told is you know in colonial india when the british were still in india there was a problem at some point where there were too many cobras you know there's, there's poisonous snakes and then the colonial authorities uh, decided that perhaps if they put an incentive, like they paid people money for bringing the heads of cobras and killing them themselves, you know, then they could bring down the numbers of cobras that were around and people getting bitten. So that's what they did. There was a financial reward. They paid you some money for every head of a cobra that you brought. And uh, for a while, it seemed to work. People were bringing lots of heads of cobras and there seemed to be less cobras around. And then there was a point where just people kept bringing more and more and then lots of heads of cobras. And at some point they realized that actually some people have figured out that they could make more money by raising cobras themselves just to get them killed and chop their heads and bring them to the British. <laughs> so the actual the, the population of cobras had actually greatly increased, except you know, now they were in cages. You know, this is this is an example of the unintended consequences of policies. You know, policy often tries to, you know, come up with a solution to a very real problem. You know, policy in terms of governments making laws. And then this has all sorts of unintended consequences that they couldn't be foreseen. You know, when uh, the United States in an incredible, uh, uh, in an incredible uh, uh, gesture of cultural sort of exceptionalism, tried to ban alcohol, which hadn't been done in Western, I, I believe, I don't know if it was, and maybe it was Finland or Norway. There's another country in the north of Europe that also tried to ban alcohol. For yeah, a while. Finland. Finland was. Finland. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can tell me if it had the same consequences or not. I mean, in, in the United States, you know, there were these sort of like basically the arguments were, you know, sort of clear. It's like you know, alcohol. You know, alcoholism creates all of these social problems. People, you know, they, 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 they you know, there's there's violence at home. There's people, you know, not going to work. There's you know the toxicity and the early deaths of all of it. You know, the, the long list of of problems that alcohol was creating creates. You know, it's easy. It's 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 clear for all of us to see. So then they said, well, if cre alcohol creates all of these problems, let's forbid alcohol and we will we will do away with these problems. You know. Of course, the unintended consequences was that, you know, people would not stop drinking just because it was forbidden. Now there was a new class of criminals arise because they could sell uh, what was formerly forbidden. And then it went from basically alcohol pr was produced in a bunch of like small sort of operations to a very centralized thing that was producing, you know, not low grade alcohol because it wasn't worth it to move it. It, took, it was too bulky, but, you know, high octane alcohol, sometimes even powered, sometimes it was toxic and people were getting, and not only that, you, it actually fostered the creation of these enormously powerful mafias that were not only corrupting the local government and the, and the, and the, and the police and the services and, and plus the corruption that came from having large parts of society who were formerly not breaking the law decided to start breaking the laws because they wanted to keep drinking. Thinking. But also, you know, then this, because there was so much money involved, the mafias began to fight each other and war each other for territory, and this created, you know, terrible violence and problems, etc., etc., right? So, so, you know, these are just two examples of, of the law of unintended consequences. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here because I'm curious what happened in Finland. How, how long did it last, the alcohol prohibition? And did you get mafias as well, or what happened? Well, I, I I I don't know if I can like talk to the details, but I think it was a similar similar trajectory. Tra trajectory. So basically, we had uh, people starting smuggling uh, the more high volume is volume the right word like mm -hmm. high more higher al alcohol percentage mm -hmm. uh, drinks because they are easier to smuggle and. Uh, Quite quickly, we realized that it uh, it had a lot of unintended consequences, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think it's it's a similar path. Uh, they pull back. So, you know, uh, um, so in, in in terms of psychedelics, now we're living what is called the psychedelic renaissance, which is basically the medicalization of psychedelics. I am. I think it's 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 very important. Uh, I'm I'm very happy that people that you know that could benefit from the you know from the from the powerful effects of these substances and plants will have legal access to them, you know, in medical contexts, you know, especially people that have you know uh, complex uh, you know and difficult conditions such as you know post traumatic you know treatment resistant you know post traumatic stress disorder treatment resistant depression you know these are these are these are uh, these are conditions for which our modern psychiatry didn't have very good solutions 
and this is and this and and they psychedelics can be very promising on that. So I'm not I'm not critical uh, per se of 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 the uh, of the um, of the psychedelic renaissance, but I do try to think about a what is being left out, what would be automatically left out. For example, you know if psychedelics become medicines that our doctors prescribe, then people who are not who do not have a medical diagnosis will not have access to this. The issue with psychedelics is that they're not like anti-inflammatories or antibiotics. Antibiotics are for people who have, you know, an infection. And then people who don't have an infection don't have any need to take antibiotics. They're counterproductive. But psychedelics are not just substances for people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, even though they can help people with post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Most of the people taking psychedelics today, they don't, they don't, they don't have a medical diagnosis uh, and they will never have it. But they still greatly benefit from these substances. So they, this, we're not talking about a medicine that is like antibiotic, you know, very targeted uh, for one condition, but it's actually they're much broader. And like we've seen, people use them as sacraments, people use them to pray, people use them as you know therapeutic tools, but people use also use them as sort of sort of like social cohesion tools. So this is not you know, by fitting psychedelics in the box of, you know, pharmaceutical drugs, we are trying to fit sort of a very complex object into a very narrow box. And then the tendency is that as we try to push to fit it, we amputate other important parts of it. Similarly to, you know, when yoga became sports and the sort of a spiritual aspects of it got, got lost. Um, so, so what we have is practices that are much more complex, and then they, they tend to be sort of be fit in things that don't that don't that don't fit. Um, and then I also wonder what the unintended consequences of it will be. You know, if we think about what what can go wrong that we are not thinking about, what would be what are what are the unintended consequences of the psychedelic renaissance as we know it, you know. And you know, some of the things we're seeing now is, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, as the first wave of startups, uh, psychedelic uh, medicine startups begin to run out of money because, you know, because it costs about a billion dollars to turn a, 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 a promising drug into a legal medicine. And this billion includes all the other sort of parallel things, molecules that you try that you have to drop along the way because you realize they're not working. As, and as these, as, as, as these startups begin to run money, they began to run out of money and they begin to sort of merge and buy one another. And the first generation of people that were investing in these things begin to get pushed out by, you know, more mature players that were merely waiting for the early adopters to make all the mistakes. And as sort of, you know, uh, pockets and, you know, and, 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 and groups of patents that have already been made around certain molecules and certain practices begin to also get bought in this game of centralization, which is how... You know, it goes how our sort of competitive business practices end up happening. You know, it always, you know, when we when the internet started, there was many, many internet service providers. And then, you know, I don't think there's many small internet service providers left. There's very, very few because everything got centralized and got eaten up by bigger guys who, when the small ones were coming up, were not interested in this business because it looked too small. So as all of these things move, you know, what is being what is being left out where, you know, I just mentioned one thing, you know, one is, you know, non-medical uses of psychedelics, which I, I personally believe might be the most interesting. I think we are giving, uh, I, I think giving psychedelics to people with, you know, very strong um, uh, sort of mental health conditions, it's sort of playing with fire because these are very delicate cases and they go in all sorts of directions. You know, some people get lots of help. Some people have very, very difficult time. Some people get re-traumatized. You know, this is not normally, you don't give strong doses of strong psychedelics to people who have very strong mental health problems in indigenous communities. Quite the opposite. You give them very little or none. You actually give strong doses to people that have the, 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 the mental health and the capacity to handle the experience because you want people to be able to benefit from it. So, you know, this is, this is one question. So one thing that is getting left out is, you know, everybody else uh, that might benefit from psychedelics and they don't have a medical diagnosis. And then another thing that is getting left out, as we already spoke, is, you know, 
indigenous knowledge careers and you know and 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 most if not all of the knowledge and the practice that comes from them at the same time it could be very well that this is sort of a necessary stage and that the only way to sort of mainstream or to get mainstream acceptance for these substances is to go the way of science and medicine and doctors which you know we greatly respect in our culture and and uh, much more than you know in interesting uh, 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 interesting countercultural types uh, such as ourselves. Um, so it, it 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 might it might be that this is that this is the that this is the way. What I'm what I'm what I'm concerned is about you know what could happen, uh, and the fact that opening this door, opening the door for psychedelic medicines, doesn't close the door for all the other aspects of psychedelics that are just as important. You know the spiritual aspects, the non medical aspects, the personal growth aspects, the existential aspects. You know and you know everything having to do with traditions and indigenous use. Right? I think I think it would be fantastic if one day you know doctors can prescribe you know psilocybin or a form of psilocybin for people with depression. I think it would be a sad thing if that happens, and then at the same time, indigenous people who've been working with mushrooms for you know hundreds of thousands of years would still be put into jail for handling substances, you know, medical. Uh, substances without a license, without a medical license, because in our society there's also penalties for people that practice medicine without being considered doctors. You know, me, by this I mean by having medical degree. So you know, this is this is uh, this is this is this is this is this is one part of the you know or or or, or a couple of aspects of the unintended consequences. The way and there's. There's, 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 there's many, many others, but I mean the, 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 the way that I try to think about it, because uh, you know a, 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 an important part of my work uh, on ICS has to do with sort of um, um, foresight, you know, which is you know how do you think about possible futures, and you know, and how you model possible ways that things could go, and how you how we choose one that is you know, most optimal or that one that we would like to see and we pursue that one. So I've been starting to think, thanks to, you know, a suggestion that our uh, um, scientific director, Jose Carlos Pozo said, he said, you know, after the uh, psychedelic uh, renaissance comes the psychedelic enlightenment. And that's because historically after the renaissance, what came was the enlightenment. Uh, that's, that was the period that followed the renaissance. So, so... I've been thinking lately about what the psychedelic enlightenment could be, or what, or what I would like the psychedelic enlightenment to be, uh, because I think it's important to have these models. You cannot, you cannot let this. This cannot be led up to circumstances, and at the same time, it is, it is, it is us. It is the people that are directly engaged with the plants that carry the responsibility to present the model of how we like these plants to be integrated in our, to our societies. I don't believe the government is going to do a better job than the people who directly works, work with the plants in terms of suggesting how this should happen. Um, and this is, so I take, you know, a lot of inspiration from basically other groups that have nothing to do with psychedelics, but were in a similar situation. By a similar situation is that groups that were part of a society and yet they were not being recognized by their society. They were sort of external or excluded. You know, this includes everything from civil rights to women's vote to, you know, these are, these are, this, it's a long history of collectives that were part of the society and yet the society did not recognize them as citizens having a right to be and exist uh, like everybody else. So, you know, when I think about a future in which ceremonial plant practices can be, can be, can happen legally and safely, I think of a collective of people doing a type of work and they are not recognized by the society they're either you know they're either ignored or in the worst cases persecuted and even jailed for, for for doing this for just being who they are and doing the work they do so when when i when i think of the psychedelic enlightenment i think of all the things that are being left out in the psychedelic renaissance so you know the psychedelic renaissance is medical uh, the psychedelic renaissance might be non-medical uses of psychedelic. The psychedelic uh, 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 renaissance is, is uh, uh, 
you know, compound base, and enlightenment might be plant base. The Renaissance is about individual therapeutic processes, and the uh, enlightenment might be collective. The uh, the uh, uh, Renaissance is about healing, you know, individual uh, uh, illness, you know, sort of personal self actualization, and the Renaissance might be about, you know, personal and collective self actualization, and it happens in groups. Um, the Renaissance is very much for profit. And I think it would be very interesting to look at non-profit models when thinking about the, light, the psychedelic enlightenment, among other things, because in terms of business models, it's not clear at all. It's not clear at all that uh, that we can make that we can make these substances, these practices, even psychedelic assisted therapy, make it affordable to a large part of the society the way the way it's being presented as it is. You know, it, it's extremely expensive to have one or two therapists sit for a person for uh, for two for four to six or eight hours. Uh, you know, while they undergo one of, you know, possibly several psychedelic experiences, you know, plus the, you know, it's incredibly costly the way in our, the way it is set up in our society. On the other hand, when you look at, you know, you know, fall killing in the Amazon, you know, people drink, not they don't drink individually, but they drink in groups and the payment of the, of the of the shaman of the folk healer who spends all night with them it's also a very long and very specialized person but it's shared by the group and then that makes it affordable for the group and profitable for the for the for the facilitator so the um so this is this is sort of how the pieces fall into place and and the and and the sort of the the, the the current state of my thinking. We are this is not of course just my thinking, but the group of people that I collaborate with and many other people. And what we're trying to do is we're slowly trying to derive a series of models of what this could look like 15, 20 years into the future. Really what this would look like. Because this brings many, many, many questions. So by this I mean is again the integration of ceremonial plant work. It's a very specific thing outside of the countries of origin. So let's imagine that this can be practiced legally and safely 15, 20 years into the future. These people who are doing ceremonial plant work, the sort of shamans or neo-shamans of the near future, who is going to certify them? Do they need a certification? Uh, how are we going to do with, uh, you know, when there's problems? What are, how are we going to deal with cases of abuse? What type of certification would be needed? It's even a good idea to have a certification and who's going to be that body that is going to decide who can or who cannot work, right? So um, these, which are all very interesting questions, and we sort of work slowly into the work that we're doing to generate this model. Eventually, this model will become not just a model or a description, but ideally a series of narratives. We want to make it visible. I think people have to see it. And that's not a description, but it's a story. And it's how we're going to be able to sort of generate a number of stories that people can already imagine what this future looks like. Not romanticized stories, you know, realistic, you know, with difficulties and with problems and with things not going perfect, but good enough to set up a sort of reference point, a sort of a lighthouse that people can, you know, sort of point to in the future uh, uh, when when they think about the future, and that it can that they can pr uh, become and thus come down to the level of very concrete sort of policy proposals. So then, there's a number of things that need to change here. You know, part of it has to do with changes that would have to happen at the political policy level, at the pol at the administrative level, and this is what type of new laws and regulations would need to be passed in order to make this a possibility. But there's another set of things that need to happen, not at the political level, but at the level of the facilitators themselves. Right now, the sort of the, the, the community of people, ayahuasca ceremonial plant practitioners is very heterogeneous and it's sort of a wild west. There's a number of people that are doing incredibly good work. There's also a number of people doing quite irresponsible because sort of anybody can join the sort of the, the, the the, the level of, you know, any, any, any today, just about anybody who decides to do so can, you know, find themselves a source of ayahuasca and, 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 and claim to be a shaman and begin to offer ceremonies. So there's also work that needs to happen at the basis. 
in terms of how the collective of people working with plants sort of raise their game, agree on minimum safety standards, organize themselves and self-regulate to the point where they can begin to become valid interlocutors who are able to sit down and negotiate their future with the authorities. This has also been the case for all these other co excluded collectives as well. And then another, another part of the work has to do with the, that's the part of the work that builds the future, that future. And then another part of the work has to do with how we avoid certain accidents and certain things that could derail the whole thing. You know, one has to do with, for example, with media panics, and it has to do with how do we make sure that there are sources of information that can validate all of these terrible stories that will come because it's already happened before somebody, will, journalists will say it's already happening, you know, there's a touch case, for example, of a, of, a, of a young man who killed himself and he was on the new, all the newspapers that, this, that he killed himself because he drank ayahuasca. And then it turned out that as you look into it deeper, he had mental health problems. It was not clear that he had ever drunk ayahuasca. And if he had, it was many, many years before the suicide when he went to a trip uh, to the um, to the to to the Amazon jungle and he was consuming also other substances. But this doesn't make for an interesting a media story, so the story gets put like that. So, you know, there's also a need for sort of media piece in all of these, of how these narratives get spread and how misinformation gets counteracted. And there, there's also a need for a sort of emergency service that can deal with the with the with 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 the with the rare but real chance that people will take these substances and end up worse than they were before they took them. This also happens. It is not it is not rare. That is why most people keep drinking ayahuasca. You know, if it was very toxic or very bad, you know, people would have stopped doing it long ago. Most people, for most people, it is a positive experience, but not for everybody. And it's important that as a collective, we develop the ways to deal with this and to care for these people. And that this is part of the, this is part of the conversation that we have with the authorities, which is that we can take care of our own uh, accidents. And then. Um, and then the last piece is a, is a sort of um, it's a sort of educational piece that has to do with how we communicate and spread these best practices, these surfers that are not learning from each other. You know how we break this sort of isolation of these different groups, and we begin to present sort of a collective body of best practices or better practices around safety uh, in the work with ayahuasca. Now, what I describe basically is all the pieces of the project that I run at the ICERS Foundation. It's called the, um, it's a, it's a, it, will, it will launch publicly sometime this year, even though uh, it's been working sort of behind the scenes now for more than five years. Um, it's called the Ethnobotanical Futures Incubator. So it is about the incubation, so small projects that you incubate around the future of ceremonial plants. Uh, outside of the countries of origin. So, you know, the what I said about, you know, the education part that's beginning to come out. We had a course this year. This year we're going to have three courses, uh, one on safety uh, sa safe safety in ceremonial plant work is for, for facilitators and one on integration, which is for care professionals. And uh, in terms of taking care of, you know, what I said about taking care of, you know, when things go wrong, we have a support center that has been relaunched in ICERS so where we give, you know, free integration and we answer medical questions. And, and again, it's a small group of people. It's a small, it's just a few people, many volunteers. But the, what's important is that we are learning a lot and that our intention, because we're an NGO, not a business, is not to take over the market, but actually to create a model that other people can learn from and then they can start their own. We don't want to be the, the integration center. We want many integration centers to be all over the world. And But what we're trying to do is to, to build the, the how-to. Um, and then, you know, for the part about, you know, narratives and sort of investigative journalism, we're looked, we're soon publishing a report where we looked very, very carefully at every death attributed to ayahuasca in worldwide media and scientific publications ever. Uh, it's about, it's less than 60. <clears throat> and we tried to do something even more difficult, which is try to estimate how many people worldwide drink ayahuasca and how many people had drunk it in 2019 before the pandemic. 
That's because you cannot, if you don't have a size, an idea of the size of the population, um, all numbers related to uh, negative effects uh, stand blind, you know. So, so you know, you, you know, six, 60 deaths are obviously 60 deaths too many and it's terrible. But what our numbers show is that there's about, you know, 5 million people worldwide who have drunk ayahuasca. No, or I give you, or, or 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 in the Netherlands, for example, where there's been six deaths related to ayahuasca, not a single one. I have to stress this: not a single one of them is actually being caused by ayahuasca, uh, in terms of ayahuasca toxicity. Um, but it's sixty thousand people we estimate in the Netherlands that have drunk that have drunk ayahuasca at some time in their life. So it's only when these two numbers are together where things begin to make sense. And these are the type of narratives that we need to build in order to create evidence. Um, And then, and then, you know, there's the part again with sort of like, you know, working, trying to break the silos of information and trying to make sure that the sort of our own practices around, you know, ayahuasca ceremonial plant work can be somehow sped up in terms of safety, like, like the example of the surfers, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, uh, 15 or 20 years from now, the way we will be serving and drinking ayahuasca outside of, outside of the Amazon will be much, much better than they are today. And this is, this is not, this is not a given unless we can make sure that the collective can learn from one another and they can trade in, and they can trade this and that this information can flow. No, so because this happens very fast once you have this. You know, I always give the example. It's probably not, but you know, latte art. You know, these people that make drawings in your coffee uh, with the foam. You know, this started in the 80s with two baristas that were just drawing very simple flowers, you know, and now, you know, people can draw the Mona Lisa in, 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 your, in your damn coffee cup, right? So, but this is because it wasn't the two of them, but it was hundreds of people worldwide collaborating, learning tricks, figuring things out, and then very, very quickly it evolved. So then it is the nature of our societies. It is absolutely possible to, you know, maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of these very powerful plants. But you need, you need, you need people, you need communication, you need knowledge, you need knowledge to flow. It needs to pollinate each other. And that's, and that's, you know, also part of the, of the work we do through workshops and through information and, 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 you know, and through the, and through what we learn in the support center, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is the part that has to do with, the vision that, okay, but where are we going? Where would we like to go? What would this look like? Right. And this is the part of the psychedelic enlightenment, right? Which is just the word, it's an idea, it's a it's a it's a vision, and it's not very fleshed out yet. It's something very, you know, it's recent, it's a work in progress. Um, but it's a necessity. It's a necessity in the in the terms of like we cannot, you can you need you need the uh, you need the vision um, of where you're going, or especially where you want to go, um, in order in order to make things. So you know, I I take uh, you know we use a quote from Alan Kai, which is a sort of he was a sort of software and interface designer, and sort of brilliant guy. I like him very much, and and he said the best the best way to predict the future is to invent it, and that's sort of the sort of the, the underlying attempt uh, on this again you know not as a this is this is not we're not trying to you know the, the, this is not like Steve Jobs, you know, that has a great vision for a certain computer and then he builds a great company so he can build exactly the products that he wants. This is a, a lot closer to being like a midwife, right? There's a process that is happening and you want it to come to the best, you know, so that I'll, the, the, the work what we do, we're not leading processes of, you know, uh, self-regulation. We are accompanying them, we're fostering them, we try to seed them, but this is not, we don't have the, the 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 capacity or the ambition to lead these processes. What we're trying to do is to accompany them and to help them come to fruition. Um, and this is because I think if we lose this, 
if we lose among all the among all the sort of variety of things that are coming and the decriminalization of cannabis and probably the decriminalization of psychedelics and recreational use of psychedelics and medical use of psychedelics and you know all of these things that are happening anyway and they will continue to happen you know um i believe you know and big festivals and trance music and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, i'm not at all denying the diversity of people and things engaged but i am very concerned or very interested in the future of one very particular subset of all of these, which is ceremonial plant work. It's not the whole, it's not, you know, sometimes people say, oh, that's like psychedelic ex exceptionalism, you know, people say, you know, like, you know, this, and this is sort of an accusation among sort of like drug policy people. It's like, oh, you're just thinking about psychedelics and I'm even worse, not even thinking about psychedelics, just ceremonial plant use in a very small subset. Um, and this is, um, what about everybody else and all these other problems, you know, and, and my answer is yes, but this is like, you know, say that I've had, you know, that my project was to, I don't know, save the silverback gorillas, you know, and that's where my work is. And you came and you told me, but what about the rhinos and what about the elephants and what about like, yes, absolutely. And the whales and just like, yeah, absolutely. You know, all of these things need to happen as well. But my personal work, the, the, the work that I'm doing, my focus and my, my 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 commitment uh, uh, my personal commitment is with this very particular thing because i find that there is an enormous richness there uh, that could be very very useful to all these other uh, diversity of, of of practices and uses so it could it could benefit all of them but it's also at the same time it's perhaps the part that is most likely to get steamrolled out of existence by medicalization or even by sort of like legalization that you know the idea that you know you turn this into the uh, into a product and you take away the practice you take away the ritual and you take away the role of the person who serves which i think this is also an incredibly important lesson that comes to us from the indigenous uh, from the indigenous groups is this role the person who is responsible for the night so that everybody else can relax and go deep. So, um, so in terms of how it can benefit, you know, everybody else, or sort of in terms of middle halfway steps, you know, I think, um, there is an uh, incredible potential for a collaboration between, between facilitators, people who are experienced facilitators of ayahuasca or other plant medicines, and, and the medical community, because they, have, they cover each other's uh, blind spots. You know, people that have done sort of traditional training in ayahuasca are not medical doctors. Uh, um, so they're perhaps not the best people to do screening uh, and perhaps not the best people to talk about, you know, drug interactions and whether or not you can quit taking, you know, your medicine through your medical treatment or whether there's interactions between your medical treatment and ayahuasca. And at the same time, people who run, you know, uh, ceremonies, you know, and might be, might be absolutely brilliant at it, you know, they're not psychologists and then they're not perhaps the, 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 the best people to do long follow-ups with you about your process and what it means and how things are going to change. And at the same time, the people that are great at doing screening and, and great at doing, you know, uh, uh, follow-up, you know, are psychologists and psychiatrists, et cetera, medical professionals, they're not necessarily the best people to sort of handle the night and, you know, and what happens during the experience. So they actually, both collectives need each other and they could really benefit not just them, but especially, especially the participants. They could really benefit from having this collaboration. So, and it, it's sort of necessary. It might be that in the future, there is people that have all of these skills at the same time. There will be people who are good at screening and they know all the medical stuff and they're good at running the ceremony and they're actually good at doing integration. But this is not, I think those people will be few and far between. There are actually three very different skill sets that are necessary here in our societies. Now, in indigenous societies, because the community is a lot closer, you know, many of these things are not necessary. You don't need to do screening because you already know who's coming and what they have. And you might not need to do integration in a sort of organized, structured manner because, again, people are around in the community, you see them every day, and if there's problems or things to talk about, this all happens informally. 
But in our societies where, you know, a group of strangers will get together in a house in the countryside to drink ayahuasca for the weekend, and then they will all go back to their houses, you know, which are, you know, spread and geographically far apart, then this context actually demands, you know, additional sort of safety and practices that are not necessary because of the, because it's a different context in the indigenous context. So it's, it's how these pieces, you know, can come together, you know, and it's in the coming together of these pieces, you know, that I like to imagine the, uh, the psychedelic enlightenment. Mm. I'm thinking about different kinds of potentially risky activities that people partake in, for example, scuba diving or mountain climbing or playing hockey or, or drinking cars. alcohol or anything like that. Yeah, driving cars. Driving cars, fire. Yeah, thinking about those activities and, uh, of course, one main difference between those and uh, and psychedelics uh, in general or ayahuasca in particular is that in Western societies they're mostly forbidden. And uh, I've been thinking about the perspective of thing of people who believe that prohibition is the the best option that we have and uh it looks like those people are mostly unaware that that such thing such a thing even exists as uh that uh, that people who use drugs or psychoactive substances illegally uh actually form some sort of like community based or community-based uh, best practices and harm reduction and stuff like that. So I, I think that many people who are supporting prohibition think that if prohibition is taken away, there will be nothing to uh, guide people towards making the right decisions. Of course, for many of those people, uh, many of those people taking drugs in any situation uh, is always the wrong decision <laughs> to make. Mm -hmm. But But even if they can imagine that there can be beneficial contexts of doing that. Uh, I think they're pretty much aware, uh, unaware that such conversations are even going on uh, in, in the subcultures that are currently using psychedelics. And it's really difficult to convey that that these things have been thought about uh, because, yeah, when it comes to, for example, mountain climbing or playing ice hockey or or any kinds of sports, People at least know that that all kinds of sports have benefits, but but many people are completely unaware that any any sort of drug taking uh, could have any form of benefit, perhaps other than the acute uh, pleasurable effects. I think many people, mm -hmm. most people, are aware that those exist exist, but it's difficult for many people, I think, to think about. Uh, even even the concept of long term benefits of taking psychoactive substances, uh, it's hard for people to think about the possibility of having experiences that maybe you had years ago in your life that are still having positive effects in your life. Yeah, um, Rick Rick Doblin has you know thought a, a, a lot about this, and he says he believes that it will take about seven to ten years from the point where, you know, psychedelics medicines can be legally um, um, applied to the point where most everybody would have, will know somebody or will, not most everybody, but many people will know, will know somebody close by who actually benefited from them. And that's the point where it shifts, right? That's, that's why the, that's why the second psychedelic renaissance is important, right? Because it's, a, it's, it will take a number of years but eventually, this story, my father's friend, my the friend of my father, uncle, whatever, you know, they were really depressed for many years. And then they went and they did this, you know, I don't know, ketamine, psilocybin, blah, 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 fill in the blank. And they're much better now. And it's a point where that happens, you know, that that the society begins to sort of normalize this. This is, this is, um, this is, um, 
But again, you know, what's happening in the United States and the speed at which it's happening, it's absolutely amazing. Not, not just, you know, how many, you know, psychedelic research centers there are in how many universities and very respected universities of the U.S., but, you know, the whole decriminalization movement where, you know, all of these, you know, plant medicines are getting decriminalized in, you know, cities and then full states and then more cities. So I think, and this is funny because, you know, the states for many years was sort of like the most conservative uh, 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 country around all of this and now they're sort of the most open and, and they're sort of leading, leading the way so you know this, this, this changes this is sort of this is also in a way organic uh, uh, it, 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 it happens it happens by itself but already you know I can tell you that you know 20 years ago when I started you know drinking ayahuasca and I would tell people ayahuasca and people said what? You know, nobody had ever heard of it you know that's not the case anymore so that's how it, it's been 20 years. That's how, that's how, that's how these things move. I, I think that that part, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about. I worry about panic uh, uh, and sort of unintended consequences again. I worry about people who take for good reasons and for whatever reason it doesn't work for them and how this could affect uh, you know, general perception, you know, I worry about the accidents and I worry, and because this is what we saw again and again, this is what happened with MDMA. It was supposed to be a promising tool for psychotherapists, you know, and then it became very popular in college campuses. And then it felt like too many people were, and then a number of sort of exaggerated reports about like ill effects came in the media. You know, LSD was, you know, sort of, you know, legal and it was in the hands of, you know, doctors and there was a, a, a huge amount of research that happened all over the world in psychiatry departments all over the world. Um, and then there was a sort of this sort of moral panic, the hippies started taking it and there was all of these, you know, false or exaggerated reports about LSD making people jump out of windows because they thought they could fly or, or you know, and then there was too many of these and then and then there was a movement to try to ban it. And this is the same thing that happened with MDMA. So you know what 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 worries me is sort of um, too many too many accidents, too many um, yeah, and 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 um, unintended consequences, um, basically creating a sort of moral panic or societal panic. And that's because for the same reason that is very new, you know, if today, you know, some, you know, less, less, uh, less efficient driver gets in a Lamborghini, you know, and proceeds to have a terrible accident because they're driving too fast. Nobody's going to say, what's the problem with Lamborghinis? Everybody's going to say, what is this guy doing Lamborghini who doesn't know how to handle, you know, a supercar? This is not going to be the case with ayahuasca and it's not going to be the case with ayahuasca for quite some time. So that now everything that happens that can be related to ayahuasca as opposed to, you know, poor practices around it will do, will do so. And that's what we saw in our research and you know, all the deaths associated with ayahuasca, where people will commit suicide months or years after drinking ayahuasca and still be blamed on ayahuasca and popular media. Now this is this is this is this is not to say that there's no risks or, or dangers to these. Of course they are. These are very powerful substances, and very powerful substances have very powerful effects that can go towards very positive or towards you know very negative. You know, but the same as a knife can be used to you know cut a fire, you know, to cut and make a meal or to kill somebody, or fire can be used to keep us warm or to burn a house. You know, we are as a culture you know, as a society, as human beings, quite good at sort of, you know, handling powerful tools. Uh, but it takes, it takes experience and it takes knowledge, you know, and, and, and to, to get back to your earlier point about the people who don't know and, you know, can't imagine what this is, in a way, I think it's positive that this thing will happen slowly because it, it, it but because this is really quite big change and and we need to move slowly in our society and we need to slowly build capacity you know we cannot go from one to the next you know there's not even you know even considering all of the you know sort of skilled facilitators that we have and the unskilled ones that we have they're not enough to sort of serve and 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 give service to all the people that could be interested in this 
So uh, necessarily, you know, it's good that it moves slow and then it grows slow. You know, one of the problems that Maps is having is that they cannot, they already made the numbers, you know, and they cannot train enough future MDMA th therapists to, to, to do M MDMA assisted psychotherapy in time for the, for the FDA, from, from when the FDA approves this. You know, and this is and this is just this is doing uh, trying to do a scale, making the every new student a trainer of other students using online systems. You cannot, and this is just on the size of the United States, and this is just for uh, treatment resistant post traumatic stress disorder, which is not you know it's a, it's not a, a huge, it's not like depression, it's not huge, and still they cannot make it on time, right? So this is also you know I think important. You know it can go. You know, and I, I, I think it's it's not negative that this moves slow. And cultural cultural shifts should happen, and 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 necessarily happen slow. I'm afraid this could be one of the unintended consequences that because of business needs, there will be an attempt to scale this too quickly, and the result will be a diluting of the of the of the practices and the experience of the practitioners, and then this will increase the accidents. Hmm. Yeah, there's al already been quite a bit of discussion, for example, when it comes to ketamine clinics in, clinics in the United States, being uh, that they offer uh, ketamine sessions with too much of a focus in the profit side, and basically they just like uh, pump in the ketamine and uh, let the person yeah. go to a trip and afterwards tell them good luck and bye bye. Yeah, and ketamine at home, and you know, and they will just send it to you and all of these things exactly. And again, you know, this, this in, in, in here, not, not in the case of ketamine, but generally speaking, this is something that is very interesting about, you know, uh, ceremonial plant facilitators is that they're actually able to work with groups. So, you know, so you can get 20 people, you know, at the same time or even more if you have enough facilitators. And this is something that is sort of, you know, still inconceivable, you know, the way the psychedelic renaissance is going is about individual treatments. And of course, this is very, very intensive. Uh, in, ter in terms of uh, in terms of labor and costs. Mm. What do you think? Because you were referring to moral panics. What do you think are wise ways of handling or responding to moral panics? It's a good question. You know, I, I never uh, thought about. It. I mean, you know, obviously you you need to counteract with. Uh, with uh, with with uh, with solid evidence-based information, but we know that in the times in these sort of post-truth times that we live, that's that's not the most important. You know, it's it's not it's not the most important uh, answer. You know, we 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 had solid scientific-based information, and large parts of the population have you know you know willingly or have chosen to ignore it. So you know that's that's not that's not uh, that's not it. I would say, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that moral panics happen when things are moving too fast. Or there is a feeling that things are moving too fast, you know. And then it's one of these cases, like, you know, like people have a feeling that the car is driving too fast and then they slam on the brakes and then they cause an accident. So, again, you know, my... You know my my personal preference. If I if I could have it my way, you know, I, I would I would I would tend towards sort of like organic uh, growth, which is going you know quite fast as it is. You know, at least for ceremonial plant work, I'm bringing all sorts of other uh, uh, sort of challenges already. You know, in, in instead of like thinking about you know how far can we how fast can we mainstream this or scale this, which you know they're they're very hard. Question. I mean, the the answer for both is not very. You know, you cannot. You know, I don't, I don't know if it can be mainstream any faster than it is, and it's certainly going to be very tricky to scale this. Yeah, because one of the major challenges when it comes to scaling is how to have enough people who have enough understanding that they can support the wiser handling yeah. of the thing that's been mainstreamed. Yeah, because this is because this is really a whole new skill set. You know, psychedelics present to us with an entirely different paradigm than what our medical doctors are used to doing. So our psychiatrists are basically trained to reduce symptoms, 
this is their training. You know, a person will come to them with anxiety, with depression, with bipolar, with man, man, you know, manic mania, mania, you know, and the, the, the training and the, and, the, and the instinct of the psychiatrist is what can I give you to tamper those symptoms and bring those, those, those manifestations down. So those are the type of drugs that they're used to uh, working with, antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti, you know. But psychedelics are not that. Psychedelics, in a way, very often what they are, they're magnifiers of the symptoms, temporary magnifiers of the symptoms. You know, so they, they tend to exaggerate, you know, whatever is it that is inside of people. Also, whatever it is that is outside of them, but, you know, that's why you take people away and you put them in a safe place so the outside remains calm where they can go inside and they can and they can feel safe where everything inside them becomes you know greatly magnified so how to you know and then people that traditionally work with plants well of course they try to you know keep a balance and they don't let people get you know too far into certain states they also understand that part of the healing that is happening is happening because the person is actually undergoing that exaggeration so that their fear turns higher or their sadness turns higher or you know or their anxiety or whatever it was things that were long bottled inside are now clearly being experienced and manifested so that the person can work through them now these our psychiatrists very often would have to in working with these substances they will have to resist the temptation to give the person an antidote that will make the trip stop but they only should resist that temptation if they have the tools to actually accompany the person while the effects and they get them through to the other side, right? If they don't have the tools to do this, then maybe an antidote is the best answer. Now, the tools to do this are a whole set of tools that our current psychiatrists don't have or psychologists. Like I said, perhaps psychiatric nurses, you know, are the people from our sort of medical state, medical sort of system that are, that are closest to sort of people who can comfortably sit with people who are having, you know, a strong sort of subjective experiences. But even that is a long, long way from what, you know, what, you know, you know indigenous, of course, indigenous healers, but also, you know, people traditionally or people that have a long history of working with this have. One, um, I think, major step forward um, towards the wiser handling of of ayahuasca is that uh, your organization ICERS was commis commissioned by the Catalonian government to to write the document towards better ayahuasca practices. Um, so it would be very interesting to talk about that. Here you talk about that a bit. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a lot of pod, you you see, there's just about everything about that document was very very thought out you you said the name towards better ayahuasca practices so it wasn't called best ayahuasca practices right that was the that was the first thing you know there's a lot of conversation around best practices and we started thinking of best practices until we realized there's really you know the best practices around ceremonial plant work cannot be put into a document uh, uh, um, because because they're not something that you can learn from a document so that's why we went towards better and not best. And because we also didn't want to give the impression that what this document presented was uh, um, that one ha just had to follow this document and they would already be doing, you know, good work. That's not, that's not what the document is. And also not what we push for. You know, what we push for is minimum safety standards. Because the best work that is done in ayahuasca doesn't fit into a guide, into a book, into a course, into a conversation or into anything. It's something that takes years. It's like trying to learn to be a great dancer with some guide or some books or a great musician. No, this is something that is done. This is a growth that happens personally in the relationship, in the, in the, in the, in the practitioner's own personal evolution and their evolution with the plant. So having said that, there is, however, very interesting work that needs to be done around what are the minimum safety standards that we can all agree on. You know, so, you know, sometimes when I have, you know, meetings with facilitators and, you know, traditional facilitators and different, you know, the sort of rabbit hole discussions open up, like, for example, 
you know, should women under moon time be allowed to drink ayahuasca? And then, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, depending on one and the other, an agreement, disagreement, and this very quickly gets into a heated discussion. And I always stop it and say, look, I'll be very happy. We'll, we will never agree on this. So it's impossible, forget it. There's no way that we can agree on this. But I'll be very happy if we can all agree that if someone gives ayahuasca to somebody else, they should not go to sleep in another room until that person or that group of people have, are completely you know, out of the experience. That's a minimum safety standard. And so it's not about the highest aspects of the work, the energetic, the spiritual, the songs, the cultural aspects, which are actually the most important. But there are beyond our authority, my authority as I see us as to even be put on the table. That is for the facilitators. It's about the minimum safety standards because that's also in conversations with the government and the authorities, that's what you need to present. That's what they want to hear about. You know, you find when you talk sometimes with you know the administration that their concerns are very, very different from those of ayahuasca facilitators. You know, ayahuasca facilitators are concerned about, you know, who was my teacher and what's the lineage and you know, what about the you know, things things like this and the energies of, you know, the, the energetic work and the songs and all of this. But sometimes government asks questions like, you know, but is the ayahuasca kept under lock while, uh, while uh, before and after the, the session? Right? This is, of course, completely stupid, right? This is a projection that comes from, pharma from ph pharmacies. Pharmacies keep very potent, very concentrated chemicals you know, so they have to be kept under lock because a child could come and eat 20 pills and die, or an adult, right? But nobody is going to drink a liter of ayahuasca by accident. It's impossible. You know? It's too talk, it's too nasty, it's too toxic. So, I mean, you can leave the bottle of ayahuasca anywhere. It's completely safe. You know, a child, a baby, you know, they will go bleh and bleh, right? It's, it's, you know, but... You know, the sort of thinking comes from that other stuff. That no, that, that these are these are powerful substances, and people could poison themselves without realizing that you know, in plant medicines come with their own search, uh, set of protections. You know, against abuse, which you know have to do with terrible taste. You know, and and with sort of bulkiness. You know, with the, the, the concentration is much lower. So plant medicines, you can basically, you know, eyeball. You know, it's, it's like wine. You can a little bit more or a little bit less and you can easily, people with no, you know, medical grade, you know, uh, balances or, you know, chemical analysis can, you know, sort of have a little bit of the ayahuasca, know if it's strong or not, know if they need a little bit more or a lot more and almost never overdo it, right? This is impossible with pharmaceutical purified compounds because sometimes the doses are so small you can't even see them. So you cannot eyeball them, you cannot test them first. So, you know... This is this is this is what I mean about minimal safe, safe, safety standards. You know, to get back to that, it has to do with the type of conversations that not only would enhance the security of of the of the of these practices, but also get get us a lot closer to beginning to have conversation with the authorities about about how these things could be regulated and what the things should be kept in mind. Um, so when we started working on this document um, uh, for the Catalonian Ministry of Health, you know, the first thing had to do with bed, you know, minimum safety standards versus best practices. The second thing had to do with, okay, what, what the hell is ICRS doing, you know, writing a guide about ceremonial plant work where none of us are ceremonial plant facilitators, you know, or indigenous people. So then the, 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 the second thing is, who doesn't need this guide? You know, and of course, you know, indigenous people don't need this guide. And, you know, the ayahuasca religions don't need this guide, don't need this guide. And, the, you know, all of the cultures and the, who have had the longest relationship, you know, with these plants, the last thing they need is this guide from these guys in Barcelona. You know, this is not for them, obviously. And, and, and no... You know, no, we're not, we're not, no, 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 no insult, uh, 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 right? It would be insulting, right, for us to actually show up with a guy like we made a guide of how to make, right? So that was that was that, that was the second thing is who this is not for. So this is this this was for ceremonial plant work happening outside traditional contexts, you know, and it was about minimum safety standards in the particular in the particularities of that context. 
and then and then the third thing was you know what can we what can we um, what can we what can we actually say you know and then in terms of that what we can say is basically just we could just paraphrase everything that we've been learning from you know from you know decades relationship with many many people you know I've personally spoken to because I was doing a documentary because I've been doing this for 20 years I don't work with ayahuasca myself but I have engage and interacted with so many people who work with ayahuasca from the very traditional context all the way to the very western context you know and out of these conversations plus you know all of the, our network of people and all and the, and the safety workshops that we've been running so out of what the, this work that we do of collecting these sort of insights that's what was poor you know not not what not what we knew but what we had learned from the collective so it was it was it was it was very much a sort of a, a compilation of com or compendium of better practices that we have learned from facilitators themselves by talking to so many of them throughout the years and by having the support center ICRs where we also see in how many you know we we get many cases and we see where things go wrong so all of all of all of that was put and then and then and then the third part was Okay, who who is this for? And then, well, it was both for people who facilitate and also for people who would want to participate, because you need both levels of information. You know, there's 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 been a lot of uh, sort of um, effort and concern about the the uh, aptitude or raising the aptitude of facilitators and making facilitators better, more responsible, more safe, blah, 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 more conscious. But not so much work about educating the demand. And the demand also needs to be educated. You know, people need to know what to expect when they drink ayahuasca. They need to know what is okay and what is not okay in terms of their relationship with the shaman. So, you know, a lot of the abuses that happen, happen because people don't know that this shouldn't happen you know of course the facilitator knows that they're doing something wrong but they don't care but the person the the participant very often doesn't know that this shouldn't happen right that you shouldn't have a romantic relationship with your with your therapist or your shaman or your neo shaman or that it's not okay to give you you know plans and then go to another room and forget about you and fall asleep so that's also why these things can happen so both things are necessary to both educate the offer and to educate the demand you know, in which, you know, in what, what are the sort of everybody's rights and responsibilities. Now, that, that idea eventually got worked out on, a, so that a lot of that content eventually migrated into a small work, a small um, workshop, and then a series of workshops that got longer for nine hours, one day, two days, eventually three day workshop. And now it's turned into a six month course that we do online that is called increasing safety of, Ay of, of ayahuasca plant work and that will launch uh, um, in March um, so yeah, I don't know when the podcast comes out but in March if you go to uh, um, um, icers.academy you'll be able to find our offering so that 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 turned into a course eventually um, that had all of these different pieces plus plus some extra ones um, and the guide uh, got translated to something like by different volunteers to something like 13 or 14 languages I can't remember anymore and I'm always surprised uh, what people come and tell me that they are using it it's a it's a it's a one it's a wonderful thing um, and then this idea of the of the um, of the uh, the the duties the duties and, uh, and and rights of both facilitators and um, and uh, and the participants got turned into sort of like an experimental document that we worked out because we were trying to uh, develop a um, consent informed consent a consent release that was sort of legally validated we work with lawyers and different things and um, what would be the document that people participate in would have to sign sort of like you do before you skydive or you do other sort of risky what would this consent document look like 
And you know, we we worked it just for escape for Spain. Like I say, we work small small cases, prototypes. We make small examples, and then we try to make it bigger. But we see we 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 were trying to see if we could make it work for Spain. We worked with lawyers, and we got a very complete document. That was kind of terrible. It was terrible because it was very legal. It was legally, it was very solid, but it was that the type of thing, you know, you know, those legal documents that make you sign that I understand that all of these bad things can happen to me, and you know, it's no one's fault except my own, and the and the part and the and the guy is completely I I absolve the guy of any responsibilities whatsoever to any harm that come my my you know this that, that's how these things go. You know, if you read any of these like release forms, you know, they're always terrible. And we thought, you know, okay, this do have something that is, you know, legally valid, but you know, perhaps it's not in in the spirit of of, of the plans. And could we make something that would complement this document because you need the local, the legal document that was more in the spirit of the plans, you know? So what what we made was a sort of like a like an like an honor pledge. It was it was a document that had a series of pledges, both for the guide and for the participant. That and we're still sort of playing with this. We're letting it go. We're but I'd, I'd be very happy if one day this turns into some sort of ritual in the sense that, I mean, a ritual is also a handshake. I'm not talking about, you know, something complicated with songs. But but basically what the what the pledge does, you know, what the, what the, what the, the guide, you know, the facilitator uh, 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 commits to a number of things, you know. They, they commit to fully inform the person. They commit, the, they commit to taking care of the person during the ceremony if the person asks for it. And this every word was carefully chosen. You know, not if the person, not just if the person needs it, but sometimes the person might not want it. So if the person asks for it, you know, they commit to, you know, continue to attend to the person later in the future if the person needs it. You know, they, com they commit to not take any, you know, economical, you know, emotional or sexual advantage of the person and to respect the boundaries of the, of the, of the relationship, you know, a number of things. And then the participant, and this is the less well-known side perhaps, commits to the following uh, things. First of all, they commit to being there because they want to, not because somebody has recommended it or because somebody has told them to come. This is very, very important because the main counter sort of in the action, in, in, in the main counter, um, you know, the, what's it called? Counter, um, counter indication of psychedelics, the main counterindication of psychedelics is not wanting to take psychedelics. Nobody who doesn't want to take psychedelics absolutely should take it. People should absolutely not take psychedelics if they don't want to, because that's hell, right? It's yeah, your comparison to kissing is very good with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a, yeah, we say it's like a kiss. You know, it's like if you if you want a kiss, a kiss might be the most wonderful, intimate, beautiful thing in the world. If you don't want it, it's disgusting, sloppy, you know, intrusive, and just blah. So it's it's very very important that people want to, and they we made them commit to this. Then the second thing is that they 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 say that they have said the truth, they have answered truthfully the questions in the medical questionnaire, and that's because most people who shouldn't take psychedelics because other counterindications, for example, a history of psychosis in the family, they will know that this is a counterindica a counterindication, and they want to take psychedelics anyway, so they will lie and they will say that this didn't happen, and that way they put themselves in danger and also the guides. So this is this is the the first of many times that for safety, the person is sort of brought to think about whether they have kept anything out of, out of, uh, out of the, the, the health questionnaire. And then the, the, um, what are the other ones? And then I think there were, uh, there was another one about leaving the session too soon so that the person commits not to leave the session because sometimes people want to escape and leave, and this turns into a very difficult situation. So they commit not to not not to leave the session until they ask for permission and receive permission to leave. And then the other one has to do with taking decisions in in uh, uh, sort of in the heat of the moment. So they, they commit not to make any life changing, not to take in any life changing steps until a, a precautionary, you know time has passed since the ceremony so no the next day after drinking ayahuasca you know getting a divorce or quitting your job or 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 or, or telling you know or making that phone call to that person that you haven't talked forever and you decided that you have to do 
you know, there's, there's, there's an exception to this, which is when people are breaking, you know, sort of abusive or dangerous relationships. You know, if ayahuasca tells you to quit drugs, you should quit the next day. But if ayahuasca tells you that, you know, that, that, that you need to get a divorce, then you should do this as carefully as and 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 uh, and and, as, and and thinking about it as much as that situation deserves, right? Um, and I can't remember, but but the idea, but the idea is that they would read these things to each other, they would read these things to each other, and they would they would sort of shake hands or do something, and now everybody knows where everybody stands and what the rights and what the duties are of everybody. This, this, again, is an example of something that is relatively simple and it will go a long way towards diffusing many of the, of the sort of most common uh, uh, problems that arrive you know, out, of, out of ceremonies. Yeah, this is like interesting in the sense that it's not like trying to prevent anything from happening but, or, or not focusing on preventing things from happening but more like focusing on encouraging reflection before people step into transformative experiences um actually because you mentioned like uh, people making important life decisions inspired by ayahuasca experiences and you've talked a bit about the sort of trope of ayahuasca told me maybe you can elaborate a bit on that and uh maybe also on the perspective of how ayahuasca can enhance everything you somewhere compared it to a microscope and if you look at the flea through a microscope it might look like a horrible monster but that's not like the uh, most sensible judgment to make about the flea perhaps yeah yeah this is actually in our safety course this is an entire lesson it's called ayahuasca told me that dot 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 um and it has to do with a series of common misinterpretations about what the experience is. So, you know, I would, I imagine most people listening to this are, are familiar with this, but um, when, peop when, when people drink ayahuasca, they often have the very powerful experience that they are being told something. This, of course, the way that sounds is just the voice of their thoughts. You're hearing yourself think. Um, we all hear ourselves think and we all have conversations with ourselves and tell each other, tell ourselves things. But when you drink ayahuasca, sometimes these things seem to come out of nowhere as if, that they, as if they were being planted. Now, very often what ayahuasca tells you is full of wisdom and carries very, very important details. So it's rare that ayahuasca tells you, ah, tomorrow morning you're going to put on pink socks, right? That's, 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 not, that's, not, that's not what it sounds like. It sounds like, do you remember that biology teacher that you had in fifth grade? This person was really important in your life. Do you realize that? That's sort of, that's an example. And of course, and that's a real example from somebody I know who drank ayahuasca. And this, of course, for this person became an incredibly powerful insight into his life and, and the reason why in you know 20 years later he was actually a, a biologist and working in biology so this is not this is not meaningless at all you know these are usually things that have a very strong uh, uh, emotional component to it so you also very often when people drink ayahuasca people will remember things you know I have to say you know you're also sitting in the dark all night thinking about stuff. So, you know, all sorts of things happen, pass through your head. It might be that if you didn't drink ayahuasca and you sat for six hours in the dark listening to beautiful songs and just thinking about stuff, many of these things will also come. But you never do this. So, you know, we, 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 we don't know. Um, but during ayahuasca, it certainly happens. You know, all sorts of memories seem to pop out seemingly out of nowhere. And they're usually, if not always, sort of charged with this sort of feeling of importance. And that's because they actually are important uh, and they're coming. So this is, this is, of course, this is the reason why people drink ayahuasca. And this is, among other things, what you're looking for. You're looking for coming out of the night with, a, with, a, with, a, with, with certain insights or information or memories or conclusions or thoughts, call it what you will, that you didn't have before 
you, you drank ayahuasca, or that were there, but they were you never actually realized how important this was. Sometimes this also takes the form of certain of regrets. You know, there's also this, you know, you will remember um, things that are that were also charged and you don't like to think about because there is regret involved. You will remember times that you hurt other people or that other people hurt you. Uh, you will remember things that you don't like to think about very often. But again, you will remember these things because they are important. And they were very important and they were even formative in your life. And they need to be looked at. So this is all part of the therapeutic, quote-unquote, effects of ayahuasca. And this is what people look for in ayahuasca. And this is why, why people drink ayahuasca, among other things. Now, sometimes these things that come out during the night, what ayahuasca tells you, take really surprising shapes. Like, you know, ayahuasca will tell you, you have to quit your job. Ayahuasca will tell you, you have to get a divorce. Ayahuasca will tell you, and it's not like you have to get a divorce like this, but I mean, it, it takes many shapes, but suddenly, you know, or I put it another way, the possibility of, the, of a divorce presents itself in the middle of a ceremony and you find yourself thinking about it all night and it comes as a very sort of strong thing. Or Ayahuasca tells you, you know, this business deal that you were doing is never going to work. Or Ayahuasca tells you, you know, somebody who's far away, your son, your daughter, who's now in vacation in the Netherlands, is actually in danger and you have to call this person as soon as possible. Or, you know, I mean, it takes, it takes, it takes many shapes, this Ayahuasca told me that. But because these things are always loaded with importance and because they are important, um, people, of course, can get very, it can be really, really disturbing and upsetting. You know, if there's a part of it that can be really beautiful about these insights and, and what you learn about what you realize. And there's a part of it that can be really disturbing about something that actually needs to change, not something that was, you know, so it's, it's, it's as it looks towards the future as opposed to the past. The, 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 the tricky part here is that it seems what we have learned from other people that have more experience than us and from, you know, and from talking to many facilitators is that actually these things, many things that Ayahuasca said or some certain things that Ayahuasca said have to be taken with a certain grain of salt. Grain of salt. You cannot take, them, take these things absolutely literally. They require more careful discernment in order to actually understand what the message is. Why? Because ayahuasca is not, the way ayahuasca works is not exactly like, you know, an outside person that sits with you and whispers in your ear. It works by incrementing or exaggerating things that are inside of you so you can see them. This is where the therapeutic part is. But they don't get presented as um, this is a part of you that you have to look at, but they get, pretense, they get presented that this is a vision of your future or even this is a, a, a task. No? The, Carl Jung, the, you know, the psychologist, he said that when material from, from the subconscious mind emerges into the conscious mind, it always emerges in the shape of a task or a mission. So that one has to be kind of careful with this or in order to get divorced, for example. So... You know, I don't think most of the times ayahuasca tells you to quit your job. What ayahuasca tells you without a doubt is that you hate your job. Or maybe even that you want to quit your job and you didn't realize it. Or you hadn't been thinking about it, but actually, good God, are you sick of this job? You know, you can't wait to quit it. That's very different from you must. But depending on how you talk to yourself, depending, you know, sort of what your superego, the shape of your superego and the way that you give yourself the missions and responsibilities and stuff, it might look like an order. But it's an order because that's how you talk to yourself. Not because, and that's another thing that is being shown to you there, but it's not being shown like, hey, notice that you talk to yourself like that. It's just your own voice, right? So, and then 
the dangerous part here is when people sort of relinquish their personal responsibility and put it on the plants, you know. The worst case scenario is somebody going uh, the next night after drinking ayahuasca to their partner and saying, we have to get to a, a divorce because ayahuasca told me that we have to get divorced. Right? It's like, you know, what the fuck? Like, you know, poor person. You know, can you imagine? It's like, you really need to put it in another context to understand how ridiculous that is. It's like, imagine showing up in your house and telling your partner, listen, we're going to get divorced because I met this guru on very important, you know, guru from India in, in, in a weekend workshop. And he told me that I had to get divorced. So we're getting divorced. You know, and what's, what's your wife going to say? It's like, well, who gives a shit what the guru, like what you're going to do, what your guru told you? You know, and you're getting divorced because because the, because someone else told you to do it. No, that, that's that's not how you get divorced. You don't get divorced because someone else told you to do it. You get divorced because you want to get divorced. You know, that's that's the absolute absolute must. I mean, for you know, don't, you would never do that, right? So why are you doing this? Because you took because you took this plant, right? So, and again, that doesn't mean that there's no value in this message. But there is a lot of value in this message. But then there's a, a degree of discernment, and sort of, you know, how you're going to go about it. That is, you know, what I would call, you know, the art of drinking ayahuasca is how you learn to work with these things and understand. And there's many ways to do this, and there's many questions that you can ask, and many ways to go about it. But you know, the the, the main one is, of course, not to make any rash decisions in the heat of the moment. You know, so ayahuasca told you to quit your job. Okay, we'll sit down with it for a few weeks. And if a few weeks, if it still sounds like a good idea, if you talk to, you know, a friend and people who know you and they think it's a good idea, you know, and, you know, so there's a, there's a rule or a suggestion that we learn from facilitators is the suggestion of the three confirmations. So this is, you need three confirmations because before you make a, a, a you know, a life-changing decision like this. First of all, ayahuasca has to confirm it. Because maybe you drink one night and it tells you this, but then you drink and drink and it never comes back again. Well, if it never comes back again, then maybe it was just, you know, maybe you're having a bad week at work, whatever. Um, so that's that's the first, that it must be confirmed by ayahuasca itself. And that's another thing when it keeps reappearing. Now, the second confirmation comes from someone that knows you, you know, and has your best interest in mind. And if that person says, well, actually, knowing you like I do, this sounds like a good idea for you, you know. And then the third confirmation comes from a person that has some sort of authority, somebody that is not somebody who knows you, but somebody whose wisdom or intelligence, you know, you trust and that you can go check with, you know, because of course, if, if instead of ayahuasca, it had been some, you know, guru, you know, that's what you would do. <laughs> you would also check with your friends and with people you trust to make sure before you, 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 take, you take this huge jump, you know, but ultimately, you know, if, 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 I, if ayahuasca tells you to get the divorce and you agree, you know, you should get a divorce when you can tell, you know, your partner, we're getting divorced because I've been thinking about it and I realized that I want to get a divorce. So you, you should only do it when you can say, this is my decision and not ayahuasca told me that. Because that's just sort of a cop out of responsibility that is, that is, um, that is that is that is completely misguided. Big, big personal decisions should be taken personally and with and with care and and thinking carefully about the moving pieces and how this will impact everybody and just you know that doesn't mean that the insight is not valuable, right? In this sense, you know, ayahuasca is particularly dangerous for what you would call narcissistic personalities because it will, um, fortunately. There are few. <laughs> there are not that many narcissists, uh, but it's dangerous. That, but but of, of the pathological kind. But it's dangerous for them because uh, it will it will turn up the volume on their sort of narcissism, and it will present their narcissism not not as a not as a, a sort of reflection of look what a narcissist you are, but as a reflection of their desires. So then the people who are narcissists will drink ayahuasca, and then ayahuasca will tell them that they are, you know, even better. You know, you thought that you were special, but I'm telling you, you have special powers. There's an important mission that you have. The whole world is waiting for you. Nobody's equal. You're the best artist that ever was. I mean, I don't, you know, whatever it is that they want to hear. 
you know, will be sort of reflected and presented back at them, not as the, as the machinations of their mind, but as their future self. That's how they will interpret it. I'm seeing my future instead of I'm seeing, I'm seeing my desires. Did Do that? you think there's an antidote to that? You know, apparently, narcissism is one of the hardest, uh, one of the hardest uh, things to work with uh, in terms of even psychotherapy or psychoanalysis because they have tremendous resistance. What is at stake if they see their narcissism is a complete collapse of their psychic structure. Then. If they see, if they're able to see their own narcissism and how they hurt others and what the causes are underneath, then everything that they have built sort of collapses. So they're very, very resistant to this. Uh, they will resist with all their might because literally their entire structure depends on this. So it's, it's very tricky. Hmm. And, um, so yeah, there's there's that's that's sort of I think I think I think that's a good summary. I would like to again stress that this is the exception. That most people most people drink ayahuasca, myself included, and they come out of the night with very very important or valuable um, lessons. You know, I, I, I will I will I will give just. One more example, you know, I, I know I know somebody um, who tends to take things too seriously and, and, and stress about that. And then because they had a personal crisis, they went and they drank ayahuasca and they found themselves laughing. And then they begin to connect with this laughter of themselves, this, this way of laughing that they hadn't heard themselves do since they were children. They remember that they used to laugh like this when they were kids. And then they couldn't stop laughing. And then they just laugh and laugh and laugh. And that was their ayahuasca ceremony. So for that person, it was this was exactly what they needed. They needed to laugh. And then I, I know another person that tends to, you know, sort of as a, as a defense mechanism, they tend to be sort of frivolous about things, you know, sort of ironic and never sort of, you know, go deep or commit or take things seriously, but just sort of make jokes about things. So it's the opposite. Somebody who takes things too seriously and somebody who doesn't take anything seriously. And then this person had a very, very sort of painful night. You know, they had their sort of physical pains and they felt like they were being punished by by the by the ayahuasca they felt that they, they were literally being punished and they sort of heard this like you know why why are you hurting me and the ayahuasca was telling me i'm hurting you because you're, you're a little shit and it's like why are you doing that then like it just went it just went on on this struggle and suddenly the person came to this point where it said okay it's true i'm 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 a little shit and you're just some sort of like incredible spiritual force and, that i don't know anything about you know, and I'm just a, a little shit. And suddenly the experience flowered in the most beautiful sort of uh, uh, trip through the sort of the art world and the history of and he saw the beginning of humanity and the, and, the, and the paintings on the caves. And it's sort of like suddenly he was made, he was shown that actually some things are important and some things are really, really important and some things actually deserve respect and not frivolity. Um, and it was, it was, it was, it was, it was for this person a very humbling experience, but at the same time it was, a, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was very beautiful because it, it, the person was shown something that was very worthwhile and valuable for a person that was, you know, used to saying keeping everything at the level of, you know, non-seriousness. So to the serious person he taught to laugh, and to the non-serious person he taught seriousness. Um, this is. It's things like these, you know. It's it's because of experiences like these that indigenous people say that the ayahuasca is a it's a plant that teaches, you know. And it's this the reason why you know most of us who drink ayahuasca, you know, go to it and go back to it. So I I I I, I wouldn't want to talk about its dangers without stressing its benefits, you know. And again, the reason why you know 
thousands of years after somebody put these two plants together in the Amazon, we're now in a podcast still talking about it, you know, because there's something uh, uh, um, really sort of extraordinary that can happen. It's not without dangers, uh, but it's also, you know, not without rewards. Yeah, I think this is something that many people who don't really know about the topic might find it surprising that uh, in addition to those kinds of stories, for example, that one very common thing that happens is that you realize ways that you've uh, behaved badly towards people who are important in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also see the solution often. And the solution mm -hmm. is not about them doing anything differently, but you changing your own perspective, you finding finding out, for example, what it is that you want to apologize for, what is it that you can stand behind saying you're sorry for. And uh, of course, this also might occasionally be the, the sort of ayahuasca told me thing that you should reflect, reflect upon before acting upon it. But yeah, I've had those sorts of experiences where uh, it's brilliantly, like it feels like a genius solution to uh, an interpersonal problem that you've been having, that you realize that that the solution, at least part of the solution is in your own hands because you can just like uh, admit that you were stupid you were acting like an idiot or, or yeah. Yeah. It's the, Oh my God moment. Oh my God. <laughs> it's uh yeah. I mean, the only, again, there it's just, you know, what doesn't seem to be the best idea is to, you know, as soon as the sun comes up and it's eight in the morning, grab the phone and call that person to apologize. Because then that there's usually, you know, takes it, and sometimes people do this, it takes the shape of, you know, a call out of the blue on a Sunday morning to someone that maybe you haven't heard of for a long time to suddenly try to, you know, sort of not making the best sense. You know, so again, you know, it's important to do these things, but it's also important to rest and to think about them carefully uh, and just to do it in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the best possible way, you know. Yeah. When it comes to better practices, one, uh, source of wisdom that you've talked about uh, is that there are some psychedelic psychedelically informed churches around the world and especially uh, originating from brazil there are the christian churches santa daime and unia do vegetal who are utilizing ayahuasca in their in their rituals and uh yeah please talk about talk about what we can learn from them. And also you can, of course, give a big, bit of a background on what they are and where, where they originate from. Yeah, um, the, the Brazilian ayahuasca churches, which are a very, um, um, they, are, they are sort of, they are, they are, they are what happens when uh, uh, populations that were, you know, um, not indigenous populations, they're the first groups that begin to come in touch with indigenous uh, groups that use ayahuasca and they're not indigenous themselves. You know, the, the Santo Daime, the founder, was Afro-descendant, so he was descendant of slaves that was living in the northwest, northeast coast of, northwest coast of Brazil, and then they emigrated to the jungle to work on the rubber boom. Both, both churches originate from people, from, from, from people like these. Um, so, they're 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 you know they're very interesting for many way for for many reasons. I'm just gonna I will just make sort of a, a quick sketch um, in terms of differences. You know the Santo Daime is better known. The Santo Daime is a is a, um, um, because it's 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 it has more presence outside of Brazil. In fact, the the other church, the Uniao de Vegetal or UDV, uh, the Union of the Vegetables, because the you know, ayahuasca is the combination of two. Uh, it's much bigger. It's, uh, the UDV has more than 20,000 members in Brazil. It's really large. Um, so, you know, that we got some numbers from them recently. Uh, they actually serve 650,000 cups of ayahuasca a year in Brazil alone. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, 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 of the size. And I would say, generally speaking, the Santo Daime tend to be, tended to be, has tended to be more uh, rural. Uh, so there are people that you know from the jungle that were like you know that were sort of descendant of of of, uh, of African uh, people that that were already living in Brazil or sort of like early colon early colonists, 
Um, but you know, generally speaking, sort of humble people, and and then the you know the vegetal is, is is particular, and there is it has become it didn't start as such, but it has become more humble, also more middle class, and I would say educated middle class. So you know, it's there's an inc- there's a very uh, um, um, there's there's the, the the presence of you know um, you know sort of academics uh, you know government workers people in the military sort of professional people you know doctors and psychologists in the UDV is it's amazing and 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 the level of the discourse that happens around you know the, the sort of ceremonies and rituals of the UDV because they're mostly discourse based is a sort of there's a part of it where it's a sort of a Socratic dialogue where people sort of engage in these very deep conversations while under the state of ayahuasca. It's really, you know, it's always amazed me about the Unidad Vegetal, just how high the level of sort of discourse is generally around this. And uh, and so roughly speaking, you know, the Unidad Vegetal is more urban, it's based around words, it's rich, around speaking, around discourse and dialogue. And the Santa Dine, it tends to stay more rural. It's closer to the jungle and it revolves around music and dance, not about speaking. And silence, which is actually the opposite. So they have part, there's the parts of the ritual that are concentration parts where people just sort of sit in silence. And then there's a lot of sort of music and the singing of hymns. Um, um, I think I think that the, the churches are fascinating in a, a myriad ways, you know, but sort of, Keeping keeping to the spirit of you know everything else that I've been doing in terms of you know where I find sort of sort of these sort of perils of practical wisdom that are not just you know uh, you know testament to their to their wisdom but sort of that could be useful or or or, or interesting for everybody else. Um, in the Santa Daime, they have been dealing much longer than the rest of us with sort of what happens when you are practicing ayahuasca in an urban, in a sort of urban context or in a population where just a small part, number of people are drinking, but, you know, most of your neighbors are not participating. And they might, they might look at your sort of practices with some distrust, if not outright hostility. So they've been dealing with this, you know, this sort of issue, which indigenous people don't, don't have to deal with or haven't dealt with in the same way, uh, for, for perhaps longer than, everybody, uh, than anybody. So it's very interesting what sort of practices they have developed. So, you know, for example, in the Santa Daime, the temple is always open. And this means that, you know, anybody who would like to participate in the Santa Daime ceremony, all they have to do is show up and ask for it. And of course, you know, there's some screening and some filtering. Not everybody would be allowed. But generally speaking, it's open to anybody who wants to join. Um, The question then becomes, you know, how should we, how should you talk to your neighbors? Or I would say there's a, there's a, Daime rule, where which is very rare for a Catholic, for a religion of, of sort of Christian tradition, which proselytism is not allowed. By proselytism means I mean actively trying to convince or convert others to join. This is very very rare for uh, for Christian uh, for Christian anything. So what 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 stands underneath is. The question is how should you talk about your how should you talk to your neighbors about what you do about your practice? And the answer is you're of course allowed to share with your neighbors that you participate in these ayahuasca rituals and that you have found it very, very useful for you. And you can talk, you can give testimony about your experience. What you're not allowed to do is afterwards say, and I think you should try it because it would do you good too. That's the proselytism part. So you are, the temple is always open, but you cannot invite people. Now, you know, there's some sort of historical circumstances that happen, perhaps around the development of that sort of rule, you know, but I, but I think, uh, but I think the, the, the wisdom that stands there is that um, the effects of that ayahuasca can have on people's lives are so profound, can be so profound, so potentially life transforming, that you're not allowed to actually bring people in because people should make a decision of this caliber. They should make it by themselves. They should come because they want to. 
not because anybody recommends it. They should, they can hear, they can investigate, and they can decide this is for me. But nobody can tell them this is for you. Because when you do that, you're taking a, 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 a sort of power over the person that it's too big because the potential changes are too big. This is where this is where this becomes you know informative or useful for everybody else. And I think for me it's a very important pointer about the topic of what will be the future advertising of these practices like. Because basically we have a marketing uh, um, knowledge that we have developed over many years about how to best market practices and bring new people. And this knowledge comes from selling meaningless things. It comes from, you know, it's good for selling socks and sunglasses and, you know, and, 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 and hardwood polishers and, you know, and, and house cleaners. And that's good for that. You know, people can use our perfumes. You can use all sorts of manipulative techniques in which you would tell them that, you know, your neighbor is going to faint when they see how clean your floors are or that, you know, some beautiful woman is going to jump on you when you use this perfume or, you know, or that you, if you open a Coca-Cola, like suddenly there's going to be a big party and everybody's going to be happy. I think... It's, you know, certainly manipulative, but it's okay when, you, when we're talking about things that essentially actually don't change your life. Don't make any difference if you use that Coca-Cola or Fanta or that, this cleaner or that cleaner or these sunglasses or those sunglasses. So because this is the case, because there's a certain irrelevance to these, to these, to these products, then they become, then the battle, the battle to sort of out, outsell each other becomes, you know, quite vicious. And then people resort to all sorts of tricks. And I guess that's fine. And anyway, that's customary. However, in our society, we have very different rules for things that could potentially change your life. For example, tobacco, for example, alcohol, or for example, you know, complex investment uh, products where actually you could lose a lot of money or you could lose your health, then, then it's not okay to make an advertising where you say that, hey, if you buy this investment product, you're going to become rich and all your friends are going to love you. Or, hey, if you, you, know, if you, you know, if you drink alcohol, the women are going, or if you smoke cigarettes, everybody's going to think you're cool. Then there it's not okay anymore in our societies to use these sort of techniques because they're manipulative and because the, the downside of, these, of all of these things, you know, the life-changing effects of these things can be so great. So I think it's a very, very sort of interesting reminder of something, you know, and this even applies in a certain way to the idea that, you know, psychedelics are going to be prescribed. I sometimes get a little bit sort of, you know, is, is it really, is the doctor is going to decide that you should take psilocybin? Because if you go into psilocybin, certain, you know, a session and you're not fully sure that you want to do this or you're not or you don't really know what can happen, then when things get complicated, you know, you might become very, very upset at the person who recommended this. You know, this is why it's really deeply, deeply important that everybody wants, that everybody should do this out of their own accord. And, and, that, and that we should be very careful as a society with any sort of recommendation around this. Again, it's quite different to do testimony. Um, so that's that's sort of interesting thing that I that I learned from the from the churches, and then from the from the Neo de Vegetal, you know, one thing that really sort of blew my mind that, I've, that I I found fascinating is that it's it's a it's a very large church. Like I say, it's twenty thousand people. So you know, there's all sorts of um, um, you know staff that needs to be to run an organization of that size. There's, you know, of course, secretaries and accountants and lawyers, and they have all of these things. They have also properties, you know, not just the churches, but the plantations where they grow all the ayahuasca they need to serve all of the participants. And there's money, you know, people pay a contribution to pay for this. Now they draw a very hard line on what they call profit, on what they call selling the daime. Selling the daime means that you're making profit or selling the vegetal, you're making profit. So you're not covering costs, but you're actually making profit. They draw a very sort of harsh line on, of course, you have to cover costs because there's costs involved to keeping the temple, to, you know, cutting the wood, making the ayahuasca, cooking it, all of these things have costs. But what you shouldn't do is profit. And I think this is also very, very sort of interesting. And then the other thing has to do with 
with your day jobs, whether this is something that people do professionally or they or 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 you have a day, a day job. In the Santo Daime and the Barquinha, you know, what I observe many times is that people actually, the people, the, 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 the padrinos or the masters, the people that, that sort of, that are, you would call the priests, we would call, actually uh, have day jobs, all of them. So from Monday to Friday, they're anything. They're, they're you know, a, a mechanic or, a, you know, and then this work with ayahuasca happens on the weekends and it's non-profit. Um, so... But in the Nio de Vegetal, it's a very large church. And there is, you know, like I said, they have all of this stuff. And then there's sort of like a sort of like a sort of the, the, the spiritual uh, body. And this is sort of hierarchical. So there's the people that work and the, and the individual uh, puntos, they're called the churches. So they have the, 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 the person that sort of the, that is the, the priest of that place. But then there's sort of like a, a, a level above them, which are sort of very above priests. And then there's another level above them, all the way to the top of there's sort of this council of high level priests that are the ones that make the all, 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 all the big decisions. So, you know, just to put sort of a rough example, it's like, you know, Catholic Church, you have priests, you have bishops, you have cardinals, you know, and you have the Pope. So the, the question that I asked this uh, UDM Mestre is because, you know, I know that, you know, for sure, the people that are working at the churches, the, 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 the priests, uh, they all have day jobs. So they do something from Monday to Friday, and then the work that they do at the temple happens on the weekends, and that's their spiritual work. But the money comes from their day job. So what I ask is, at which point, as, as people are going up this sort of level of the church, do they quit their day job and they become full-time paid workers of the church? Right. So is it when they become uh, bishops or when they become, you know, cardinals or, you know, just to sort of for people to understand. Uh, so at which level they quit their day job and they just they're just on the salary of the church. And he said, never, that's not allowed. You always have to have a day job. You always have to have a day job because how are you going to give people advice and counsel about how to live their lives if you yourself can have a day job? You cannot be a UDV master if you don't have a day job that works. Not only that, you cannot be a UDV master if, master if you don't have a harmonious relationship with your wife or partner. Because who the hell are you to give people advice if you can even about how to live their lives, if you can even live your own life? You know, if you can't keep a job and you can't keep a family, how are you going to tell other people anything about anything? Right? So that, that seemed to be, you know, very, very sort of beyond the sort of the, 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 the spiritual reasons for it. A very, very interesting and practical outlook on the question of this. The other thing they said, of course, is when you m begin to mix money with this, you might be, t uh, or you become economically dependent on this, then that's when you start to maybe bend the rules. Say that, you know, one weekend you're very tired and you really shouldn't be doing a ceremony, but you need the money, so you go ahead and do it. Or, you know, it's too many people and you shouldn't allow it to the grow the group to grow larger because you cannot maybe, you know, properly take care of it, but you need the money. So so they try to, they take money out of the equation. They consider that they have their material life and then they have their spiritual life. And these two things are separate and they don't mix, which I think is, again, is a sort of a, a very hygienic practice. Now, this doesn't fully apply to people that come from sort of the Peruvian uh, vegetalismo or curanderismo, uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, because there, there's a big difference there, and, and is that the people from the churches, they learn to do their work in the churches on the weekends. So it's while go, going in the church and being in the church that they learn to become eventually mistresses or guides. But for people that come from the, from the, um, from the sort of indigenous or, 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 or mestizo ayahuasca work, you learn to do this work by isolating yourself in dietas that are very, very long. And, that, and while you're doing that, you cannot work on your day job. So you have to go to the jungle and you have to come in contact with this. So it's incompatible in a way that is not incompatible in the churches. But the, the sort of, again, the, you know, the powerful insights there, and this is, I would say, part of, you know, educating the man is that one should look at the people who serve on ayahuasca, not just as are they good, uh, who they learn or who are their teachers, etc., but also in terms of, you know, what kind of life do these people live outside of ayahuasca? And, you know, are their lives an example of what they preach? 
or not, or are their life as a, a disaster? And, and if their lives are a disaster or sort of questionable, you know, what are they doing giving ayahuasca to other people, you know, and, and, and guiding them through these experiences? And then the other one is this also very sort of certain thing that has to do with, you know, a very tricky issue around money. Um, and, and about, you know, how this how should this be handled and what happens when you become economically dependent on this? And what doesn't happen when you're not economically dependent on this? You know, both questions are there. Um, I would I would I would I would leave it as uh, I would leave it as that. I, you know, I I I my first trip uh, with ayahuasca was in 2003, and I went to Brazil, and I spent a lot of time with the churches, with all of them, with the Santo Daime in, in different branches, with the Barquinha, which is a much smaller church that uh, exists in Brazil, and also with the New de Vegetal, less so. I've only been to, I think, three or four you know, the Vegetal things. Though I've spoken with many masters and also former masters from the Niao, and I have a lot of... I've had very, very interesting and revealing conversations with them. They're very... They're very serious people, the, the people in Nina Vegetal. Um, and there is also something, yeah, quite, yeah, it is, I've, I've really, yeah, I've seen really, really uh, beautiful uh, things in those churches, um, in all of them. Um, I, I never joined myself, any of them, but I, I, I consider myself, you know, definitely a friend and a, a, and a supporter. Yeah, this is uh, something that we could go on hours discussing because so much interesting aspects to those churches, but let's go on uh, and talk briefly about ayahuasca tourism, which we've also hinted uh, or, or briefly touched upon during our conversation, but one uh, thing that I I'd like to you to talk about a bit because mm, you've talked about tourists that are very innocently very disrespectful and who go uh, uh, like honestly curious lay approaching mm -hmm. for example like indigenous cultures and want to learn about them but uh, just like unaware of their approach maybe being really disrespectful uh, causing consequences that they might not foresee and this is also related to the starfish metaphor that uh, you mentioned uh, was uh, originally described by science fiction author William Gibson so uh, maybe yeah talk talk about those a bit yeah I mean you know when I when I started 20 years ago I was you know together with a, a Canadian partner Mark Elam, a, a cinematographer and filmmaker and we were trying to make a documentary series about traditional use of you know sacred plants so you know we went to Mexico and we looked in you know, he took Mark had looked into peyote and, and mushroom use and then we went to Mexico again to look into Saudi Divino Room and and uh, and then eventually to Brazil but you know we were sort of it, it 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 felt like almost like sort of a, a treasure hunt i don't know if that's the right word but we were looking for something that was that felt quite hidden and hard to reach and also very precious and valuable and uh, what we found you know definitely in the case of mexico 20 years ago was very much this this was this was the case and then I became concerned that, you know, I, I, I had, I had, I had, I had, it had for me been a very humbling experience, you know, coming from the 90s and the, you know, the party, electronic music and raves and things like this, you know, when I first had my first experience with an indigenous healer and I understood that, you know, these very powerful substances could be used to this very sort of targeted use of just you know actually helping people um i was i was very you know i i was very embarrassed uh i felt very stupid and very white and about the way that i had arrived with my camera and the questions that i've been asking and all sorts of crazy stupid ideas that i had in my head about shamans that i had read in different books 
and how clueless I was about what was going on there and how incredible what was going on there was. So that was the treasure. And then and then came the worry because, you know, the place where we were, which was Huatla de Jiménez, you know, which is the, the, the town where Maria Cam Sabina comes from, and he had been made famous by another man who came looking for a treasure. He, his name was Gordon Wasson, you know. And then when he spoke about what he found, because it had been so amazing for him, then it created a wave of interest and suddenly, you know, dozens and hundreds of people begin to arrive to up to, to what up to that point had been a very remote uh, and, you know, very conservative because in, indigenous people are, you know, traditional means, you know, conservative, uh, you know, they're, they're, they conserve their ways of being. Um, in a very, very traditional, very, very remote village, suddenly all of this wave of interest of, you know, mostly hippies, you know, first sort of like more like beatnik, you know, uh, uh, bohemian types, and then hippies arrived and they were very, very interested in the mushrooms. But they were just interested in the mushrooms. They didn't speak the language. They couldn't learn the language. And the difference, the cultural difference between those like urban hippies that could buy themselves a ticket to make it all the way to Wadla de Jimenez and those people, you know, the indigenous Mazatec people living in that village, they were really worlds apart. So they would just, at the end, just they were just eating the mushrooms and taking them anywhere. And then this sort of escalated and became a big problem because there were so many of them. And then eventually, you know, the, the, the Mexican government sent the military, kicked out all the hippies and put a, a, a military stand at the, at, the, at, the, at the foot of the road that leads, to, that leads into the village. And it was there until very recently. Also, this was very, very difficult for Maria Sabina because she, she was, as things got more and more complicated with the visitors and they were started doing things and taking their clothes off and, you know, just behaving in ways that seemed very, very scandalous to this community. Uh, and very disrespectful, even though they were just, you know, well-intentioned, happy, you know, free-flowing, you know, hippies. Um, but of course, you know, they're, you know, your average urban hippies, you know, worlds apart from uh, an indigenous person in many, many ways. Just not because they're hippies, but because they're Westerner. Um, the people reacted this against Maria Sabina and she had to endure all sorts of accusations. They even set her house on fire. So she had a lot of problems with the neighbors. She lived to regret really um, uh, sharing this with, uh, with, with Gordon Wasson. So, you know, when we arrived to Guadalajara de Jimenez, you know, 30 or 40 years later, and we got off the bus, it was a long bus, and we arrived something like three in the morning. You know, as soon as we got off the bus, somebody was offering us mushrooms. There was uh, mushroom postcards being sold in every store. There was, or many of the stores, there was like, you know, all of these sort of mushroom painted things. The taxis uh, stop was called Maria Sabina. The taxis had mushrooms painted on them. So an entire sort of industry had developed around this. Uh, with the good parts and bad parts, you know, money was arriving and this was good. And, but also, you know, you know, the, at the end, we ourselves ended up going quite far from Wadla because we were trying to look for something, quote unquote, more authentic. And then when we found it, and it was amazing, I became worried that if we finish this documentary, and this documentary became very successful, that was a long shot, but anyway, if we finish this documentary and it became very successful, what was the best that could happen? And would it have the same effect? Would it have the call in effect? And all of these people will now want to want to go to the next village, you know? And this became like, you know, again, who benefits? Why am I doing this? You know, and also what are the consequences to these people who, you know, very kindly share these things with me? Because it's an issue of sustainability. Again, you know, the problem is not one visitor. The problem is 2000 visitors. And this cannot be controlled, whether it's one or 2000. And, you know, the village is what it is and people are what it is. They have as many. So, this, this was sort of an, an ongoing worry for me. This was somehow minimized when we arrived to Brazil to, to shoot about ayahuasca. And I realized that ayahuasca was the opposite. You know, I felt that what we were doing in Mexico was almost like archaeology. We're trying to look for the last remnants of something that was on its dying or on its way out or endangered. But, but ayahuasca was the opposite. Ayahuasca was a thriving, growing culture with big churches, thousands of people involved. You know, this was not an issue of, you know, sort of tiny surviving lastings of indigenous cultures. 
So, but still, you know, I came to the place where I realized, like, I, I am so uh, indebted to these people. I am so in awe of their knowledge and of their wisdom. I myself believe that, you know, until you drank ayahuasca with a real, you know, with a, with a real taita, you have no idea what it is. You really, you can't even begin to grasp where this can go. And at the same time, I realized that if all the people out of the Amazon who might be interested in drinking ayahuasca started thinking the way I was thinking, if I managed to convince them, which I was also unlikely, but if they came to this decision by themselves, then, then you know, traditional ayahuasca users were doomed because there's not enough taitas, curanderos, padrinos, mestres, you know, traditional sort of guides of all sorts, with all the religions and, 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 and all indigenous together, there's not enough of them to serve ayahuasca to all the people out there who might potentially want to drink. It will not, it will not hold. You know, there's not just, just China alone. If the Chinese decide that this is interesting to drink ayahuasca with, with, with an Amazonian uh, shaman, this would have to, you know, just, just, that, would, that would be the end. I mean, that would be the that would that would be a real crisis of sustainability, right? So these two things have always been there for me, you know. And this is this this is this is part of what I said that I found that I have stopped going there. Not 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 that, that I have stopped going there. Yeah, but at least I've stopped going to the very far away remote villages where where they might be a very special and knowledgeable old man, um, because. Because of what is called the starfish theory, and this 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 came this 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 sort of insight came much later from an interview with um, with uh, uh, Gibson, the science fiction writer, and he was talking about his own youth when he was a hippie in the sixties, and he said, you know, in the sixties there was a very very strong belief among you know young people and young hippies that the society that we were living in was corrupt and wrong. And that we had to create a new society, that we had to escape this society and we had to create a new one, a new model of being. And we did this through communes and, you know, we had to try to set up, you know, alternative sort of communities and ways of living to, to escape this society. Then he said, but what we didn't realize is that society is like a starfish. You cannot really um, uh, escape it. What you do is you move to the edge of the of the of one of the arms and you're on the edge of one of the arms reaching out to a new place but then as you reach out to this place the rest of the society follows behind you so you know of course you know nowadays where you know you know vegetarianism and yoga and you know and spirituality and new age and all of these things that were popular with hippies have become mainstream you can see exactly this it's not that the hippies managed to create alternative societies and escape this one, but they somehow pull their society behind with them. So this is how also tourism works. You know, tourism works with the, the, the forefront of tourism are the very people who don't consider themselves tourists, are the backpackers, you know, the people who consider themselves travelers. I myself have been a backpacker. I loved it and I consider myself a traveler. But what you find is again the same phenomenon. These are the people that sort of go first to a place, discover something, you know, absolutely interesting, the pristine beach, the empty place where there's no other tourists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then exactly what you're looking for, then the rest of the society follows behind. And then and then there's a sustainability crisis. And then that beach becomes full of stores and things and blah, and there's a road and hotels and bungalows and and of and on you go to the next store and then you on you go to the next store, and the next beach, you know. This is called the uh, the paradox of tourism. The paradox of tourism is that it, it destroys exactly what it looks like, it looks for. Now, there's also very interesting models of sustainable tourism. I won't go into that. Though I looked into it, but you know, sort of mainstream. This is this is what happens. So, so this is the this is the trick. You know, we have this very interesting preparation, and we have these people that have been doing it for a long time, and we have many people who would be interested in experiencing this. And it would be wonderful that they all had the opportunity to do it. But there's a limit of sustainability. And then there's a, there's a series of consequences that happens 
when too many of them start to arrive in one place looking with all the goodness in their hearts, like I was, uh, uh, looking for these things. You know, it's it's a paradox again. Um, so, you know, my, 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 my general recommendation is just, is just to be careful, <laughs> you know, you can, and, 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 and to keep these things in mind and, uh, and to also, you know, understand, you know, what are your sort of, wh where do you stand? You know, if you're going to go to South America, you don't speak the local language. You've never been in the jungle before. You haven't traveled much. You have no experience with indigenous people. Uh, maybe you shouldn't go for, uh, you know, try to go very far away and find an authentic shaman. Maybe you, just, you should stay in one of the centers that are already catered for tourists and they have, you know, the food that you would like and they speak your language and they understand your needs and they can take care of your circumstances, you know. And if you're an adventurous type and you've traveled all over the world, you know, and you need a different type of experiences, you know, and you need to go where few or no people have gone, then you should remember that depending how you speak about it, you might be just the tip of the starfish and you might bring everybody else behind you. So why are you going to these places? Are you going to these places to have the experience yourself? Are you going to these places to tell everybody that you've had the experience? Because this also makes a difference and has an impact. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this as someone who actually went to these places and then told everybody I'm having the experience. I'm, I'm not trying to put myself in a pedestal. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, obviously, I'm trying to put myself in a pedestal. This, this conversation is going too long. I'm sleeping. Uh, I, am, I am not trying to, you know, be an example of virtue. I'm, 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 just, I'm just sort of sharing how I made mistakes and, and I try to learn from them. Um, um, so, you know, the other, the other effect of the tourism is that it generates a demand and, you know, when there's a demand, the offer will sort of meet them, you know, so you will, people arrive with, most people that go drink ayahuasca don't consider themselves wealthy, you know, and maybe they're not in our societies, but, you know, if you can have a passport and you can, you know, buy an international ticket to Peru, you know, you're wealthy compared to most of the people that you will meet. And then if you want to drink ayahuasca and you are in a hurry and you're willing to pay, you might find that you are just giving anything in order to take your money, right? So, you know, I, I drew on one story I heard from this um, person who had been sort of apprenticing, they were doing an apprenticeship with, a, with an uh, indigenous healer in Iquitos. And one day there was a knock on the door and it was like 8 p.m. or like 10 p.m., on a Sunday night, and it was four uh, drunken American tourists that been drinking, and they said, hey, we decided that we want to drink ayahuasca. We heard that you are, you know, a, a guide, and, you know, we will pay you $500 if you give us ayahuasca tonight, now. And uh, this man in concrete said, well, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, you're drunk, and it's late. And this is not how I work, so you know you can. I'm not gonna take your money and give you ayahuasca. And he, they left, but they left, and I'm sure eventually they found somebody who took their five hundred dollars. So this is this is the other thing that happens is that we we try to go see or experience something, but by putting big amounts of money on the table, we are inevitably changing things to adapt to our you know, the customer is always right to adapt to our demands and also to our detriment. You know, I'm pretty sure that for those four drunken guys who eventually drank ayahuasca probably had a horrible night because it's not a very good idea. To, it's a terrible idea to be drunk when you drink ayahuasca and it's a terrible idea to do it the way they did it, right? So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's 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 a it's a it's a paradox again, but it's useful at least to understand or to keep these things in mind. There's ample offer um, nowadays, and it's quite professionalized in places like Iquitos and stuff. There's many many centers that have been running for a long time. They're very reputable. They're easy to find, and they cater to you know to uh, to the needs of foreigners. Uh, and then there's also indeed of course the the roots 
of this and there's you know indigenous people still doing the work and mm. um one topic that one topic that uh you could maybe briefly touch upon is uh the adf ayahuasca defense fund that's uh related to the icers organization so what is the adf and what is it for the ADF is a project within ICERS, it's the Ayahuasca Legal Defense Fund, even though we don't work just with Ayahuasca, but it's we, most, most of the cases we get is with Ayahuasca. And basically what we do is we give legal advice and support to people who have end up having legal incidents because of Ayahuasca. So some people have been arrested, some people have you know gone to trial, we don't believe anybody should be in jail for working with ayahuasca. Um, and we believe in the future they won't. So the work of the, the Ayahuasca Defense Fund is, you know, we we have lawyers, the very hardworking lawyers, uh, Natalia Rebollo and Jesus Olamendi and Constanza Sanchez. And what they what we do is we give support to people that have had legal incidents. And this takes many shapes. Sometimes we just have we just share documents with them. Sometimes we advise uh, their legal counsel if they're open to it. Sometimes we participate actively in helping develop the defense strategy. Sometimes we provide uh, expert witnesses, like scientific experts that can talk in the trial about the scientific aspects of this and about the dangers and etc. In the past, oof, I think it's eight years since the since the ADF exists, we have supported. Oof, don't quote me on this, but I think it's between two and maybe it's between four and five hundred cases in something like fifty countries at different levels. Most cases have been around ayahuasca. There's been also a few about coca leaf and also, you know, a few about San Pedro and, and other plants. Um, there's also a part of the work that the ayahuasca that's the that's the defense part and then there's a part that's also policy that has to do with sort of advising or helping uh, different governments in different things that are happening for example now the adf has been advising the mexican government as they're trying to reschedule uh, psychedelic mushrooms uh, psilocybin mushrooms and move them from list one to list eight which is a new list that will be created about uh, you know plants uh, traditional uh, tra plants that are you know indigenous medicines basically so they will it's basically a recognition of the mexican government that when they put this 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 fungi um in the list of forbidden uh drugs uh just to follow the sort of the international uh, uh regulation they were doing um they were they were not only violating the human rights of indigenous groups, but they were but they were actually going against their own knowledge and culture. They were letting people who didn't know anything about mushrooms tell them what they should do with them. And this is also the same reason why you know Bolivia stepped out of the international regulatory thing because of the coca, because of the scheduling of the coca leaf. It is it is it is uh, it is shameful that you know other countries you know will actually there to tell you know bolivia and many countries that have been using coca traditionally for you know hundreds if not thousands of years that they should forbid this just because they have problems with these with these plants you know bolivians don't have a problem with coca leaf it's the americans that did and that's it's terrible that because they had a problem they got them to, to forbid it and this is something that is slowly getting undone as as more and more, uh, you know, in this case, South American countries begin to begin be, begin to be aware of these issues. So, yeah, that's 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 the uh, that's 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 the ADF. It's uh, yeah, you can it's 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 on our website and it revolves around the legal aspects of the plants. Yeah, it's very inspiring how much work in from di true different kinds of approaches is being done with the plants and uh, everything surrounding them and uh, yeah mm -hmm. it's it's weird to try to think about where we might be 10 15 uh, let alone 100 years from now because uh, so much of what everything in life 
means to us comes through our relationship with those things and uh, our relationship is so much connected to our point of view and our point of view is very much connected to the stories we tell about them and uh, there's so many stories that we cannot even imagine exist there are so many perspectives that uh, so many people would want to experience is if they ha if they had any even vague sense that they could exist but yeah i'm i'm blabbering because i'm getting tired so maybe i'll not go there for longer yeah no, you know when somebody 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 once asked me you know so what what did what is what what did you what did you, if you can summarize in two sentences, you know, what you got out of ayahuasca, you know, what, what is it? And, and, and I said, it, it, it made me realize that the world is a more amazing, magical place than I could have ever imagined. That's the short that's the short uh, version of it. Somebody else said that ayahuasca is an antidote for disenchantment. That's also a good uh, a good summary. Mm. Yeah, and this this makes me think about because you were talking in the beginning about ayahuasca, looking at ayahuasca as an adaptogen, and uh, I think the problem of disenchantment is rooted in not actually being in good sure. contact with the world, not being in good relationship with the wor world. Yeah. And uh, if there's an uh, adaptogen that helps you solve, or maybe not solve, but come to grips with the challenges that life is putting forward on your path, then what it means to adapt is to, to gain a more profound connection with the actuality of those problems or challenges yeah. or or questions or whatever it is that life drops on our paths so yeah uh, adaptogen seems to be very much related to relationships yes and to very valuable uh, you know also piece of sort of indigenous knowledge which is the concept of right relationship which is extremely hard to get right but how can one be in right relationship with things, with themselves, with others, with nature, with the ancestors and with the future? I don't know if there's anything that's more more important than that. Um, so, okay, finally, before we go go into the sh short, short final questions, um, you've talked about the danger in the path of transforming the relationship of our societies with psychedelics, the danger that instead we end up transforming psychedelics until our society, as it is today, can digest them. Mm. So maybe talk a bit about that. Yeah, it's a, it's sort of like 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 the story about yoga, right? So it's it, it's it's you know in 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 instead of saying oh here we here we have some sort of you know uh, uh, prayer in movement. We say, okay, well, we don't know about this. Let's split the, let's 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 keep the prayer and let's just focus on the movement, and let's put it in the gym because that's where people move, you know. So this is, you know, sort of the the da the danger of the psychedelic renaissance, as important as it is, is that it will not stay. It will become the model as opposed to a first step towards something else, uh, which is much wider, you know. I hope it won't, um, because. Because that's a perfect example of that is how we adapt. We take something and we adapt it to fit, you know, the, the the pegs that our society has, as opposed to the places where it might fit. You know, I always the the the, the, the thing with psychedelics, you know, not, not just plants, but with psychedelics in general, is that there's sort of this multi-dimensional object. So you know, if if you if you look at them like this, they look like medicines or like therapy. But then if you look at them like this, they look like um, sort of a spirituality, uh, and and uh, and then if you look at it like this, they look at something 
that could be sort of self knowledge or education for adults, you know. So when we think about sort of integrating psychedelics in our society, well, we have you know universities, we have hospitals, and we have churches. And now we have something that fits in all three, and it's neither. So where are we going to put it? Is this a sacrament? Is this a medicine? Or is this a tool for self-knowledge? And that's how our society works. Where do we, in which box do we put this? Because that's the boxes we have. But actually, what psychedelics put, put, puts in front of us is that we need a new box. And that these three things, you know, healing, spirituality, and knowledge, and learning, were always tied together and related to one another. And that their separation is only been recent. You know, this is, of course, we know Jesus, you know, performed many healings and that that was very much a part of, of his work and also personal works. I mean, these things have been together, they're together in most traditional societies, you know, and they've only been recently separated by us in which we separate, you know, and that, you know, our churches do no medical stuff or no healing stuff, not, not just medical stuff, but sort of, even the concept of healing is not part of it, you know. And also they do less and less education. And then our universities do the education. And our hospitals do no spirituality. And, and here we have an object that demands all three. And in a way, and not just all three, there's many other things. Creativity, there's many other things involved. It's absolutely multidimensional objects. And our tendency is like, well, let's make it a medicine or let's make it a sacrament or let's make it... Um, and the thing is, we can't. And it, it demands for us, it demands of us a new space. Uh, uh, not not just not just not 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 just new practices, but a new space, a new space that has to do with all three things at the same time. It is a space. It is a place where, you know, they might be doctors, but it's not exactly medicine what is being practiced there. There's therapeutic aspects to it that are strong, but it's not exactly. Medicine. And there is a spirituality that is going on, but it's not exactly a church, you know. And there is some sort of, you know, I, I like very much this thing I heard from a, a guy that said that for him ayahuasca was education for adults. I think it's a great, uh, it's a great, it's a great description. There's something having to do with education, with sort of learning, but learning how to be with yourself and in the world, you know. And then how do we begin to basically build a place or a center or something, I don't know what it is, a practice that basically has to do with how people transition in life. So this is, this is the way I imagine this future. This is the place where you will go when somebody very important to you is about to die or died and you're dealing with the grief, or you lost a business, or you lost something, or you lost a marriage, or where, you know, uh, um, young people can move into adulthood, or two people can get married, or how the, what is the transition of, 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 of young women who have their first uh, period? You know, what is, the, what is all of these, you know, very important life transitions that we have, and we have lost all sort of community support around them. We have like, a few rituals that we do, but less and less marriage, you know, less and less. But even divorce is not, in a way, ritualized. It seems like our culture would need, you know, a, a ritual around this. You know, when 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 uh, when I uh, separated from my from my wife, we made we made a, a separation ritual because we had made a, a union ritual, right? So it, it was it was it was a it was a simple thing. You know, we sent. It was the day before she moved all the furniture out of the house. So we um, we put the kids with some friends and we bought a bottle of champagne and we drank the whole bottle of champagne and we looked through 18 years of pictures that were on the hard drive, just really fast. From the beginning of our relationship to the kids, the kids growing, the whole thing, we drank the bottle of champagne and then we went to bed and the next morning um, uh, we woke up and we put uh, brand new clothes. Everything was new, the socks, the shorts, underwear, everything, new clothes. And we pick one object each that we wanted to leave behind from the marriage. 
and we went to the garden and we dug a hole and we put the objects inside and we said why we wanted to you know why we were what what we wanted to leave there and leave behind you know out of them out of the out of this and then we planted uh, plants on top of that and then and then we went back to the house and we started moving out her furniture um we we also we also we also did a sort of um um separation vows that were sort of similar but different to our marriage vows and it, it was it was the commitments that we took to each other now that we were not going to be together um but anyway you know it it seems that you know we we have we have forgotten we have forgotten um uh, who we are you know as sort of not not as individuals but as sort of members of the, of 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 a collective uh of people of ancestors of life forms of plants you know and then this is this is where you know a lot of the a lot of the uh, a lot of our problems seem to come from so you know when i imagine um when i try to imagine the psychedelic enlightenment you know i tried i tried i tried to think about this i tried to think about how one can create places where it's not just the individuals that are being healed but the culture is being renovated which is you know actually what you see you know in this in those indigenous dances and those and those uh, and that work that they do that it's actually it's not just the individuals but it's the culture that is being renewed and 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 people's commitment to each other and to the culture is also being renewed so this is part of what i feel is missing but it's returning and it's returning in the form of ayahuasca you know i, I you know one thing that always surprised me about ayahuasca rituals is that being so foreign in a way to us you know like here's a circle of people and everybody's sitting and some people have like they pass with you know incense and smoke and there's songs and then you drank this awful thing and, and you know and you know it's really kind of you know that it, it doesn't resemble anything that we have done you know that we that we usually experience have experience with and yet people immediately get it you know how quickly people fall in step with everything about it you know not not because not because it's familiar but because i mean it is familiar but it's familiar in a much more in a much deeper way so it's it's something that we know from before and that's why it doesn't strike us as, as foreign people you know it always it always amazed me how how quickly people fall into that <laughs> you know like and then, and then there's actually very little you know people are like wait a minute this is really strange why do i have to sit here and why are we all in a circle and why can i speak and why are you turning the lights off and why are you singing songs and, and you know and what is all these things with these things that smell nice and you know different sort of passes you know like all of it is really you know odd and yet people immediately sort of understand you know from a, or, or or sort of you know, from a deeper level so this is also sort of you know the 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 the, the culture healing itself you know there is there is there is sort of like an, an 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 impulse you know we don't know what it is but we know what we're missing you know we know something is missing and then we reach back towards that So the important part and the work that I do is try to make sure that there's any space for that. Because, because I believe, again, I would like to hope that one day in the future, you know, our societies can benefit from this as much as I have seen that, you know, traditional societies benefit from them, which is a great deal. Thank you for sharing all of that. That was really touching and beautiful and inspiring. So uh, now I have five short final questions, which are questions that I present to all of my guests. 
and uh, you can answer with one sentence or or more if you feel like it. Mm. Uh, and we'll start with uh, an early memory that has affected the course of your life. An early memory that affected the course of my life. Hmm. And I, the first thing that came to mind is my mom taking me to kindergarten and me not wanting to go. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. Something that inspires you. Something that inspires me, nature. And I mean, you know, I'm sort of I kind of mental, intellectual guy. So, you know, I I take a lot of inspiration from what scientists are learning about the sort of incredible sort of interconnect, you know, the more you look at it, you know, just the just the way the you know eight billion cells that are in my body organize themselves to stay in this body and sort of cooperate with each other. I mean, the, the, all of that is just sort of mind blowing. Something that you're afraid of. I'm afraid of stupidity, of greed. Uh, in, in myself and in others. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe ignorance is a better word of, 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 the, of the terrible unintended consequences of ignorance for myself and for others and for everybody, you know, and in myself and in everybody. Uh, if things go well, um, describe the direction you're heading heading for it's that you know i think if if things go well i will continue to um I will continue to try to, you know, bring the lessons from the past and from others at the service of the problems of the present and the future. Mm. And then finally, your greetings or your suggestion or your command or your prayer for the human race. What I would, um, what I would wish for uh, humanity is to how should I say this? I think we either become sort of it's a garden. Is that is that is that we become gardeners? That we be, what that we become um to 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 each other and to the planet what uh gardeners um what gardeners do, you know, they don't, they don't control, they cooperate with the flows and the needs and they support and they, and they curate, but they don't, uh, but they don't, but they, but this is done in collaboration with, uh, with, with time and space and nature. 
I have, I have, a, I have a friend who's a, does gardens and uh, recently he said, I am a servant of time and space. And uh, I thought that was a very beautiful way to put it. Thank you, Geronimo. I, I really appreciate your work a lot. I appreciate the time you put into this. Uh, I think your voice is uh, amongst my favorite voices in the world. You bring really important perspectives and uh, you inspire a lot of thinking from very constructive perspe perspectives. Uh, the way you are in relationship with the world uh, makes it easier for me to believe in us and to believe that uh, we have the opportunity to make right choices and to cultivate right relationship with the things that are important. So yeah, I really appreciate all of that. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful word and for and for listening and for giving me the space to <laughs> to rant. <laughs> I uh, always a pleasure talking to you. And uh, yeah, anytime. Thank you. Congratulations on reaching the end of our long conversation. I hope that you uh, enjoyed it as much as we did. And as I mentioned at the beginning, your help and support, be it through likes, comments, reviews, subscriptions, or by becoming a patron, are much appreciated. As a culture, I feel that we're just taking our first baby steps when it comes to the wiser handling of psychedelics. And I sincerely hope that this conversation has uh, somehow contributed towards that goal. I'll see you the next time. Thank you.